This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below. Chapter 142, Chapter 142, Morning After, Edward POV. I woke up as I felt a prick on my nose, and a slender finger tracing along my eyes and face. I slowly opened my eyes to see Abby smiling at me. She had removed her makeup last night, therefore I was greeted by a cute bare-faced girl. We were both lying on the bed in her mother's room, hugging each other without any clothes on. The consequence of the impulsive action we took last night as we went there to search for protection after running out of stocks in her room. Morning. She greeted me with a smile. Last night was great. Great? Try phenomenal. I joked as I pulled her body closer to mine. She blushed a bit before slightly hitting my chest and said, Don't mess around. Get up quick. I need to throw this sheet into the washing machine, and mine too. Otherwise my mom will see the blood on it. She pushed me away and stood up next to the bed. I admired the sight of her naked body before she said, Get up now? You need to go back to your house before your aunt knows you are gone. So, you used me only for my body ugh? My dad is right. Women are all the same? They trick you in bed with flowery words, and then you're worthless the next day. She threw a pillow at my face and said, hurry. I think I heard the sound of a car pulling up. Wait. Oh shit. I heard the same sound, and I quickly helped Abby change her mother's sheets and jumped into the shower with her to clean up last night's traces before quickly getting dressed in the bathroom. She peeked out the door as soon as we were done and signaled me when she saw that her mother was still at the front door talking with someone. I'm going out the window wait. Isn't that my dad? I asked as I recognized the voice speaking to Desiree, and both Abby and I froze as our minds pieced the clues together as we tried to solve the puzzle. Did they spend the night together? Abby asked nervously. NN nothing is going on between them right? I was also stuttering. If, and this is a big if, if they really did go out with each other, does that mean? We're going to be step-siblings. Abby said in horror. Our eyes met accidentally, which made both of us flinch and take a step back. Luckily for us, we didn't shout. I don't know whether to be turned on or disgusted right now, I muttered as I walked into Abby's room. You and I both. Abby said as she went to greet her mother. Oh wait. Don't forget to run by the pharmacy to buy some plan B pills. I reminded her. Way I ahead of you. I was already texting Haley as we were getting in the shower. Abby replied with a smirk. Haley? Ugh. I didn't know why but I was feeling quite guilty. Hmm. Abby was confused by my reaction, but I just waved her off and entered her room. Then, I jumped out of the first story window, holding the windowsill as I wanted to carefully land on the grass. However, I landed quite badly and sprained my left ankle a bit. Shit. I cursed as I braced through the pain and limped in my aunt's house direction to change my prom clothes before returning to Abby's front door in a roundabout manner. Abby was crossing her arms with a dissatisfied expression as she interrogated Desiree, Where did you two go last night? I have been worried sick. I was confused by her act but then I decided to join in the fun and appear right behind my dad, Hey, I saw you pulling over with Desiree. Did you guys have sex last night? Edward. Desiree gasped in disbelief while my dad froze in his spot. And no, I was just showing her the coast. Really? You didn't bring her to the extremely romantic ocean night view place where you can admire the stars together while having a glass of wine, did you? I. My dad opened his mouth a few times, but he couldn't seem to answer the question. I narrowed my eyes at him and Desiree before I said, You did. Didn't you? And you didn't get back till the morning, so I guess you included the sunrise experience, or were you guys just so tired that you decided to just come back in the morning? Sunrise? The sunrise thing. Desiree answered quickly. Hmm, why are you so flabbergasted mom? Are you sure that nothing happened between the two of you? Abby asked with narrowed eyes. Both of us were taking the morally superior position right now so that our parents couldn't even begin to say anything against us except for merely trying to answer our questions honestly. Suddenly, a gentle breeze flew, carrying the faint scent of body soap towards Abby's mom. Wait. Why do I smell dash Desiree's eyes suddenly lit up as she glanced in my direction? She wrapped her arm around my neck as she pulled me in close and sniffed my scent a few times. Yeah, this is my body wash. Desiree's face became stern as she glanced at the surprised Abby and saw her hair was still wet, and so was mine. Did you guys just take a shower together? She asked while narrowing her eyes. She then gasped and asked in a concerned tone, Th no, that can't couldn't TVE happened. You guys are exes? You, you guys didn't sleep together after prom right? What? Nnnnnoo. Abby replied. My my, that stutter sure is convincing. I mockingly told Abby as she glared at me. Don't change the subject. Did you and Mr. Newgate sleep together or not? No, we did not. Desiree replied decisively. He was only being a gentleman, and a true friend. We did nothing but talk all night. Lame dad. I said, making my dad look at me in disbelief. I didn't think my dad was that lame. Or are you guys lying right now? Answer my question Ed. Did you just take a shower at my place? Did something happen between you and Abby? Desiree asked. Did you happen to sleep with my dad? I asked. No. Then neither did we. I was being a gentleman, and we talked a lot last night. I replied in a perfunctory manner which made them think I was mocking them. Wait. This is going nowhere. And we don't have to explain ourselves to you. 
I'm going to go ask your aunt whether you were here last night or not. My dad said while hiding his guilty look. Sure, go on. She went to Calexico last night and hasn't returned since. I replied in a casual manner. It was a damn good luck for me that I went to change my shirt first and saw her note near the key drawer. Unlike my dad, Camila knew when to give me my much needed privacy, therefore she had made herself scarce last night. If only I had found out sooner. Well, I don't regret it though. Dad, let me see your wallet. I said suddenly. My dad was confused, and Abby was interested. Why, what are you looking for? She asked. He always keeps a condom in one of the slots even when he isn't getting laid. I wanna check if it is still there. Sure, I have nothing to hide. My dad gave me his wallet instantly. But know this, once you open it, you will become someone who has no trust in his own dad. I had no qualms with that so I opened it without hesitation. Oh, it's still there. Abby breathed in relief and said, thank God. I don't think I can handle you as my stepbrother. Only in this era Abby, I have a feeling the step-siblings preconceptions will change a lot after a few years. Especially in the sites you usually frequent. I joked, but no one got the joke, which made me quite sad. Sites? What sites? Desiree was curious. Abby blushed and brushed her off quickly before saying, don't speak nonsense. You have your concert this evening right? Go and get ready. Wait Abby. There is still a chance they did it without protection last night. In which case dash. We didn't sleep together. My dad and Desiree said exasperatingly at the same time. I still narrowed my eyes at them as I muttered, see, synchronicity. They sure are being suspicious out. Hmm? What's wrong Ed? My dad asked. Nah, I suddenly felt a jolt in my ankle. I said as I reached my hand to grab my dad in order to stand straight. Abby and Desiree looked at me in concern as I winced in pain. Did you trip somewhere? My dad asked as he held my arm to support me. Yeah I did, after leaving school it was dark so I tripped on an uneven sidewalk. I replied without hesitation. Abby's eyes darted around as she was thinking that my injury had something to do with the strenuous exercise we did last night, and wanted to offer her help. My dad stopped her as he said, let's get that checked. We will stop by the doctor before going to your school. No, I'm fine, I will be fine. I said as I tried to power through the pain and stand on my own and smiled when I managed to do so, see, I'm fine dash I succeeded in taking one step ahead. No I'm not. Then, I fell on my face as I tried to take another step forward with my left leg. General POV. Dunphy's house. Where's Haley? Desiree asked after Claire called and invited her to the house for some tea time. She's out with Abby. Claire said with a knowing smile on her face. Desiree touched her face as she said, Hmm, I think that something happened between Abby and Ed last night. Claire widened her eyes in surprise, Really? How did you know? Well for starters, she washed both of our sheets this morning and she never does that, no matter how much I ask her to. And today not only did she do her own laundry but she even washed my sheets too, so I'm extremely confused right now, it's hard to say with just that. Haley has been helping me with the chores recently too, I think she is basically trying to annoy me as she constantly follows me around the house, trying to emulate everything I do, so I guess the chore thing is something the girls read in a magazine or something. Claire continued, besides, why would she wash your sheets too? It's not like they would mess around on your bed. That would just be disrespectful. Hmm, I guess you're right. But they are still suspicious. Desiree said with a sigh. And. Claire tried to instigate her friend. And what? Desiree asked, confused. She sipped her tea as she glanced at Claire. Don't play dumb with me. Abby told me you spent the night with Ted. PFF Desiree spurted out her drink straight to Claire's face. What? I mean. I'm sorry Claire. She reached for the tissues and helped Claire to wipe her face quickly. I don't know what she told you, but nothing happened. Desiree clarified with a blushing face. Suddenly, the doorbell rang, and Phil ran down the stairs while shouting, I'll get it. He ran towards the door, almost tripping himself over a broken step, and then opened it up. Huh? Hi. Phil was confused as she saw the brunette standing in front of his house. Hi. My name is Francesca Dart. I'm the interim managing director dash. Frankie? Come here. Claire realized who the guest was and invited her inside quickly. Will you excuse me? Frankie let out a sigh and passed by Phil and walked towards the woman sitting in the living room. Oh hey Claire, what time will we be going to Alex's school festival? Phil asked as he checked his watch. At noon? Don't go anywhere. Alex especially asked me to make sure of that. Claire said. As Frankie was greeting Desiree, Luke suddenly walked towards Claire and said, Mom, did you know that the word Ohio looks like a tractor? Huh? Honey, have you done your homework yet? Claire asked, but Frankie was a bit stunned and she quickly intervened, I think so too. It does look like a tractor doesn't it? Dot. Huh? I knew I was right. Luke said, Thank you, kind lady. He did a short, gentlemanly bow at Frankie before walking away, which made a smile break out on Frankie's almost stoic face. Claire looked at her in a puzzled manner and asked, Does the word Ohio really look like a tractor to you? There is some resemblance, yes. Frankie said, You're great with kids. Do you have a child of your own Frankie? Desiree asked as she wanted to get to know the new lady. God no. Frankie replied in a casual manner before saying to Claire, What time shall we start preparing for the mobile application's release? W-A wait wait wait. Hold on. What do you mean God no? You don't like kids. Then how did you dash Claire was baffled by the situation. 
Frankie replied, I have a mentally challenged sister, so I know how to respond to a childlike train of thought. It's better to reply and affirm his curiosity rather than to judge. It will save you time and effort. Claire's face froze, and she said quickly, Luke is not mentally challenged. Claire's commentary. I mean, there are some signs, but he's, he's a sweet sweet boy. Commentary ends. Oh no 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 no. I'm not saying that he's challenged. I'm just saying that he's similar to my grown-up sister who's a bit challenged. Frankie asserted quickly to prevent any misunderstanding. Frankie wondered if she had touched Claire's insecurities, and wanted to quickly change the topic now, so we still need to handle a few things before the app's release tonight. The ads have been running for a few days, but I am still unsure of how Edward is going to make money from this free app. Hold on. So Luke is similar to her? Should I bring him to a doctor to get him checked out? Claire asked anxiously. Frankie was concerned and tried to placate her. Oh no no. If your family doesn't have any history of mental issues, then that boy is just a curious boy, that's all. Honey, do you know the word Ohio looks like a tractor? Phil suddenly walked in while laughing. Claire's face became determined as she mumbled, I need to bring him to a professional. After buying the Plan B pills from the pharmacy, Haley stared at Abby with a dissatisfied look as they drove home together. You didn't even think to use protection. She asked angrily. We did. And then we ran out. Abby replied with a smirk. You used it all dash Haley opened her mouth in shock before she blushed and tried to ask, so, how was it? It was freaking great. Ugh. Why the ugh? Haley asked mockingly. Yeah cause we can only do it once. Abby replied in an angry manner. I'm already going to New York this Sunday. Good? I mean, oh no. Haley said in a fake manner. They went to Tara's to pick her up before they drove towards the middle school festival together. During the drive, Tara and Haley made Abby spit out every single detail about last night whether it was girth, length, or even the direction it was going. Damn, now I'm attracted to Ed. Should I break up with my boyfriend and go after him? Tara asked jokingly. By the way, did you guys know about Dylan? In a hospital nearby, Pepper opened the ward door in an extravagant dramatic manner before grabbing an intern doctor nearby, where is he? He asked. H he's over there. The intern replied in fear as she pointed to a hospital bed with the curtains drawn to cover up the patient. Pepper strode towards the bed quickly and entered the space dramatically before grabbing the doctor there tell me it wasn't a tragedy doctor? Tell me that we can still save his legs. No, it was just a sprain. The doctor replied in confusion. Wait Pepper. Teddy. Pepper recognized the doctor and released him instantly. Mitchell's ex-boyfriend. I knew I recognized him from somewhere. Ed mumbled to himself as his left leg was wrapped in bandages. His dad was standing behind him with a concerned expression. Ed, should you really perform today? The doctor told you to rest for three to four days. It's okay. I'll rest after I finish performing. Besides, that was just a suggestion. Ed replied in a dismissive manner. No, let's do an MRI or a CAT scan. We need to make sure that your leg and your whole body is really fine. Pepper said while grabbing Edward and shaking him. Ed smiled and said, hey hey Pepper, relax. Take a chill pill, I'm okay. Teddy backed up the teen, he is fine, he's healthier than most kids. It's just a sprain, so don't worry about it too much. Yeah peps, I'm at least better than Dylan over there. Edward said as he pointed towards the patient bed in front of him. Dylan was peacefully sleeping and had an four bag connected to him, with the warning sign do not come near placed around his neck. Wait, you know him? Teddy asked. That poor kid. He shook his head as he remembered the events of last night. What happened to him? Ted asked in concern as Dylan was a part of his crew. He took a pretty big blow to the head and then mixed up a few medications trying to fix it, but it just caused him to ejaculate continuously at the slightest touch and simulation after a while. That's why we banned all the nurses from going near him. We had to put him down as he's been spraying his stuff all over. Oh damn. Edward muttered in surprise. Teddy nodded and said, well a good thing about it is that a neurobiologist has offered to take care of all the expenses of his case, from medications to scans and blood work if he and his caretakers agreed to have him as a case study. She only asked if could connect a few electrodes to his brain in order to use the results in her research. She's coming over right now. Who's she? Edward asked. Her name is Dr. Amy Farah Fowler. Teddy replied. Oh damn. Edward muttered again. In an airport nearby, Taylor and her dad disembarked from his private plane. He was wearing a cowboy hat and outfit while walking side by side with his daughter. Scott said, where's your friend? Selena? She's driving straight to the school and will be waiting for us there. Taylor replied casually before she pouted and said, so let me go alone. Her dad smirked and said, no can do, or else you'll run straight to that boy again. I thought you liked him. Taylor protested in anger. I do, that's why I'm getting you away from him. He deserves a normal girl dash Taylor punched her dad on the arm before he could continue. I hate you. Taylor muttered before huffing away while her dad laughed at her demeanor. Taylor suddenly stopped walking as she read a text on her phone, and turned back towards her dad in a hurry. Dad, we need to go to the hospital right now, she demanded. Huh? Why? Scoot asked in confusion. Then, Taylor showed him an article, opened from a link that Selena sent to her, about Edward being admitted to the hospital. Breaking news? The teenage pop star Edward Newgate was admitted to John Hopkins Hospital hours before his charity concert. 
Paparazzi started crowding the front of the hospital as Edward's whereabouts were leaked by an irresponsible hospital administrator looking for quick cash, and it quickly became a zoo there. Fuck. I can't even run now. Edward cursed as he saw the crowd from behind a curtain. Chapter 143, Chapter 143, School Festival? Sorry for the late chapter dealing with some personal problem yesterday. Edward POV. Snap asterisk snap snap snap. Mr. Newgate, how did you get injured? Will you cancel the charity concert? What will happen to all the donations? Does Taylor know you're injured? Flashes of camera light basked my body nonstop as I walked out of the hospital towards my company car under the escort of a few burly bodyguards to keep me safe. The paparazzi kept shouting their questions and even tried to break through the bodyguards' protection. Some of them almost succeeded and I was pushed a few times even with my injuries. Animals all of you? Animals. Pepper shouted with gritted teeth as he tried to chase the paparazzi away. All right everyone, stop. I said while clapping my hand loudly. My voice carried a trace of anger, and the rambunctious group of the paparazzi was actually stunned and then calmed down a bit by it. Hmm? Did I awaken Conqueror Hacky? I thought in confusion as I saw a now calm group of people. Which one of you is from an official news company? I asked. Only three of them raised their hands in an obedient manner, which saddened me a little. Most of the reporters here were part of the hyena faction which stalked celebrities in order to make fast money from either blackmailing or selling private information and pictures to media channels, and some just enjoyed the feeling of destroying someone's image and reputation. I will answer just one question from each of you, only the official media though, I muttered. That's discrimination. One greasy looking hyena said as he grabbed his camera and started snapping pictures again. It is. I replied honestly, which excited the crowd as they felt that they had won something great today. You, the blonde who looks like Lois Lane. I said as I pointed at the woman right in front of me. A little flattered, the woman smiled for a second before she held a recorder at me and asked, how did you get injured? And will it affect the upcoming charity event? Oh, I just tripped on an uneven sidewalk. It will not bother me to sing on stage, so no, it won't affect the concert. I replied casually as I pointed at my bandaged ankle and feet. I had to wear a slipper that my dad bought from the gift shop, so everyone could see it. As you can see, I can still walk by myself. Although it was painful for me to do so, I was just faking it in order to avoid worrying my fans about the possibility of the concert being cancelled after my injury. Next, the reporter from Orange County. The tall man nodded with a serious expression before asking, why does the charity event target only the homelessness in this state? What about other places in the country? I think that question should be asked to the politicians rather than a teenage boy, don't you? I replied with a laugh, causing the reporters to chuckle too. Then, I paused for a while before replying. When I was nine years old, I used to ride my bike every day to a convenience store in the city. One day I decided to look around and I saw a homeless guy camping in an alley nearby, so from that day on every time I walked out of the store, I would give him a dollar. The crowd was attracted by my story and the camera flashes. I was terrified but right before he could lunge at me, the same homeless guy I kept giving my change to, suddenly tackled the thugs and proceeded to drive them all away. One person heroically faced off against three guys just to save a little kid he didn't actually know. Nice story right? Well the homeless guy got stabbed. I said, causing the crowd to let out a gasp. Luckily for me though, at the last second, the thug finally decided to run away. To this day I don't know what it was that made him run. Did he suddenly grow a sense of morality or maybe just got spooked after seeing the blood in his hands? Whatever the case he simply ran away instead of coming after me next. So I was saved, and I never saw the homeless guy again. I asked around after that, his name was Will, I think. A good no, a great man, a guy who had made some bad financial decisions and had to sleep on the streets. I asked the clerk about him, and he told me that every time I gave Will a dollar, he would go into the store, buy one of those 99 cent hot dogs, and that would be his meal for the day. I looked into the crowd and saw their faces change drastically as they heard the story. So if you're asking me why I'm holding a charity event to feed the homeless, you only need to know about Will. The crowd was silent for a while, with some furiously jotting everything I said down on their notes. Okay, last question. Jamie over there from the Hollywood Times. I said with a smile as I turned to the familiar looking woman in front of me. She looked similar to a K-pop idol that I have seen in my previous life, but I had never learned her name before. Um, you know me? She asked with an impressed smile. Yeah, I remember all the pretty ones. I replied. She blushed a bit which made the camera flashes swarm appear once more. I was helpless and said, how many thousands of photos do you guys need? You will only use one or two in the articles. Some reporters were embarrassed, but some didn't bother to stop. Jamie came back to her senses and asked, that, made my next question rather awkward. Will Taylor S come to the concert today? My sources tells me that she was back at her parents house till yesterday dash. 
as expected of the writer in the gossip panels in the Hollywood Times magazines. Well, almost the entire magazine was filled with gossip, so it was more of a tabloid magazine rather than a normal one. Oh I certainly hope she will. I interjected quickly as I was already fed up with the light flashes. I have already given her the VVIP tickets. Not only her, but her dad too. Her dad? Why? Jaime's eyes lit up as she caught on, but I just showed a toothy grin and said, no more comments, I should probably go and get some rest like my doctor told me to. Goodbye. Wait. She shouted, but I had already gotten in the black, seven-seater SUV car with Pepper and my dad. The flashes of lights become tremendous as I leave, and I know for sure that the gossip media will have a field day with my answers. Ed, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. My dad said, in which I thought he was referring to the paparazzi's plague, but I was wrong, I won't scold you for going out on your own dash. Oh, right. That was all made up. I said suddenly, which caused Pepper and my dad to widen their eyes in shock. Even the driver was shocked and he accidentally swayed the car, causing our ride to get blared by people's horn. An act. Pepper gasped in disbelief after calming down. I thought you really had gone through with the story, felt real. Yeah I know, I'm an amazing actor. I replied haughtily with a smirk. Truth be told, the story was from my past experience, that needed a slight alteration in order for me to tell that story. When I was almost stabbed before, I had no parents, and I didn't go there to buy some candy, but it happened after I had run away from the orphanage in order to search for my true parents. How naive I was at that time. My dad was still suspicious about my disclaimer, Ed, if you fear that I would be angry dash. Dad. Mom didn't even let me eat candy or ride a bike. Don't you remember you were the one who bought me my first bike after she left? I said in a casual manner to remind him. A-H-H that's true. He finally relented and believed that I had lied before. Won't you get in trouble if someone decided to confirm whether it was a true story or not? If there was a stabbing, there should be a record of it. He added. Well, to be honest it will be difficult for them to confirm anything. There are a lot of crimes in the city, and stabbings, although rare, have reached more than 100 cases per year. It would increase exponentially in the future, making a stabbing case look normal then. And I didn't even specifically say that the homeless guy was dead. If they actually want to ask me about it, I can play the traumatized card, and those who dare to keep asking will be hunted down by every single one of my crazy fans. Ah, Pepper exclaimed in realization. He gave me a faux contemptuous side eye as he muttered, you scary little man. Hey I'm already taller than you. Anyway peps, let's go to the festival now, I wanna shoot some ducks. My dad and Pepper looked at each other as they heard it. You know you can't join the festival crowd right? My dad said with some hesitation. Huh, why not? Pepper answered, most of the ones who came are your, and I'm quoting you now, crazy fans. I was stunned for a while. Shit. Language, X2. I crossed my arms as I pouted at my seat before I said, I want to try everything there. I will ask someone to buy it for you wait, did you just say everything? Pepper asked in disbelief. I nodded with a grin and said, yeah, everything. I laughed insidiously, which made Pepper feel a headache coming in. Tisk. I clicked my tongue as I watched the bustling field from inside the music classroom. I wanna play too. I said whiningly before I turned towards Mrs. Henderson and Pepper who were discussing today's affairs. The concert will start in three more hours. When I'm done with the final safety check on the newly constructed stage, I will come and get you so that you can get ready backstage. Mrs. Henderson looked at her tablet while saying that. Pepper nodded in understanding, all right, we can do that. About the dancers dash. There's dancers. I muttered in confusion, but Pepper ignored me. The stage can support up to 30 people dancing vigorously on top of it. Mrs. Henderson replied, thank you. Pepper smiled. Hmm. There's dancers. I muttered again. What about the fireworks? Have they been set up? Pepper asked again. No, we couldn't get the permission from the city. It would be okay to use them somewhere else, but they couldn't let us do it in a school area. Mrs. Henderson shook her head slightly in disappointment. There's dancers. Shut up Ed X2. I scoffed after getting scolded and limped my way towards the door as I heard a knock. Just to be clear, I knew about all of that stuff. I was just trying to annoy them, an endeavor in which I succeeded. Surprise. The cute Enid yelled out after I opened the door. Surprise? I asked you to come here. I said with a smile as I invited her in. Where's the others? I peeked at the corridor to search for my other food delivery man I mean friends good friends. The best of friends. They are still waiting in line. I'm bringing this first cause I don't want it to get cold. Enid said as she gave me a foot long, golden colored corn dog and mustard packets as she didn't know if I wanted the condiment or not. Nicey. I exclaimed in excitement as I reached out to grab it. But Enid pulled her hand away in a playful manner, give me my reward first. I sighed and asked, what do you want? We didn't agree to a reward beforehand, and I paid for all the food before I sent them out to hunt. So I was a bit taken aback when Enid wanted something, but then I realized she was just playing around. Nothing much. I wanna be the first person ever to get your autographed album? The first. Oh, that's easy. Alright, you got it. Now give me my footlong meat. Ah Pepper, not the kind you always get. Pepper snorted and said, if I could ever get a footlong, would I still live a single life? Stop focusing on Dwayne and start focusing on those around you. He's out there, you just can't see it. I said in a casual manner as I took a bite of the corn dog. Huh? 
What are you guys talking about? Footlong what? Enid asked in a quizzical manner. Mrs. Henderson interrupted quickly, Enid, don't you have something else to tend to? If you can get more food, then you can demand even more rewards. Enid's eyes lit up, really? I'm going now. Wait for M.E.E. She dashed out of the room immediately before I could even say anything. Hey, I didn't agree to that yet, Enid. She had already disappeared before I could finish my words. I bit the corn dog with a solemn face and muttered with my mouth full, she won't spread the word right. Why ask when you already know? Mrs. Henderson said with a smirk as she walked beside me. She had already finished the discussion and would be heading out now. Wanna try? I offered my corn dog to her, which to my surprise, she actually leaned forward, brushed her hair behind her ear, and bit on it seductively before returning to normal position. It's sweet, she said with a weird face. I know, it's disgusting, I said while taking another bite, but I just can't seem to stop, I added. She raised her brows at me before walking away while muttering, you're a weird little kid. Hey, I'm a man not a kid. Pepper walked towards me after finishing a call. Mitch and Cam are here. Oh, why are they here so early? I asked in a casual manner as I finished my corn dog and threw the wooden stick in the trash can. I don't think it's for the food. How could you finish that? Anyway, Mitchell wants to meet us. Oh, tell him he can only come if he brings me some slushies. And some food. General POV. A slushie. Mitchell was walking with Lily and a brunette ten-year-old girl through the festival. Mitchell, there's a slushie stall right here. Does Ed want the red, or the blue one? Cameron asked. Amanda, do you want a slushie too? I want to see Edward Newgate. Amanda demanded like an entitled brat as she stumped her feet. Cam, what is red, and what is blue? Mitchell asked, ignoring the kid. I don't know, they wrote red and blue. I don't think there's any flavor, just color. Cam replied with an exhausted face. A few stalls away, Haley and Abby were also walking around the festival street before they suddenly bumped into the hurrying Enid. Hey watch out. Haley shouted but then realized who it was, and said, Enid. Watch where you're going, you're going to get in trouble. Abby looked at her friend weirdly before turning to Enid and asked, Why are you running? Cause I want a reward. Enid said before she ignored the duo and ran away. Abby then turned to Haley and spoke sarcastically, and what's with the motherly scolding? Huh? Did I succeed? Haley asked in confusion. Succeed in what? Abby was also confused. At the activities section of the festival, Jacob was swinging down a hammer in a violent manner at the hammer arcade game. The score kept going upwards, and it stopped at 831 after the bell rang. Congrats, you broke the record. The facilitator of the game gave him a fluffy pink unicorn as a prize. He grinned and gave the prize to Elsa who was already holding multiple stuffed animals and prizes. Stop, I don't need any more gifts, she said exasperatingly, but her boyfriend ignored her plight and went to the next game instead. Jenna was following the couple from behind before she ran into Enid. After hearing the explanations, her eyes lit up and she abandoned the stupid couple to go food hunting with Alex, Phineas, Billy, and Abraham. Soon after, Abraham knocked on the music classroom door using their secret code with a small load of junk food. Tofu burger? Are you serious? Edward looked at the impertinent kid. Huh? You asked us to get the weirdest food in the festival right? Abraham asked in confusion. I said I wanted to eat rare or weird food, but only good stuff. Tofu burgers aren't weird. It's just vegan. Edward said while taking a bite of the burger. Ugh, disgusting. Then stop eating it. Pepper yelled at him, but Edward kept munching every single thing his friends brought him, leaving no leftovers. Try this deep fried Oreos. Phineas walked around with Billy and handed the food to Edward. Huh? Aria? This is interesting. Edward's eyes glinted in excitement before he turned to Billy. The girl sighed and said, deep fried broccoli. Edward was weirded out, but he kept smiling. He popped a single deep fried Aria into his mouth. Oh, this is actually good. Good for diabetes. What's wrong with this festival? Why is everything deep fried? Pepper complained. Edward ate the broccoli and said, this is actually tasteless. Stop eating everything Ed. You'll get fat. Pepper chastised him. Alex walked together with her dad, Phil, who gave Ed a hug the moment he met him. Hey, it's been a while since I saw you. Yeah, I missed you too philosophy. Edward muttered as he wrapped his arm around Phil, but it was actually to take what Alex was holding. Hmm, what's this? I mean, I know it's cotton candy, but what was it before? Edward asked. It was supposed to be a puppy, but we took too long and it's already melted. Alex rubbed her head in annoyance as she gazed at her dad. Oh, puppies are good too. Edward said as he bit off the already small cotton candy in one bite. As a design right Ed? Alex asked with a smile, but Edward just smiled ambiguously at her. You're talking about the design right? She asked again, fearfully this time. Maybe. Edward answered with a mischievous smirk. Alex was shocked, but Phil was just smiling by her side. Edward, are you nervous about playing today? You should ask your daughter that question. Her face is getting pale. Edward teased. Jenna appeared after the family had left to go enjoy themselves in the Ferris wheel. They will join Manny and Luke there, together with Gloria and Jay. Finally, a normal looking food. Pepper said as he saw the chocolate covered banana in Jenna's hand. Okay, time for the show is drawing near. I will go get the bodyguards. Edward, don't come out of the room. Okay I Edward was left alone with the girl. Jenna fidgeted before asking, so, can we really ask for a reward? 
Enid just can't shut her mouth, huh? Edward laughed a bit before saying, Sure, I can give you a reward if you want. Really? Great. Then, I want you to feed me the banana. I'm sorry, what? Jenna pointed at the container and showed that it had two chocolate-covered bananas in it. Oh, that banana. Edward muttered. Sure. Say ah he grabbed a stick of banana and pointed it to Jenna's mouth. She blushed and bit her lower lip before looking at Edward with dreamy eyes. She slowly brushed her hair behind her ear as she leaned forward to lick the chocolate dripping from the banana, from the bottom to the top. A hum she moaned slightly as she puts the banana inside her mouth while maintaining eye contact with Edward who's contemplating life right now. UMM. So big. All right, stop it right there. Edward said as he pulled his hand back. My Edward banana. Jenna whined pitifully. Why the hell did you do that? Edward asked in disbelief. Well, I read my horoscope today, and it said that I should start my summer with an impact so you wouldn't forget me. What was that? Edward asked as Jenna's voice was too tiny for him to hear. Nothing. Jenna said as she stuck her chocolate-covered tongue out. Well the horoscope thing got it right. I'm not ever going to forget what just happened. Edward muttered. Jenna blushed and ran away from the room. Just seconds after she left, Mitchell finally got to the class. Hey Ed, I bought some slushies and fairy bread. Mitchell said in excitement. Oh, did Kim bake them? Edward asked as he grabbed the rainbow sprinkle covered bread. Mitchell paused and then exclaimed in disbelief. What? Chapter 144, Chapter 144, Charity Concert, 1. Edward's POV. After Mitchell explained Amanda's situation, I agreed to help him by meeting the girl and taking a photo with her. I also gave her my poster and signature before ushering her away as politely and quickly as possible, as she was beginning to get on my nerves. She appeared satisfied, though, and Mitchell wouldn't get into any trouble. I'm sorry, Ed, Mitchell said. He felt apologetic for leveraging our connection for personal gain, but I wasn't holding it against him. I knew from the TV series that he had practically no work-life balance, as his boss kept pressuring him. It's okay, Mitch. I'm just glad you could make it, I reassured him. Bok dash baby Lily displayed excessive enthusiasm as we hadn't seen each other in a while. She playfully nibbled my cheek while I held her, resulting in my face being covered in baby slobber. I burst into laughter at her antics and started tickling her, eliciting baby giggles that made Cam's face turn red with jealousy. Hey, Ed, we should head backstage now, Alex suddenly entered the room. Alex, good luck out there. Break a leg. Kim exclaimed enthusiastically as he took baby Lily from my arms, despite her clear reluctance to leave me. Wait. Taylor is almost here. I want to meet her before going on stage, I mentioned as I wiped my face with a wet tissue. Pepper, who had entered the room alongside Alex, chimed in. No, she won't make it. Huh? Why? I inquired, perplexed. She actually went to the hospital to surprise you there, but now she's stuck in traffic. She won't be here for at least another half hour, so it's better for you to get backstage first, Pepper explained. I let out a sigh before responding, all right. Make sure to give her the tickets. Don't worry about it. Now, go and get ready, Pepper urged. If you're too late, the crowd will start to gather, and it will be problematic if they spot you walking backstage. The venue was situated in the middle of a field, with no discreet pathways to avoid being seen by fans. So my best bet was to get backstage before the crowd started congregating for the show. It's still an hour and a half until showtime. Isn't it too early? Alex questioned, looking a bit confused. It's not early at all. In fact, there are already dozens of people in the field, Pepper responded. Hmm. I stepped out the door, and suddenly, a tall blonde girl shouted, surprise, and embraced me. Taylor. I exclaimed excitedly, returning her hug, while Pepper and Alex snickered behind me. A-H-H, you bastards played me, I teased as I turned to the duo. Taylor continued to smile and wrapped her arms around my neck. I missed you. I missed you too, I replied. Suddenly, Taylor's expression turned serious, and she began sniffing my clothes. Taylor. I asked, feeling both confused and concerned. I smell the scent of another girl? Who's that? She inquired indignantly, but her eyes still sparkled playfully. Does it smell like talc or baby powder? Because you can see my other girl right behind me. Taylor turned around and saw Lily, her face flushing red with embarrassment. I swallowed hard, wondering whether I should be honest or not, but Pepper came to my rescue. Girl, he needs to get backstage right now. You can have your lover's quarrel later. Oh, is it time already? All right, I'll go be with my dad. I'll introduce you guys after the concert, Taylor said with a smile. Sure, I replied as I watched her walk away. Pepper suddenly grabbed my shoulder from behind and said, Ed, why were you so nervous when she asked you if there was another girl? I don't know what you mean. Let's go. We're already late. I hurried towards the stage, not wanting to delve into that topic with Pepper. Hmm, suspicious, Pepper muttered as he followed me. Hey Pepper, can we come? Kim asked with a grin. As long as you keep your mouth shut. Nah, we both know you won't be able to do that. Just don't get on Ed's nerves, Pepper replied nonchalantly. As I exited the school compound, a few bodyguards joined me on my way to the staging area. Some fans recognized me and eagerly took out their phones to snap pictures while screaming for my attention. I waved politely with a friendly smile. Hmm, only 30 people. Pepper, should I call them over? I inquired. There weren't many people around yet, as most fans didn't see the need to arrive so early. 
However, this specific group consisted of members from my fan club, who were decked out head to toe in my merchandise and held banners with my pictures and name. Why? Pepper asked, taken aback. Well, they came here quite early, so I want to create a nice memory for them, I explained. Pepper grinned and responded, okay, if that's what you want. Call them over, I instructed one of the bodyguards accompanying me. The burly African-American man nodded and approached the scattered fans, informing them of my desire. With faces flushed with excitement, the crowd of teenage girls hurried over to me, causing me to take a step back in surprise. Hey, it's Lily, I commented as I spotted the bespectacled blonde girl in front of me. Lily's face lit up, and she asked with excitement, you remember me? Yeah, you gave me the keyword fairy tale at one of my previous concerts. You've cut your hair a bit shorter, but I can still recognize you. How have you been? I inquired warmly. Other girls were grinding their teeth in envy as they waited for their turn. I I've been well, Lily replied with a stutter and a blushing face. She couldn't even meet my gaze. Don't be so nervous. I just had another Lily slobbering all over my face a few seconds ago while she was in my arms. You guys share the same name, so you could borrow a bit of her confidence, I reassured her. Huh. The fan club members were puzzled, and some were infuriated, thinking I was talking about my significant other. Ed. Ed. Baby Lily called my name at a perfect moment. I chuckled and held her in my arms before saying, See, you really could use some of her confidence. The fans blushed in embarrassment, while the fan club president was initially startled but then broke into a wide smile. Hi Lily, the adult Lily greeted the baby. Lily, the one-year-old mumbled her name while clinging to me, casting wary glances at the girls to assert her possessiveness. I conversed with all of them, learning their names and chatting with those who were brave enough to ask for personal pictures. Only after that did I enter the backstage area, still holding baby Lily in my arms. She really doesn't want to be apart from you? What magic did you use? Why does my daughter adore you so much? Kem grumbled in confusion as he took Lily away for the second time, despite her reluctance to leave me. Kem, my entire existence is magic. All right, Alex, what about Phineas and Billy? Have they arrived yet? I inquired. Alex responded, yes, they're on their way here. So, what do we do backstage? Typically, we'd familiarize ourselves with the stage and check our instruments. But there's already a professional team handling that, so let's just get a feel for the stage layout. Oh, and we need to change into our outfits. Outfits. I glanced at her boyish attire and remarked, Yes, you definitely need to change. Ugh, Alex groaned and obediently went to change her clothes. When Phineas and Billy arrived, their fashion choices were also critiqued, and they too willingly went to change. We proceeded to the stage, which still had the curtains drawn, to acquaint ourselves with its layout and ensure we didn't interfere with the dancers as we moved around. Actually, we won't even move around, we'll just perform from our designated spots, Billy teased. I playfully tapped her head with my knuckle, causing her to pout and almost shed a tear. Peps, have the dancers arrived? I inquired. Ed Y.R. Road. Before Pepper could respond, someone called my name from behind, and I was enveloped in a dual hug. Kaya, Anna, glad to see you guys here. I greeted them warmly as Anna examined my height with her hand, looking incredulous. How are you taller than me now? What did you eat to grow this quickly? Mainly fertilizers and steroids, I replied, momentarily shocking both of them, as well as anyone who overheard. I was just joking, I quickly added, earning relieved sighs from the surrounding crowd. With a wry smile, I shifted the conversation to more professional matters. I learned about the spotlights, speaker placements, dance choreography, and more as I prepared for the performance. Hey, kid, I'm not too late, am I? Just minutes before the audience could enter the venue, I spotted some familiar faces heading backstage. Hey, Robert, why are you here so early? Weren't you planning to come towards the end? I asked, smiling as I walked over to greet them. John chased me off the set, RDJ explained, giving me a light hug before turning to two individuals beside him. You know them, right? He asked, sporting a mischievous grin. Of course. Scarjo and Don. I'm quite surprised to see you guys here, I said enthusiastically as I shook hands with both of them. Well, we came to support the cause, and John might have actually kicked us off too, Don Cheadle quipped playfully. Scarlet added, the dancers kept talking about you, so I got interested. In me. I flirted with a side smile. RDJ rolled his eyes and swatted my shoulder, remarking, you're 15, don't make a move on her, she won't fall for it dash, he was the one who got swatted next, Scarlet rolled her eyes and said, ignore him, I chuckled before asking them, you guys should find your seats, the performance is about to begin, RDJ quickly nodded and said, sure, do you want me to be the MC, you oof, sorry pal, your offer came a bit too late, I playfully responded, playing along with RDJ's feigned offer, general POV, Tickets, please, an official staff member checked the tickets of parents and students, permitting their entry into the venue. Most attendees were excited and with eager smiles, though some parents seemed less enthused and were likely coerced into coming by their spouses or children. Gloria, I thought we had VIP seats. Jay inquired, trailing behind Gloria and Manny as they made their way to the plastic chairs in the seating area. These are the VIP seats. If you buy regular tickets, you have to stand behind us, Manny explained. He had donned a blazer as if he were attending a classical music performance, which irked Jay. 
You'll ruin that jacket with your sweat, Jay grumbled. It's fine, the sweat might help me lose weight faster, Manny retorted. Hey, Claire. Gloria greeted Claire enthusiastically as she waved her ticket, spotting the Dunphy family already seated. The seating arrangements had no specific assigned spots, so Gloria decided to sit next to the Dunphys. Hey, we're here too, Mitchell greeted Gloria and Jay from their seat one row behind the Dunphys. Lily wore noise-canceling headphones to join the concert, and Gloria was so excited to see the baby that she took Lily from Cam's arms. Why does she like everyone but us? Cam complained, waving his hands in the air in mild frustration. You're the one who insisted on bringing her to a concert, Cam. Wait, is that the VVIP section? Mitchell's eyes lit up as he recognized several celebrities seated in front of them. Gloria, couldn't we afford those seats? Jay asked incredulously, observing the comfortable, cushioned chairs in front of them. No, the tickets were reasonably priced. But I wanted to sit with the family, Gloria replied casually, working Jay. Eminem, RDJ, Scarjo, Don Cheadle, Taylor, Selena, Jennifer Stone, another actress from Wizards of Waverly Place, a few TV anchors and journalists, several Hollywood directors with deep pockets, and many more top models, actresses, and artists were present. What are they all doing here? Kem asked, excitement lighting up his face. Mitchell responded, I don't know, maybe the charity event tugs at their heartstrings. Kem snickered with an expression that seemed to say, as if. Suddenly, the music blaring from the speaker seized the attention of the entire audience. It's starting. Haley exclaimed excitedly, waving two balloon sticks with Edward's name on them. Abby had cut her hair short following the previous night's incident, styling it into twin buns. She, Tara, and Haley joined forces to cheer Edward on. Several cameras, including a Jimmy Jib camera, were capturing the show, which was being broadcast live on various streaming platforms. Wow, there are already 190,000 viewers tuning in, Pepper muttered in astonishment. They only need to pay $10 to watch it, right? And the numbers are still climbing. Edward's advertising campaign is really paying off. Yeah, $10 to watch, an extra $5 to comment, and another $5 to create your own chat channel. The kid's brain is a money-making machine, the director chuckled heartily. This is what Edward meant when he said that he could make a lot more money, even though he donated all the proceeds from the event tickets to charity. Nike and Soup have already signed a deal for a commercial, with payment tied to the number of viewers, Harvey explained. A few more companies are vying to include him in their commercials, be it as an actor or even in his own page videos and even NBC and ABC have reached out to us, Harvey added. Donna is handling those negotiations. Edward left all the business to you. I'll just trust your judgment, Pepper said, patting Harvey's shoulder. So, you're basically passing all the work to me, Harvey quipped. Without further ado, presenting the one and only, Edward Newgate, the MC declared after giving a brief introduction to the concert and its charity cause. Suddenly, a man wearing a white mask and a classical suit appeared on stage with a violin in hand. Huh. Abby was puzzled, but Haley's eyes sparkled as she exclaimed, that's Edward. Taylor, who was watching, was momentarily perplexed before recognizing Edward. Why is he, holding a violin? She murmured with a worried expression. Edward began playing Vivaldi's Four Seasons, Winter, instantly captivating the entire audience, who fell into a trance-like silence. Oh my god, Camila whispered. That's why my sister didn't want him to do anything else. Ted, standing next to her in the VVIP section, wore a solemn expression. He sighed deeply and remarked, it's been too long. The symphony seemed to claw at the hearts of those present. Suddenly, Haley noticed that her cheek was wet. Huh? Why, am I crying? Despite the powerful melody, Edward's anger and sorrow seemed to permeate the entire venue, causing hearts to race, throats to tighten, and emotions to swell. Some felt suffocated, some began to weep, and others experienced intense anger. The kid's a prodigy. RDJ's eyes widened in disbelief, sensing an overwhelming anger emanating from the music. Edward continued to play for about three minutes before abruptly stopping. The entire audience remained silent, and then Edward seized the violin with both hands, hoisted it into the air, and smashed it to the ground. Gasps of shock rippled through the crowd, taking a few moments for them to regain their composure. Holy fucking shit! Abraham exclaimed. Mrs. Henderson closed her eyes, and a solitary tear trickled down her left cheek. The curtains were drawn open, revealing the figures of Phineas, Alex, Billy, and several dancers, all wearing masks similar to the one Edward had worn, along with Victorian-era style clothing. Edward removed his mask as he returned to the microphone stand and tore away the fluffy neck tees around his neck as the giant screen at the back showed a text in big bold golden letters. A king who had lost his kingdom. The revolution had begun. Edward took a deep breath and got lost in the music as it started, with Alex on the cello, Phineas on the violin, Billy on the drums, and a bronze bell in front of her. Her eyes held traces of excitement and nervousness as she watched Edward perform. Coldplay, Viva La Vida. The song's introduction filled the audience with anticipation. The combined efforts of Alex and Phineas were joined by Billy's beats. I grabbed the microphone while still clutching my guitar in one hand and began to sing. I used to rule the world. Seas would rise when I gave the word. Now in the morning, I sleep alone. Sweep the streets I used to own. Claire's expression froze while Phil teared up, murmuring, he must have been so lonely. Cameron was also moved, while Gloria asked Manny, what did he say? 
The song continued, I used to roll the dice, feel the fear in my enemy's eyes, listen as the crowd sings. Now the old king is dead, long live the king. The elderly history teacher pushed up his glasses and mumbled, this feels familiar. One minute, I held the key next, the walls closed in on me, and I discovered that my castles stand upon pillars of salt and pillars of sand. Phineas smirked as he played the violin, his eyes locked onto Edward's back with an intense gaze. Billy smiled as she struck the bell. Edward, brimming with excitement, raised his hand as he sang the chorus. I hear Jerusalem bells a ringin', Roman cavalry choirs are singin', be my mirror, my sword, and shield, my missionaries in a foreign field. For some reason, I can't explain. Once you'd gone, there was never, never an honest word. And that was when I ruled the world? The crowd erupted in excitement, even those initially reluctant parents had now changed their minds and were fully immersed in the concert. It was a wicked and wild wind. Blew down the doors to let me in. Shattered windows and the sound of drums. People couldn't believe what I'd become. A gentle breeze caressed Edward's face as he continued to perform. Taylor whispered, is it time for the revolution now? Taylor's dad, Scott, maintained a stoic expression, but his left foot tapped the ground subtly, following the rhythms. Revolutionaries wait. For my head on a silver plate. Just a puppet on a lonely string. Oh, who would ever want to be king? Unbeknownst to Edward, the lyrics had stirred deep emotions in two people close to him his dad and his aunt causing tears to flow. I hear Jerusalem bells airing in, oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. Roman cavalry choirs are singing, oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. Be my mirror, my sword, and shield. My missionaries in a foreign field, oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. For some reason I can't explain. I know Saint Peter won't call my name. Never an honest word. But that was when I ruled the world. The guy who stands in front of the gate of heaven. Abby's eyes lit up as she realized what Edward meant. Never an honest word. But that was when I ruled the world. So he was never true to himself while he was on top of the world, RDJ muttered. Damn, I have no words. Damn. Don Cheadle was astonished as he tried to comprehend the lyrics. Oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. 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 The chant of oh oh oh, oh oh, oh, filled the air with an inexplicable emotion. Jacob muttered, is this about the French Revolution? Why are some people crying? Elsa rubbed her forehead in frustration and retorted, do you really think this is just about the revolution? That's what Ed told us, Jacob replied naively. I hear Jerusalem bells a ringin, oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. Roman cavalry choirs are singin, oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. Be my mirror, my sword, and shield. My missionaries in a foreign field, oh oh oh, oh oh, oh. For some reason I can't explain. I know Saint Peter won't call my name. Never an honest word. But that was when I ruled the world. Beads of sweat glistened on the children's faces, yet their eyes shone with fanaticism as they soaked in the thunderous applause from the audience. Mrs. Henderson wore a satisfied smile, while the Dunphy family had never been prouder of Alex and Edward. Edward, catching his breath, flashed a grin before addressing the microphone, What's up, Franklin Middle? Ah! Oh. The crowd surged with excitement, their voices ringing out as they cheered for Edward and the rest of the band. Chapter 145, Chapter 145, Charity Concert, 2. I have a bit of a medical emergency this week, so I will be taking a few days off. Edward's POV. Oh, how I missed this, I muttered as the crowd chanted my name. The opening act had been more successful than I had planned. Through my earpiece, I could hear Pepper updating me about the web broadcast, which had grown to 350,000 viewers in just a few minutes since the concert began. $3.5 million in my pocket. Though, compared to the 300 million citizens in the United States alone, the number of the audience is quite small. I want to take this to the international stage, but I have little time to do that, I thought to myself. How's the stability and quality of the broadcast? Harvey asked the director, reminding her to provide updates every 10 minutes or if there was a surge in viewers. The picture is still high definition, even with choppy internet. The quality won't degrade. How did he do it? Even the live TV broadcast stations aren't as stable as his, the director exclaimed in wonder. I nodded in satisfaction before turning back to the crowd. Everyone, before we continue as you know this is actually a school event so I want to introduce a few talented people who are joining me on stage today. The bespectacled beauty with the cello there is Alex Dunphy. I pointed at Alex, who was wearing a white dress and a cropped jacket. She grinned, pushing up the Ray-Ban style spectacles I had designed for her, earning cheers from the audience, especially from her family and friends. We love Alex Abraham suddenly unfurled a banner, causing Alex's face to blush bright red. Take that down. Alex screamed, making the crowd laugh. Jacob complied with her request, not wanting to distract her. And we have another cutie patitty on the drums here, but that's only for now. She'll show you how she shreds on an electric guitar later. Billy Eilish. The crowd cheered for the young girl. After my documentary was released, Billy's reputation had surpassed that of Alex and her brother, becoming the most famous person on the stage after me. Perhaps it was because she sang a cover song from Smash Mouth, earning her a lot of older fans who cheered for her today. Billy smiled shyly as she waved at the crowd, still clad in oversized clothes with Albert Einstein pictures on them, her hair tied up in twin buns, shorts, and boots. Next up, the handsome, though not nearly as handsome as me, Phineas O'Connell. I said as I pointed to the cool-looking boy right behind me. 
Like me, Phineas had competed in various classical music competitions since he was young, so he knew how to maintain a stoic demeanor in front of a crowd. I covered the microphone and whispered to him, smile, Phineas. You forgot to smile. Ah, right. Phineas was taken aback and started waving at the crowd while flashing a shy smile. It was a new experience for him, as the crowd exploded with cheers and chants of his name, reinforcing his decision to leave classical music behind and enter mainstream music. And last but not least, you're one and only. Me. I joked with the crowd, earning laughter all around. For our next performance, I'm singing something I'm sure you guys are already familiar with, one of my very first singles to hit it big me and my broken heart. Enjoy, I announced. The crowd erupted in cheers, and I turned to my friends, asking, are you guys ready? Well, at the very least, I'm not not ready, Alex answered pessimistically, making Billy and Phineas laugh. I smirked and returned to the audience after offering a few encouraging words to my friends. We performed Me and My Broken Heart, Seven Years, which brought a bright smile to Jay's face, The Lazy Song, and Believer, which received an explosive reaction from the crowd. Sweating hard, Billy and Phineas waved at the crowd in satisfaction, while Alex tried to cover her face as the embarrassment waved over her. I hugged the band members, and shouted to the crowd, Give it up for Franklin Middle School students performer? They did pretty well, don't you think? The crowd cheered thunderously as I hugged Phineas, Billy, and Alex one by one. They bowed to the crowd as their performance was already over. The show reached the first break, and we bowed to the crowd again before going backstage. A Latina girl in a cream-colored dress was getting ready as we left the stage. Hey, good luck out there. I said to Selena. She grinned and said, Thanks. I'm really nervous. Don't be. Most of the crowd out there are parents and kids. They would be supportive no matter how hard you fail. She rolled her eyes and scolded me, shouldn't you comfort me instead of praying for me to fail? I shrugged my shoulders in a baffled gesture while joking, I didn't. I laughed a bit and patted her shoulder, break a leg. She nodded with a face filled with determination as the MC called her name. Presenting the Disney Channel star Selena Gomez, the MC announced in excitement as the red curtain was drawn open again. Thanks a lot, you guys, I said as I hugged each member of my group one by one. All of them were drenched in sweat and visibly tired from the continuous performance. Go and enjoy the rest of the performance. Just know that you guys have done something extraordinary today, I complimented them, eliciting gleeful giggles. Ah, I have no energy left, Alex complained. We will be getting paid for our help, right? She smirked, making a cash money gesture with her hands. I smiled mischievously and said, Unfortunately, you guys didn't sign any contracts, except for today's release. So, ugh, money grubber. Alex complained, though I was just joking. I had every intention of paying them well for their help today. Billy chimed in, I'm alright. You don't have to pay me. Phineas added, me too. Really? If you get paid, you can invite Alex on a luxurious date. Don't you want the money? I teased Phineas. Why would I ever want to date Alex? Phineas replied, his face flushing. I don't want to date you either. Alex retorted, offended by Phineas's remarks. Billy laughed at them and said, Ed, are you tired? Don't you want to rest for a bit too? I'm actually fine. You guys are the ones lacking stamina, I replied, flexing my biceps. Besides, Selena agreed to sing only two songs. Really? Without getting paid? Billy asked, confused. No, her payment will be donated to the cause. Also, she's managed by Disney so a charity event in a middle school was right up their alley. They agreed to let her in the second they saw the previous live stream numbers, so I don't have to pay her at all. Mickey is taking this one on his own, I said with an evil smile. Money grubber, Billy grumbled with a small smile. Money sucking demon, Alex added after catching her breath. Not even Mickey is safe from you, Phineas added. Hey, I yelled at them, causing them to giggle and run away. PFF, kids, I snorted in annoyance, waving goodbye to them before turning to Phineas, who was the only one that stayed behind. Can, can I stay backstage and watch, he asked with a stutter. Sure. Just don't peek at the dancers changing though, I reminded him. He was astonished and said, you can do that. As long as you're famous enough, they might even change voluntarily in front of you, I replied. Don't teach him bad things. Alex and Billy shouted from afar as they were apparently still within earshot. General POV. As Taylor watched Selena perform on stage, she gritted her teeth in jealousy before turning to her dad. If I hadn't gone back to Texas, I would be up on that stage instead of her. Huh? Why is that my fault? I didn't ask you to fake an injury. Besides, isn't relaxing and supporting your friend's performance good? No, if I don't sing, then I can't go to the after party? Then Ed and I can't Taylor protested before abruptly cutting herself off, realizing she had almost revealed her true intentions to her dad. Can't what? Scott asked, raising an eyebrow. Nothing. Selena, you go girl. Taylor shouted toward the stage. Selena saw her and waved several times, signaling their close friendship to the world. It was a bit calculated on her part, but it would still benefit them both. The MC interviewed Selena after she finished performing, during which she spoke about how the cause moved her and her desire to take action. As expected, her reputation soared positively as both the live audience and those watching the broadcast believed in her heartfelt answer. Hey, honey, do those clouds look darker to you? Jay suddenly noticed nimbus clouds gathering in the previously sunny sky, 
Look at the stage, Jay, Gloria replied, rolling her eyes. I'm just worried. We're in the middle of an open field, and we didn't bring an umbrella, Jay said playfully. Luke turned to Claire and asked, Mom, do you have any snacks? Hmm? Luke, are you hungry? A little bit. Didn't you stuff your face at the festival earlier? How can you still be hungry? Haley asked in astonishment. Luke growled and retorted, How can you be so close with Ed and still only be best friends? A-H-H. Haley gasped in offense, while Mitchell and Cam looked at Luke in astonishment. It didn't take long for Selena to finish her performance and return backstage. After all, she just sang one song. Hey, you did great, Edward said. Selena smiled brightly and hugged him. It's been a while since I performed. I was so nervous, she confessed, her hands lingering on his chest as she gazed at him with a dazed expression. Hey, if Taylor sees this, she's going to kill us, Edward joked as he lightly brushed off Selena's hands. Taylor won't mind. As long as we're not dating, Selena replied flirtatiously, biting her lower lip. Well, we'll talk afterward, Edward joked before waving her goodbye and walking onto the stage. Hello again, everyone. Did you enjoy my friend's performance? Yes. Ken the guitarist, McGee the drummer, Jess the keyboardist, and Johnson the bassist all of Edward's previous helpers from his first concert had replaced his friends on stage. The MC smiled and approached Edward for an interview. Hold up, Ed. Before you start the second half of the performance, I'm sure there are many people here who would like to get to know you better. Sure, shoot, Edward replied casually, holding his guitar. The MC grinned slyly before asking, A little birdie told me that you changed your album release from next spring to just a week from now. How did that happen? The crowd started to murmur, and Phil shouted, Nice. Not only him, but many more people were eagerly anticipating the first album. Even in the live broadcast, the audience was flooding the chat with messages about the album. Abby rolled her eyes and said, Rumors? It's not a rumor at all. He told the MC to ask that. Haley overheard it and was astonished as she watched Edwards acting on stage. He pretended to be surprised and curious about how the MC got hold of that information. Haley chuckled before muttering, Sigh, that Edward. Well, I don't know how you got the information, but it's true, Edward confirmed. The crowd erupted in cheers, causing Edward and the MC to wait for them to settle down before continuing. The album, Breaking, will be released a day after July 4th, so make sure to show me lots of support. Not only that, but I will also kick off a tour across the state starting on July 14th. From here all the way to the East Coast, I will perform in 33 locations before wrapping up the tour in Las Vegas, Edward continued. Oh, when can we buy the tickets, the MC asked curiously. You can check the tour schedule on my website for the locations, and you can buy tickets directly from the venues or online through the website, although I should warn you that places will be limited and I am personally working on a special surprise for the Vegas week Edward replied, hiding his capitalistic smile and flashing a charming one. And for those of you who are hoping to follow me on the tour, you can keep up with my updates on my Instagram. Instagram. It's a new social media app one created, Edward said with a slightly embarrassed tilt of his body, introducing the app to the world. He took out his phone from his pocket and displayed his Instagram page for everyone to see as the image was replicated on the huge screen at the back. In the live broadcast, a small banner advertising the Instagram app popped up in the left corner of the screen. Quickly, the number of downloads for the newly released app on the different stores exceeded 100,000, and Edward's followers on his Instagram page soared. Wait, you made this app? The MC asked, completely shocked as he saw the smooth interface and high-quality behind-the-scenes photos and short videos of Edward and his friends preparing for the concerts, along with a few pictures of him shooting the music video with Taylor. Capitalists like Jay saw right through what Edward was doing and smiled, appreciating the kids' business sense. Claire, don't you need to get to work? He asked his daughter. Oh no, Frankie offered to handle it. I left it all to her, Claire replied casually. The MC continued, So Ed, I heard another rumor that the next song you're going to sing is directed at a certain someone. Huh. Taylor smiled and quickly covered her mouth as the camera focused on her. Well, I won't confirm nor deny that, but now that you brought it up I have to say that when you hear the song, you might think of something along those lines, Edward replied bashfully. The fans screamed in excitement, while Haley turned to Abby, only to find that her friend had no reaction to this. You're not mad? Haley asked. Why? We're not dating. Besides, he already told me he was going to do this yesterday, Abby replied casually before shouting in support of Edward. Okay, I'll play along. Yeah, we won't know who the song is directed to then, the MC said sarcastically but playfully. Yeah, let it be a mystery, Edward joked, making the crowd laugh. Without further ado, give it up for Edward Newgate with his new song, Check Yes. Juliet, the MC announced playfully, looking in Taylor's direction. Surprised by the whole situation, Taylor's face turned bright red, captured by the live broadcast causing people all over the country to jest at the both of them. Edward turned to the band and counted a few beats before playing his electric guitar in a pop rock melody. We the Kings, check yes Juliet. Check yes, Juliet, are you with me? Rain is falling down on the sidewalk. I won't go until you come outside. The shippers erupted in cheers as Edward sang. Lily, the fan club president, nervously wrung her hands as she muttered, Oh my god, oh my god, he's confessing directly. Check yes, Juliet. Kill the limbo. 
I'll keep tossing rocks at your window. There's no turning back for us tonight. The camera zoomed in on Edward's face as he sang into the microphone, causing most of the girls in the audience and those watching the web broadcast to swoon. Lace up your shoes. Background singer, oh, oh, oh. here's how we do. Run, baby, run. People who were sitting stood up and began to dance, rocking their heads back and forth, following the rhythms. Dante ever look back. They'll tear us apart, if you give them the chance. Dante sell your heart, don't say we're not meant to be. Run, baby, run, forever we'll be, you and me. The crowd jumped and danced excitedly, while the entire world eagerly awaited Taylor's reaction. As expected, the girl covered her mouth with both hands, her face flushing red from embarrassment. That jerk? He should have given me a warning, Taylor muttered in mock anger, her attempt to stifle her smile proving futile. Check yes, Juliet, I'll be waiting. Wishing, wanting, yours for the taking. Just sneak out, and don't tell a soul goodbye, Edward sang with a wink, leaving Taylor in a daze. Don't, Taylor's dad suddenly said, dousing Taylor's wild imagination with a dose of reality. Check yes, Juliet. Here's the countdown. Three, two, one, now fall in my arms. Now they can change the locks, don't let them change your mind. A-H-H, this modern-day Romeo and Juliet are good too, Kim muttered aloud. Lace up your shoes. The background singer, oh oh, here's how we do. The crowd held its breath and then erupted in energetic cheers as Edward sang the chorus. Run, baby, run, don't ever look back. They'll tear us apart, if you give them the chance. Dante sell your heart, don't say we're not meant to be. Run, baby, run, forever we'll be, you and me, woo. The crowd erupted in cheers. The atmosphere was electric, even as the sky slowly darkened. Weary flying through the night, way up high. The view from here is getting better with you by my side, Edward crooned. Jenna shot a murderous glare at Taylor from a distance. I need to become a singer too, she muttered under her breath. Why not become an actress, sweetie? Her mother suggested. Run, baby, run don't ever look back. They'll tear us apart, if you give them the chance. Dante sell your heart, don't say we're not meant to be run, baby, run forever we'll be, you and me. Edward stopped strumming his guitar and walked to the edge of the stage, dragging his microphone stand with him as he bent over the stage looking down at the people and the general direction of Taylor's seat in the VVIP section. Run, baby, run, don't ever look back. They'll tear us apart, if you give them the chance, don't sell your heart. Don't say we're not meant to be, run, baby, run forever we'll be you and me, you and me, you and me. The crowd cheered and chanted, Edward, Taylor, Edward, Taylor. Edward chuckled and asked through the mic, when did my name change to Taylor? The crowd laughed, but the excitement couldn't be brushed off. They continued to scream and chant for a while as Edward took a break to drink some water. After some time, the crowd began to calm down. Just as Edward was about to say something, a random person suddenly shouted loudly from afar. Game. Huh? What game? Edward asked, confused. The song game. The random person shouted again. Edward laughed and replied, I'll do that when we have more time and we're indoors. For now, let's focus on the show. Look up, we don't have much time. Chapter 146, Chapter 146, Charity Concert, 3. I'm back. Sorry I have a mini heart attack and major asthma attack. So I was resting for a while. General POV. This is breaking news? Ugh, why is he broadcasting this? The value of this information will be lower, a sleazy paparazzo muttered as he checked the pictures he had snapped with his secret camera, as Edward didn't allow flash photography inside the concert. In the world of paparazzi, the less people knew about the information, the more valuable it was. That's how it worked in their line of work but now everything was actually being broadcasted and most news agencies would have their own people stuck to monitors getting everything on real time. Having been ignored during the interview in front of the hospital earlier, he vowed to exact revenge by capturing unflattering pictures of Edward on stage. But as he reviewed his shots, he was stunned to find that all of the singer's pictures were immaculate and dashing. Why is this happening? He asked with teary eyes. I just want one. Just one bad photo. Then, he was spotted and escorted out of the venue by a muscular African-American security guard in PE clothes. Far away from the venue, Desiree was busy packing her belongings as she and Abby needed to move back to New York the next day. Her skin glistened with sweat, and her red tank top clung to her body. They hadn't brought much with them to California, so it wasn't difficult for her to fit everything into three suitcases. After finishing, she wore a satisfied smile before turning her attention to the laptop, where she was watching the concert. Hmm, I can still catch the last song. Wait, I'll bring an umbrella too, she muttered as she rushed out of the house. However, in her haste, she forgot to change her outfit when she got into the car and even left the door unlocked as she walked out. At the VVIP section, Selena kept teasing Taylor about the previous song. You know, he did multiple songs for you, and you only tweaked a line for him in your song, Starlight, Selena said with a serious expression. So maybe you should write a song just for him, she suggested. Taylor pondered it briefly, but then her dad chimed in, No, you cannot do that. I haven't heard his country song yet. I haven't judged him still remember that for all the loud screeching you do these days you started singing country so we will still wait and see. Taylor rolled her eyes and replied, Dad, he will do it. I think. I'm not sure. I forgot to ask. 
Scott looked at his daughter while she tried to avoid his gaze. Meanwhile, on Edward's website and forum page, discussions about the songs were exploding with activity. Almost everywhere in the country, people were starting to believe that there was something going on between Edward and Taylor, no matter how much they tried to cover things up and any opinion on the contrary was quickly followed by a continued post and repost of the leaked princess dress photos. However, the conversation quieted down as Edward continued the performance with another song. Edward's POV. Did you guys bring your umbrellas? I checked the weather forecast this morning, and it said it should be sunny. I don't know why we can smell the scent of rain right now, I spoke casually with the audience as they murmured with worry. The clouds kept darkening, and distant sounds of thunder could be heard. Why is this happening? I thought anxiously. From the injuries this morning to not getting permission to walk around the festival, and now rain threatening my performance, I felt like I was cursed today. Shouldn't my luck be good? Or is there another gotcha session tonight, and my karma points have been tallied now? If so, did my bad karma surpass the good ones? How is that even possible? Well, I don't want to end the concert early. I have three songs left to perform. One of them, you guys have already had the chance to listen to, a song from my newly released single, Natural. Then, the crowd cheered upon hearing the song's name, prompting me to pause. I smiled as I patiently waited for them to calm down before continuing, seeing you guys like this, I think I will keep the other two songs as a surprise. Although there were some playful protests here and there, it didn't change my mind. For the next song, I decided to focus on singing and avoid the dancers. Just then, I heard Enid's hoarse voice coming from the crowd, and I turned to wave at her, unable to hold back my laughter. I signaled to the band, and the dancers rushed to the stage, circling around me as I sang, Will you hold the line? General POV. Why do I already have goosebumps? This is what Taylor meant when she said we definitely need to watch him live, Jennifer Stone, Selena's best friend, commented while rubbing her bare arm. When every one of them has given up and given in, tell me Edward's gaze turned murderous, sending shivers through the crowd. They held their breath, their hearts racing, and their eyes filled with excitement. In this house of mine, nothing ever comes without a consequence or cost, tell me. Will the stars align? Will heaven step in? Will it save us from our sin, will it? Cause this house of mine stands strong. Gloria instinctively did the Christian sign of the cross, silently offering prayers for Edward's soul. God, don't blame him. He's not an infidel. He's just a child. That's the price you pay. Leave behind your heart and cast away. Oh my God. Phil widened his eyes. My blood is rushing all over my body, as he jumped around like a lie kid on a sugar rush. Just another product of today. Rather be the hunter than the prey. Wait, is this the song you guys put in the movie? Scarlett asked RDJ in a hushed tone. Uh, no, RDJ replied, filled with regret. Although now I kind of wish we had, that does it next time I'm making him go over all his material. Edward advanced toward the front of the stage, enveloped by the dancers who seemed to burst away as he passionately sang the chorus. And you're standing on the edge face up. Cause you're a natural? The crowd erupted in cheers, with a few undergarments soaring through the air and making their way toward the stage. Stop. Scoot firmly grasped Taylor's hand, preventing her from attempting to remove her bra. Ugh, Taylor exclaimed in frustration, resuming her modest demeanor. A beating heart of stone, you gotta be so cold, to make it in this world. Yeah, you're a natural, living your life cutthroat. You gotta be so cold? Yeah, you're a natural? A-H-H, I can't even analyze it, Edward's therapist muttered as she enjoyed the show through her laptop. She even danced around and momentarily forgot about her work as she listened to the song. Edward smiled and stared directly into the camera, will somebody, let me see the light within the dark trees shadowing. What's happening? Looking through the glass, find the wrong within the past, knowing. Oh, we are the youth, cut until it bleeds inside a world without peace, face it. A bit of the truth, the truth. What is the truth? Luke asked his mother. Even I don't know, Luke, Claire replied. Edward extended his microphone to the audience, and they sang the lines of the song together, creating a loud symphony of voices. That's the price you pay. Leave behind your heart and cast away. Just another product of today. I'd rather be the hunter than the prey. Good job, everyone. Edward muttered with a satisfied smile before he continued, and you're standing on the edge face up. Cause you're a natural? A heart of stone. You gotta be so cold. To make it in this world. The web broadcast exploded with cheering comments from the fans. When is he coming to our city? A girl in Texas asked. Let me check. Um, the 20th. Buy the tickets? N-O-W-W. Unaware of the situation with his concert tickets, which had already sold half, Edward continued, Yeah, you're a natural? Living your life cutthroat. You gotta be so cold? Yeah, you're a natural. Suddenly, all of the dancers around stopped and kneeled, while Edward looked down and sang, Deep inside me, I'm fading to black, I'm fading. Took an oath by the blood on my hand, won't break it. I can taste it, the end is upon us, I swear. End? What end? Claire muttered in concern. Gonna make it. The crowd held their breath, while Ted vowed to himself that he would see Edward through the therapy session. I am gonna make it. Edward shouted, causing the entire crowd to be stunned, and then it exploded into thunderous cheers a few moments later. Natural? A beating heart of stone. You gotta be so cold to make it in this world. Yeah, you're a natural? Living your life cutthroat? You gotta be so cold? Yeah, you're a natural? 
Edward walked back to the center of the stage, preparing for the ending. Natural. Yeah, you're a natural. The dancers brought a throne to the center. Edward sat on the throne with a cold expression on his face, eliciting immense cheers from the crowd. Fluffy Shire, Abraham said while wiping his tears. Elsa rolled her eyes and immediately said, No. Phil and Claire's commentary. Phil was excited. It was as if I was watching a movie, I got goosebumps all over my body. Claire nodded and said with a face filled with astonishment, He's not exaggerating. It appear, all over. Phil glanced at Claire in confusion before continuing, Not only that, my Instagram page got a lot more followers during the show. Huh? How many? Claire asked. Five. Phil said in excitement. I'm going to be, what's that word Edward said? Yeah, insta-famous. Haley and Alex's commentary. We, have split opinions about the song, Haley muttered while crossing her arms. Alex nodded and continued, I think it's too dark and I also think that she only enjoys it because she can't catch the lyrics or understand what any sentence actually means. Hey, Haley exclaimed in offense. I got what they meant. And, Alex trailed off, trying to make Haley continue. Luke's commentary. I didn't understand a thing of what he said, so I just danced to the beats, he confessed. Jay and Gloria's commentary. Gloria babbled incomprehensibly in Spanish for a while before she said in a decisive manner, I, we need to bring Edward back to the church. He's gone astray. Right, Jay? Jay sighed beside Gloria before he said, well, not exactly. He's just facing the world with a logical attitude right now. I think it's the best choice for him. When a man is no longer naive, then there's not a lot of things that can hurt him anymore. So you're saying he shouldn't believe in God, Jay? Gloria said angrily. Un dia, toda la familia va ardear en el infierno, one day, the whole family will burn in hell, except oh yo, except me, dot. Mitch and Kem's commentary. Ah, I liked it but I do have to admit that the song is not for us, Kem replied. Then Mitchell said sarcastically, because all of our songs are either Abba, Adele, or Gaga. Don't make it a gay thing, Kem glanced at Mitchell in disbelief. Well, I like it, Mitchell said, emphasizing the I. Commentary ends. As the song concluded, Edward grabbed a clean towel to wipe his sweaty forehead before turning to the crowd. I've just been notified that we've reached our target for charitable donations from people all across the country. Let's give a round of applause to all the school staff members. The crowd erupted in applause, accompanied by whistles and shouts from various directions. Edward smiled and continued, as you all know by now, I started this concert with some ulterior motives. But that doesn't mean the cause was bad. Ulterior motives. Claire was confused, and Haley asked her, you didn't check his interviews before the concert started. What interview? Show me, demanded Claire. Haley took out her phone with the interview page already loaded. The title read, A young pop star almost died being stabbed in an alley. There were several more articles about Edward circulating today, including, Injured a few hours before the concert? Will the young pop star give up? Hidden motives behind the charitable cause. Surprising story from Edward Newgate. Why does a kid do more for the homeless than the politicians? Edward continued, With the cooperation of the soup company and the soup kitchens all around California, fresh meals will be delivered at least once a day to all the soup kitchens across the city. Most of the food in these soup kitchens used to come from canned donations, mainly because they were nearing their expiry dates. As a result, the choices for the homeless were limited. I hope that with this effort, people will start looking out for those around them and not turn a blind eye to the plight affecting our country. Damn, I sound like a politician there. In 20 more years maybe I'll run for president. How's that sound? Edward joked, but some people, with their eyes filled with fanaticism, took it seriously. President Edward. Run for the White House. Edward laughed for a moment, waiting for the audience to settle down before suddenly putting on a cowboy hat, leaving them all confused. Well, I'm pretty shy about doing this, but a promise is a promise. When Taylor came here from Texas to attend the concert, I told her that if her dad came along, I would sing a country song to thank him for taking the time to bring her here. The crowd laughed and cheered for Edward, causing him to blush. Stop, guys. I'm telling the truth. So, I had to create a country song to fulfill that promise. It was quite challenging, and I had no idea what to write for a long time, Edward explained. Until one day, a neighborhood dad dash. He's talking about me. Phil exclaimed excitedly. Told me a story of how he and his wife first met, and how he always knew they would be together. Ah, Phil, Claire was touched and hugged Phil. So, this song is inspired by their love story. Enjoy, your man. Edward skillfully strummed his guitar, and the drummer helped provide the beat. The country music rhythm made people sway to the music, and then Edward began to sing in a deep voice. Josh Turner, your man. Baby, lock the door and turn the lights down low. PFF Dash Phil nearly spewed out his drink as the song began. Claire froze in her spot, while the rest of the adults in the family looked at them in astonishment. And put some music on that soft and slow. The nerve on that kid. Ha ha ha. Jay guffawed loudly. Baby, we ain't got no place to go I hope you understand. Taylor's face blushed red, while her dad furrowed his brow. Taylor thought he was angry, but he suddenly smiled and exclaimed, Good stuff. Edward playfully brought his guitar to the front of the stage, serenading the crowd. I've e been thinking about this all day long. Never felt a feeling quite this strong. I can't believe how much it turns me on. Just to be your man. I wanna dance. Scar Joe suddenly said. With my husband. 
Well, he's not here, and my wife ain't here either, RDJ said before he took Scarjo's hand. They danced lightly to the melody. Not only them, but a lot more couples started to dance together as they heard the song. There's no hurry, don't you worry. We can take our time. Come a little closer, let's go over. What I had in mind. What, Phil? What did you have in mind? Kem teased. Aye aye, honey, trust me, I didn't tell him any of that. Phil tried to placate the embarrassed Claire hurriedly. Baby, lock the door and turn the lights down low. And put some music on that soft and slow. Baby, we ain't got no place to go. I hope you understand. Jay and Gloria were dancing, and Gloria turned to Claire, saying, Claire, you need to enjoy this. This is your song. Haley stepped away from her mother in disgust. Claire saw it and nervously tried to explain herself, Honey, no. We didn't damn it. Edward. Ivy been thinking about this all day long. Never felt a feeling quite this strong. I can't believe how much it turns me on. Just to be your man. Taylor's dad was thoroughly impressed, and he told Taylor, I approve. Yes, thank you, daddy. Taylor said as she hugged her dad. Auntie nobody ever loved nobody. The way that I love you. We're alone now. You don't know how long I've wanted to. Enid's face blushed red, and she turned to Alex, saying, I didn't think that your mom and dad were so affectionate. I have no mom and dad from now on, Alex said in embarrassment, trying to hide her face behind her hair. Lock the door and turn the lights down low, and put some music on that soft and slow. Edward's sweet and melting voice made many girls swoon once again. With a dazed face, Selena asked Taylor, Hey, are you sure we can't share him? Back off, bitch. Edward continued without knowing about the catfight going on in the VVIP section. Baby, we ain't got no place to go I hope you understand. Ivy been thinking about this all day long. Never felt a feeling that was quite this strong. I can't believe how much it turns me on. Just to be your man. Claire, don't be mad. He's not doing this on purpose, I think. If you listen to the lyrics, it's about how much I love to be your man, not about waiting to do it with you. Phil tried to comfort his wife. Claire nodded reluctantly and said, No, Phil. I swear he is doing this on purpose. What does it mean? Sex. Luke asked, causing both of his parents to freeze in their spot. I can't believe how much it turns me on. Just to be your man. The gentle outro put a smile on everyone's face. Those from Texas and the country's state had all fallen under Edward's spell, especially with his handsome cowboy look and deep singing voice. How about it, folks? Did you enjoy the music? Edward asked in a southern accent, earning thunderous cheers from the crowd. Chapter 147, Chapter 147, Charity Concert, 4 Final. Edward's POV. To be honest, doing a country song was quite challenging, considering I hadn't been exposed to that genre much in my previous life. As I finished the song, I received a notification from Pepper saying, there's a storm warning on the west coast. I understand, I replied. I glanced up at the sky and frowned inwardly, sensing that raindrops would soon fall. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to say goodbye. A storm is coming, and we should seek shelter indoors. N-O-O-O. Enid's voice echoed from the crowd. Many people were reluctant to see the concert end, not just Enid. However, the darkening sky was a clear indicator that we needed to return home swiftly. Thunder and lightning added to the growing sense of anxiety and concern among the audience. I smiled and signaled the staff members to prepare for the final act. They nodded and began setting up a grand piano at the front and center of the stage. With a casual stride, I took a seat at the piano when a staff member placed a microphone in front of me. For the last song, which I find rather ironic, it's called It Will Rain. It's been an enjoyable evening, everyone, I said softly. I closed my eyes, and my fingers started to glide across the piano keys. Bruno Mars, It Will Rain. The music instantly captivated the audience, hushing any remaining murmurs. I sang with emotion, if you ever leave me, baby, leave some morphine at my door. General POV, MM Morphine. Claire stuttered nervously, her face displaying disbelief. Cause it would take a whole lot of medication. To realize what we used to have, we don't have it anymore. Oh, Jenna exclaimed in realization before muttering, a pain that only drugs could alleviate. He's just like you, mom. Except you snored it through your nose. Alexandria's face froze at her daughter's words. It was the first time Jenna had spoken sarcastically to her, leaving her stunned and speechless. There's no religion that could save me. No matter how long my knees are on the floor, oh, I, that infidel, Gloria murmured as she made an imaginary cross, again, silently praying for Edward's soul, again. So keep in mind all the sacrifices I'm making. To keep you by my side, to keep you from walking out the door. Edward gazed at the darkening sky as he poured his emotions into the song. His presence left a deep impression on the minds of those in the audience as he sang. Cause there'll be no sunlight. If I lose you, baby, there'll be no clear skies. If I lose you, baby. Enid's eyes lit up before she mumbled, so, who's this for? It's not Abby, Taylor, or his mother, because that would just be weird. If it's for the deceased grandma, then it would be even weirder. Just like the clouds, my eyes will do the same. If you walk away, every day it'll rain, rain, rain. Enid then realized, A-H-H, the Twilight movie. I forgot about it. Wait did I really just forget about Twilight? I need to reread the whole book twice this summer to make sure this doesn't happen again. I'll never be your mother's favorite. Your daddy can't even look me in the eye, oh. So, not me, Taylor muttered. 
Not me, Abby muttered. Not me, Haley muttered. Not me, Phil muttered. Claire was baffled and scolded quickly, why would it ever be for you? If I were in their shoes, I'd be doing the same thing. Saying, there goes my little girl. Walking with that troublesome guy. In a street nearby the school, Desiree patiently waited for the traffic light to change so she could get to the concert. The strong wind made her hair flatter, and as she pressed the gas pedal after the light turned green, she failed to notice a truck approaching from her side. But they're just afraid of something they can't understand, oh. But, little darling, watch me change their minds. Yeah, for you, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. And pick up these broken pieces till I'm bleeding, if that'll make you mine. Seconds later, shattered glass littered the streets. Her car's engine was smoking, and people began to shout for help. Cause there'll be no sunlight. If I lose you, baby, there'll be no clear skies. If I lose you, baby, Abby, isn't your mom here yet? Haley asked. Well, she's supposed to be here, but it's already too late, Abby replied. It's better if she stays at home, she muttered in concern. I don't know why I'm getting a bad feeling. Just like the clouds, my eyes will do the same. If you walk away, every day it'll rain, rain, rain. Edward scanned the crowd, and at that moment, a light drizzle began to fall from the clouds. Oh, don't you say, don't you say, goodbye, goodbye, don't you say, don't you say, goodbye, goodbye. A-H-H, I don't want this to end, Selena whined. I haven't had enough. Taylor nodded beside her, and her dad placed his cowboy hat on her head to shield her from the rain. I'll pick up these broken pieces till I'm bleeding, if that'll make it right. The rain began to pour, but no one left the venue, cause there'll be no sunlight. If I lose you, baby, and there'll be no clear skies. If I lose you, baby. Edward's shirt became wet, and his muscular physique became more pronounced, causing a few girls to blush. His hair fell onto his face and the piano, adding to the legendary performance. And just like the clouds, my eyes will do the same. If you walk away, every day it'll rain, rain, rain. Edward played the outro for a while and smiled as he finished the song. Everyone, it's been a wonderful evening, I'll wait for you guys at my next concert, goodbye, and walk safely. Get to shelter, quickly he said while standing in the rain. The crowd cheered, but the rain poured heavily. Edward led the way for his friends to get backstage, while most of the crowd members left the field in a hurry. Thankfully, no one was hurt inside the concert venue. Kem and Mitch had already gotten backstage earlier as Cam was carrying Lily while also bringing Amanda with him. Edward's POV, those poor kids. Luckily, there's no school anymore, I muttered as I watched the crowd scurry away. Alex rolled her eyes as she wiped her wet hair with a towel. That's incorrect. You should say, school is out for the summer. I gazed into her eyes, taking her aback for a bit. W what? You know, you're the spitting image of your mother. Without the promiscuity, I said in a casual manner, unaware that the mother bear was within earshot. Promiscuity? Phil? What did you tell him? Claire reacted harshly. I really didn't tell him anything. Phil defended himself. Oh, you guys are here. Get some dry towels. The staff is picking up more. I pointed at the bundle of clothes nearby. Then, I took off my shirt, causing Alex to yelp. Claire chased her away to be with her uncles quickly. Most of the VVIPs had already been escorted outside by their bodyguards, otherwise, the backstage area would be crowded. Among my friends, only Jenna and her mother needed backstage shelter. The others had already gone with their families. The weather forecaster really ruined everything, huh? Claire muttered as she rubbed her hair with the towel vigorously. Hey, rain or shine is only a human being, Phil defended his favorite weather forecaster. Suddenly, I heard a sneeze from behind. A smile unknowingly flashed on my face as I saw Taylor rubbing her nose as she walked towards me. Hey, great concert? Great performance, great, body. Taylor eyed me up and down like a piece of meat. Ahem her dad suddenly cleared his throat to announce his presence there. Taylor blushed and introduced us quickly. Ed, this is my dad, Scott. Hi, Mr. Scott. I'm a great fan of your work, I offered my hand, and he shook it promptly. You mean this piece of work, he said, glancing at his daughter. Dad, Taylor protested. Yay, I agreed with him. Hey, ugh. Taylor groaned and went to dry herself up while I talked with her dad for a while. So, any intentions of going into the country music arena? He asked jokingly. At this moment, no, I replied with a laugh. Okay, enough pleasantries. I know you want my daughter. Scott suddenly turned serious. I wasn't intimidated and replied, yes. He was taken aback for a second before he grinned and added, to join your company. Honestly, I'm against it. Even more so when I found out that the both of you were being intimate with each other. Taylor caught the last sentence, and her face blushed red from embarrassment. Dad, we. No need to lie in front of me, Tay Tay. So Edward, if I say that I will let her go to your company right away, and even pay all of the penalty for breaching the contract, on one condition, you need to stop being intimate with her, will you do it? Dad, we Taylor tried to intervene, but Scott stopped her. I want to hear the answer from you, Edward. Well, if we are being honest here, no, I replied, causing both Scott and Taylor to widen their eyes. Because I can get her to sign on to my company on my own, I smirked. A satisfied smile appeared on Scott's face, while Taylor held her burning cheeks and tried to hide her smile. I added, although we are not dating right now, we won't know what's going to happen in the future. 
Also, I like Taylor. I don't want to cut off my opportunity to call her my girl before anything even happens between us. Scott raised one of his eyebrows and growled with a grim face, you guys had already slept together. What are you even talking about? Dad. Taylor yelled in protest, shocked by her dad's words. I laughed a bit and didn't continue speaking, as I could already see Scott trying to hold back his smile. All right, I won't bother you kids anymore. He shook my hand again as he said, it's been a pleasure seeing you on stage today. It's also been a pleasure getting to know Taylor's lovely dad. Oof. Scott snorted before he walked away. Wear a shirt. A-H-H, I forgot. I finally realized that I was shirtless the entire time. You forgot. Taylor was baffled, but then she smiled as she walked towards me. However, before she could reach me, Selena walked over and grabbed her arm before saying, Wow Ed nice body. I grabbed a white t-shirt from the chair nearby and wore it quickly. Alright, enough free shows. Hee <laughs> hee if you want me to pay you back, I can. Stop. Taylor cupped Selena's mouth before she could finish her words. She smiled at me worriedly as she excused herself, I need to talk to Selena in private. Do you mind? Nah, not at all. Go for it. Also, Ed, how's your foot? Taylor asked before she walked away. It's fine now. I'm on painkillers. Plus the adrenaline from performing, I haven't felt anything for a while. I confessed. Also, I have to warn you, I'm not joining the after party if you feel like sneaking in. Selena pushed Taylor's hand away and asked hurriedly, Huh? Why not? I'm injured. Laugh, I need to rest. I replied in a casual manner. Taylor and Selena walked away in dissatisfaction. I walked towards where Pepper and my family were standing, but someone intercepted my path before I could reach there. Ed. Nice show. Kaya said as she hugged me with her sweaty body. Hey, I just changed. I scolded the dancer insincerely. I just realized that I haven't shown you yet about our choreography in the movie, Kaya said as she took out her phone. My eyes lit up, ah, ironette dance. Let me see, hee <laughs> hee. Here, this is me and the other dancers changing. She said as she showed a picture of the dancers in only their underpants. Luckily, their fronts weren't facing the camera as Kaya snapped the photo. This is the dance. She showed the oldie style dance she and the other ironette practiced and then showed several pictures of her and the other celebrities in the show. This is us, Kaya and Anna, and Scarjo before the show. This is us and John. This is us with Samuel L. Jackson. This is a video of us scissoring the night before. Sorry about that. I was stunned as Kaya blushed and scrolled over to the next photo, trying to smoothly gloss over the topic. Hold up. You and Anna. I asked in bewilderment, and also a bit of excitement. The five seconds I saw on the video had burned deeply into my mind, and I needed answers. Oh no. We weren't dating if that's what you're thinking of. That was just stress relief, Kaya replied casually. Edward, I need to talk to you, Mrs. Henderson suddenly interjected. Can you wait five minutes? I need to hear more about this, I said, trying to get the details from Kaya's mouth. Excuse us, Mrs. Henderson grabbed my arm and dragged me away. Kaya, I need details, details, I exclaimed, causing Kaya to snicker. To my surprise, Haley and Abby were also standing near my family and were currently sharing their opinions about the concert with my proud aunt. Their shirts were wet and sticking to their bodies, which was a treat to the eyes. Mrs. Henderson briefed me about the donations we received during the concert and wondered if I wanted to give out to the charity personally. I rejected that offer and left all the work to the school, as I was already busy enough in the summer. What are you going to do this summer? I asked casually. Teach summer school, Mrs. Henderson replied. Damn, that must suck, I grimaced. Compared to your schedule, mine is relatively peaceful, she muttered with a smirk. She was right. I had a full schedule this summer. With the concerts, album promotions, interviews, and also meeting the fans, I would not return to California until the last week of summer. And even then, I would have a lot of things to do. Also, Edward, your album. We still need to finalize the list of songs going inside it. How about tomorrow? Pepper asked after I finished talking with Mrs. Henderson. Before I could answer, my dad interjected, No, tomorrow is Father's Day. We have a tradition on that day. Yeah, we're going to lose the lottery, I added. Maybe we can win something this year, my dad said wryly. As if. We have no luck whatsoever, I replied while laughing. Also, we need to send Abby and her mom to the airport tomorrow. We will, my dad asked incredulously. Yeah, I already promised them, I said as I waved at Abby. But then, I was shocked as I saw she was crying. I rushed towards her and asked hurriedly, what happened? Her hand shivered. Her mascara was smudged, from the rain, and also from the tears from crying right now. She sobbed and hugged me tightly before she broke down in my arms. Haley, what happened? I asked the pale Haley who was blanking out. She snapped out of her daze and said, D, Desiree, what happened to Desiree? I asked hurriedly. She, she got into an accident. The police, she called Abby to tell her that. Haley choked up as she spoke. What? I was shocked, and then my heart started beating quickly. Did they tell you where she is right now? I asked Abby. She's, she's in the hospital, Abby said, holding back her tears. All right. Pepper, I need to go, right now. I shouted. Pepper was stunned and asked, go where? Dad, can you drive us to the hospital? I asked before I told Pepper about the situation. Again? All right, my dad muttered and decided quickly. 
20 minutes later, we reached the emergency ward. I kept holding Abby's hand as I dragged her to enter the hospital, as her legs were too weak for her to walk by herself. Hi, we got a call. It's for Mrs. Desiree Rutherford, I asked the front desk nurse. The African-American nurse whom I recognized from the TBBT series was surprised to see me again. What's wrong now? Did you break your other leg? She asked playfully as she checked the list. She's in room 420. Oh, that's not a good sign, Haley muttered. I turned towards her in disbelief, but I didn't say anything. With heavy steps, we walked towards the front of Ward 420. Hey, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay, my dad advised Abby. She nodded with a face filled with fear and then inhaled deeply. She opened the door slowly, and her face turned ashen as she saw the figure of a woman with cement bandages all over her body. Even her face was bandaged as it was badly burned. Mom, Abby cupped her mouth as tears fell. She hugged me as her body fell limp. My face turned crestfallen as I looked at Desiree's situation. But then, we heard someone calling for us from the other bed with the curtains still drawn. Abby, Desiree slowly opened the curtain to reveal herself. Huh. We turned to the next bed instead of looking at the badly injured woman and found Desiree smiling at us with only a cement bandage on her left leg. Hey, Abby, I'm fine. She called with a smile on her face. Oh, just a drunk bastard. I almost died if it wasn't for the car behind me. He rammed my car from behind, pushing me out of the way. I breathed a sigh of relief as Abby ran to her mom and hugged her tightly. As I noticed that Desiree had broken her left leg, I glanced down at my sprained left ankle and muttered, this cannot be a coincidence. Who is he? Is he here? My dad inquired about the man who saved her. No, he didn't have any injuries, so he left after giving the police his statement, Desiree explained. I didn't even catch his name. He cursed a lot in Italian, and he wore a blue train conductor uniform. Huh, what did you say? I couldn't believe my ears as I heard it. That, is him, right? I thought secretly. Chapter 148, Chapter 148, Cause and Effects. Edward POV. Abby hugged her mother while sobbing. Haley cried from the side, and Desiree pulled her close to give her a hug too. Their reactions were normal, as during the time we were driving over, the accident was reported exaggeratedly in the news outlets. The drunken truck driver had died on location, and even one passerby was hit by shards of the broken down truck, causing permanent blindness in one eye. The other victim's situation however was still unknown. Thank God. I breathed a sigh of relief as I rubbed my chest to calm down my rapidly beating hearts. Edward, you come here too. Desiree said, with a slight nudging with her head to beckon me to come closer. Huh? I don't need a hug. I said playfully, but I still walked slowly over towards the hospital bed. You don't, but I do. Desiree said as she pulled my arms forcefully into her embrace to give all three of us a hug. It was so scary. My life was flashing right before my eyes. Desiree muttered in a solemn tone as she tightened her arms around us. Did you see a good memory, or a bad one? I asked her in a curious tone as I slowly pulled my body out of her hug. You know what, I don't even remember what it was that I saw before. It's all become blurry now that I tried to recall it back. Desiree replied, her hands were still shivering from her near-death experience. Did your body freeze, you couldn't even understand what was happening until the truck hit, and you have a really really urgent sense to make your life better now? I asked in a casual manner. Why yes. How, do you know it so well? Desiree widened her eyes in disbelief, while Abby and Haley gave me a sideways glance from burying their heads in Desiree's bosom. I would never admit that one of the reasons I pulled myself out of the hug was because I couldn't be in their position. Not ever, and any insinuation on the fact is nothing but slander. Well, let's just say I have a lot of experience with trucks. I shuddered as I thought of the memory of when I was returning home from the grocery store in my scooter before all this even started. Chapter 1. Huh. Haley raised one of her eyebrows, but I just waved one of my hands to dismiss it. You know, there's an amusing theory about the life flashing back before your eyes thing, but I'm not sure if the timing would be appropriate for me to say it. Just spit it out. Abby demanded angrily, her cheeks still pushing hard on her mother's chest, further igniting my jealousy. I'll tell you later, I smirked, causing Abby to pout. She buried her head in her mother's chest again while silently muttering, there is no later, jerk. Ed, I will go handle the paperwork. My dad said as he excused himself from the room, while giving a subtle glance at Desiree. Abby and I caught it, and shuddered. Desiree then flinched in pain as Haley accidentally pressed on her left broken leg. Um, I'm sorry. Haley apologized quickly and pulled herself away a few steps from the patient. Desiree waved it off saying she was fine, but Haley was still apologetic. What did the doctor say? I asked before I grabbed the medical board in front of the bed and checked it out myself. Broken tibia and femur, well, it will take at least two months before you can take out the cast. I licked my lips as I read the doctor's medical assessments. It could take even longer, considering your age. What was that? Desiree's eyes shone a deathly glint. And nothing. I'm just talking to myself. I said in a nervous manner before saying, I'm a go and catch up with dad. My dad was talking to the doctor and helping Desiree handle her release documents. He also tried to find the one who had helped her, but it was as if no one even remembered that guy. General POV. While Edward was visiting Desiree in the hospital, the charity crew members and concerts performers were having an after-party in a club in the city. 
The concert had become the talk of the town, and the number of users who downloaded and created an account in the Instagram app skyrocketed. As the app also provided a web version, the numbers of users had reached a staggering 300,000 users in just an evening. In Ed's previous life, the apps had only reached 1 million users in 2.5 months, but Ed could achieve that in a week, maybe less. It was a brilliant execution. Not only did he manage to gain a lot of traction for the application's launch, but he also posted a few behind-the-scenes photos and videos on his profile page, so the ones who just had to see it needed to download the application. Frankie Dart said as she monitored the app's growth and data. Frankie called Claire through a Bluetooth headset as she worked from her office in the port, while Claire was hurrying to go to her neighbor's house after she went home from the concert. Claire flashed a proud motherly smile and said, Edward is amazing. Frankie, I hate to say this, but I think I need to ask you to handle this one alone for just a few more hours. Huh? Why? Frankie asked, not annoyed by the situation. Desiree got into an accident. She texted me through Haley, asking me to bring some of her clothes so that she could go back home. Oh, what happened to her? Frankie asked, concerned. She broke her leg in a car accident. I'll tell you more when I get more information. Claire replied before entering Desiree's house. She forgot that she didn't ask her for a key, and was surprised when she realized that the door was unlocked. That careless dash she muttered to herself. Frankie nodded and said, All right then. I'll see you on Monday. Although I want to meet you tomorrow dash. I know. You need to tend to your sister. Bring her to Disneyland. That'll be fun. Claire said casually as she rummaged through Desiree's suitcases. In a different neighborhood, the horse-voiced Enid was walking back and forth angrily as she replied to a slanderous tweet. How dare they say that Ed is unprofessional. He sang his songs till the end. Enid growled with the voice of a middle-aged heavy smoker. Stop talking, you're creeping me out. Another horse-voiced girl muttered. Just report him for pedophilia. Tara added. Already did. Enid replied. But there's thousands more of them, saying Ed is hiding money, Ed is godless, and many more. All of these people should just die. They're trolls. Ignore them. A lot more people are supporting Ed right, see, even Tom Hanks is tweeting about it, and also wants to donate to the cause. A lot of celebrities had voiced their support for Edward, and it was as useful as sending thoughts and prayers to natural disaster victims. Only a few of them actually reached out to the charity with the hope to contribute to the cause. Donate, or pledge. Ed told me never to trust those guys until they actually open up their wallets. Otherwise, they will say they donated a certain amount, but they actually crowdfund the money without even putting a dollar of their own. Enid said menacingly. Tara was in disbelief and said, I didn't think that Ed was such a pessimist. He's more of a realist. Enid defended her idol before plopping down on her bed, whimpering about not getting to see him again for a long time. Ugh, idiot. Tara looked at her sister disdainfully before walking out of the room. After the concert, Pepper was bombarded by the paparazzi in front of the school door. Mr. Saltzman, what can you tell us about the whereabouts of Edward Newgate? Where is he? Is he refusing to give interviews? My sources said that Edward rushed to the hospital after the concert was over, is that true? The reporters glanced at Jamie who asked the last question, licking their lips as if they had stumbled into breaking news. All right calm down. Enough the flashes. Pepper said in annoyance as he tried to cover his eyes from the pictures. Bad move from Pepper as it would make him look guilty of something even though he wasn't actually going to be featured in the later articles. Edward is fine. He went to the hospital for an unrelated issue, not because of his health. Pepper explained carefully. What about the money collected? When is he going to allocate it to the charity? A random reporter shouted. The donations had all been transferred to the soup kitchens in the city. You can check their transcripts when you go to cover the story over there, which I don't think you will. You only know how to point your finger at someone trying to do good, as if it was a vile thing to do. Did the politicians pay you? The paparazzi were speechless by Pepper's words, and they glanced at the reporter who asked the initial question, wondering if Pepper's accusation was true, and if it was, why didn't they also get the bribes to attack Edward's credibility? Edward's reputation kept shooting up after the event. He was trending, especially on Twitter. At Robert Downey Jr., hey at Edward Newgate, it was a fun evening, make sure to set aside VIP tickets for me for your next concert. At Cameron underscore Diaz, I tried to buy the ticket, but it was sold out. Cry dot emoji. At Scarjo, if only it wasn't raining. Then we don't have to experience such a rushed exit. But it was fun to see Edward all nervous. At Don underscore Cheadle, make sure to not catch a cold. Plus one. Plus one. Plus one. At Soup Kitchen Pasadenal, thank you at Edward Newgate for caring about the least fortunate. We have received your charitable donations. Thank you very much. At the airport, Taylor was showing a face full of unwillingness as she followed her dad to their private plane. Why are you still pouting? Ed will come to Texas on Monday right? Scott asked in disbelief. I'm not pouting. Taylor replied before stomping her legs as she entered the plane. Can't believe he'd just leave me alone to go with another girl. Just because they had sex once, doesn't mean that they need to do everything together. She muttered in dissatisfaction, not being honest in her words. She had been told about the accident, and she sympathized with Abby. So she'd let her have one last night with Ed before she moved away to New York. Honestly, Ed can make it as a country singer. I must bring him to watch a few shows while he's there. Scott said with a wide smile. No. Taylor dismissed his thoughts instantly. 
I want to be the one to show him around, she said, emphasized on the I. Then you bring him to watch the shows, Scott replied. Maybe bring him to try bull riding. Taylor rolled her eyes and said, Dad, you know our state has passed the saloon era, right? Why are you still obsessed with Wild Wild West? You're embarrassing me. Scott was stunned for a while before he muttered with a sly smirk, daughters always being embarrassed by their father is a rite of passage, and I don't plan on stopping it anytime soon. Ugh. Taylor groaned while crossing her arms together before silently sitting down in her seat as the plane took off. She then licked her lips in a subtle manner, if we finish the entire MV shoot in one day, then we can mess around for two whole days without any interruptions. Hmm, I should contact the director and see if she can change the schedule. I can hear you. Scott interrupted, causing Taylor to flinch, but she soon went back to ignoring his intense gaze. In an apartment in Pasadena. God, I remember when I went to a concert before, and it started to rain. It was actually quite wonderful, but then the bassist got electrocuted, and the lead vocalist wanted to help him, so he got caught in it too. Penny shared as the group watched Edward's performance through Leonard's laptop. Not me, I would never go to a concert out in the open. Howard said. And why is that? Leonard asked, as Rajesh was completely mute when Penny was around. A number of reasons. Bugs. Mud. Adequate lighting. If I want to go to a concert, I would pick somewhere where people can't see each other, just grinding our bodies against each other dash. That's not a concert. That's a rave. Penny scoffed. Leonard gazed at Penny, causing her to be startled and quickly defended herself. What? I know about it, doesn't mean that I've gone to one before. Have you gone to a rave before? Leonard asked. Penny quickly changed the topic, not important. Can you rewind to the country song again? Sitting on his spot on the sofa, Sheldon rolled his eyes as he was eating and watching TV. For God's sake, don't make me listen to that torturous drivel anymore. But Sheldon aren't you from Texas? Shouldn't you like country music? Penny asked curiously. He doesn't like any kind of music. Leonard said with a chuckle. Sheldon gazed at him and said, Leonard, should I remind you that there's a clause in the roommate agreement about blasting music in shared spaces? Ugh. Leonard groaned, but he didn't care about Sheldon's threat. Instead, he enjoyed re-watching the concert song again with his friends. If you don't like it, go to your room. Leonard said casually. Edward POV. It was almost midnight when Desiree could finally be released from the hospital. After sending her and Abby home, my dad and I walked back to my aunt's house. Edward, you should go and rest. Do not try to open your laptop or do any more work today. My dad said. Well, I need to dash. Ed, try to understand my worries. You injured yourself today, and you didn't even follow the doctor's orders. You have worked hard all day, just try to get some rest tonight okay? Hmm, alright then. I will go straight to bed, and you go straight to Desiree's bedroom. My dad coughed twice and said defensively, like I said, we really didn't do anything last night. Hmm, I wish I could believe you. I muttered with some apprehension before smirking and walking up to my room. My dad sighed and exited the house, feeling a strong desire to get a drink today, but still keeping his vow to quit drinking. After taking a shower and eating a PB&J sandwich, I laid down on my giant bed, staring at the white ceiling with wide eyes, not feeling sleepy in the slightest. I crouched a bit to try and reach for my phone, but gave up midway and stared at the ceiling again. Am I addicted to my phone? I don't know. It happened a few more times, but I still kept my willpower strong as I stared at the empty ceiling. Pissed PSSTT. Suddenly, I heard a sound coming from my window. I got out of bed and opened it. Abby, go to sleep. You need to take care of your mom tomorrow. You guys have an early flight. Come on, it's my last night in LA and I don't think that it could be any more graceless than this. She laughed. You have no grace. I corrected her, making her angry. I so do. I can be graceful if I want to. Nah. Yaha. We talked and talked, until it was almost 4 a.m. It was the last late night conversation that we could have for a while, maybe ever and none of us wanted it to end it this early. General POV. 6.30 in the morning. Near the port, inside a rundown bar. A mustached barkeeper was wiping the desk when Ted walked into the tavern. Oh Theodore. Did you decide to start downing whiskey again after waking up this morning? Stop joking Jim. I'm picking up Dwayne here, and also, mind firing up the grill and making me some bacon and eggs. You know we open at 8 Ted. Luckily, I have a soft spot for you, so just wait a seco, and help me throw out that drunkard will ya. Jim laughed as he walked into the kitchen. Ted scanned the room, and then widened his eyes as he saw the lone man pouring whiskey into a cup and gulping it down in one shot. You. Ted walked towards the man quickly. He was wearing a train conductor uniform, and Ted's instinct told him that this man was the one who got involved in the accident yesterday's evening. To Ted's surprise, the man still had clarity in his eyes, as if the 15 bottles of several kinds of alcohol, whiskey, vodka, tequila, and others, was only some mineral water that he had been pouring into his throat all night. Sir, may I ask you a question? Are you the one who saved my friend last night from being killed by a truck? Hmm? Oh, I remember that. Yes. That was me. Jim, put this man's tabs on my account. Ted quickly shouted to the barkeeper. Jim frowned and said, are you sure? It's a couple thousand bucks. It's fine. Ted waved his hands to the barkeeper as he smilingly turned to the man. 
Although Ted had no proof that the man was the one who saved Desiree, and the only evidence he got was the man's confirmation, his instinct told him that the man could be trusted with his words. Oh thanks a lot for that. I'm waiting for my junior colleague, and she didn't show up all night, so I had to keep drinking or the barkeep will throw me out. The man joked before offering his hand for a handshake, Theodore. Theodore Franzity. Theodore Newgate. I'm surprised that we have the same first name. Ted said. Theo smiled and replied, what a coincidence. Ted, Edward's current dad. Theo, the train conductor Grim Reaper. After some initial introductions, Ted asked, Theodore, you're a train conductor. Yes, but I don't think you want to buy my tickets now. You still have a long way to go. Longer now that you've stopped drinking. Theo laughed. Ted was confused for a bit but he attributed Theo's weirdness from his drunkenness and didn't pursue the matter. You know, I used to be in jail. Theo said, surprising Ted, but he didn't show any apprehension to sit together with the man. How long? Ted asked, drinking his cup of joe. Longer than you can imagine. But my son bailed me out. Ha ha ha. Theo guffawed loudly before he went silent and spoke in great self-deprecation. My son, I left him on the doorstep of the orphanage when he was one year old and he still grew up to be an excellent man. Ted went silent and then he asked, what are you doing now? If Theo was in need of a job and shelter, Ted would offer him his help. Like Theo, a lot of the sailors had gone through jail time before, but it doesn't mean that they were bad guys. Ted trusted his instinct with his crew, and his current instinct told him that Theo could be trusted. Me? I can still work on the train tracks, and my boss was eager to give me my job back. Theo replied in a happy manner. So I accepted his offer, and applied for a one day off. Then, I committed a crime again, and now, I'm just waiting for those guys to throw me back behind bars. Crime? What could you possibly have done? Ted asked in confusion. You know, the accident. Theo replied. Ted was shocked and asked, they will put you in jail because you got into a fender bender. How is that possibly a crime? Theo muttered in a tiny whisper, it's because I didn't do my job there. Theo turned to Ted and said, never mind, I'm drunk. Tell me about your son Ted. My son? He's my precious boy. Ted replied proudly before they both laughed out loud. Ted told Theo about Ed starting with him as a baby. He even showed Theo the baby pictures of Ed he still kept inside his wallet. Theo listened to all the stories with a kind smile, his eyes unknowingly shed some tears that went unnoticed by Ted. So, your wife left. Theo asked as he downed a cup of vodka. Just over two years ago, how about yours? Ted asked. Bang, shot in the head by the mafia. Theo said with a laugh, but his eyes turned moist, and shortly after, he broke down crying. Ted went silent and patted Theo in the back as he processed his emotions. How about your son now? What's he currently doing? Ted asked. Oh he's doing very, very well right now. I'm glad that he didn't follow in my footsteps, although there were some dangerous slippery slopes here and there. Theo replied before he reached into his inner pocket and pulled out a box of cigarettes. Want one? He offered. Sure. Ted accepted and they both lit up their cigarettes. As Theo inhaled a puff, he asked, What are you doing here so early in the morning Ted? Oh, I'm buying lottery tickets with my friend. Lotto? Isn't it too late now? If I can reach the next town in, 45 more minutes, then I can make it. Ted replied as he looked into his wristwatch. Theo nodded before he smirked and muttered something Ted couldn't hear. I'm sorry, what's that? Ted asked, confused. Nothing, hey can you do me a favor? Buy these numbers for me, and give them to your son. Of course, your money. Ted laughed and picked up the tissue paper with the numbers that Theo wrote down on. Okay, I'll make sure of it. Oh, my junior is here. Theo suddenly stood up from his seat. Where dash, Mrs. Henderson. Ted was shocked when he saw a familiar face entering the bar. Good morning Mr. Newgate. Drinking this early in the morning is not good for you. Mrs. Henderson said in a gentle manner. He's not drinking, he's not drinking. Theo spoke up to defend Ted. Suddenly, Dwayne also entered the bar, looking for Ted. As Ted greeted Dwayne, he didn't realize that the colleague duo had already disappeared. Hey, it was nice meeting with you. I should get your number. Desiree would love to meet with you to thank you herself. Ted said, but as he turned, he was surprised when he saw that the duo was no longer in his sight. Theo. Ted looked around the bar. Mrs. Henderson. He called, but no one answered him. Boss, we need to go now if we want to make it. Dwayne urged. After a few seconds of silence and searching, Ted said with a heavy sigh, All right. Let's go. Chapter 149. Chapter 149. Goodbye. Edward POV. 7.00 M. Abby and I were still talking to each other through the window. Suddenly, Desiree knocked on Abby's already open door to announce her presence. Abigail? You didn't sleep. Desiree asked while cleaning the area around her eyes. Ah, uh, not yet. I will sleep on the plane. Abby replied, her eyes still bloodshot from the overnight conversation. PFF Abigail. I couldn't hold back my laugh. Turning back to look at me with a red face, Abby shouted, shut up. Desiree walked near Abby before bending forward, hands on the windowsill as she greeted me, good morning Ed. Good morning Desiree. Want me to help you scrub your back? It'll be hard for you to shower with the cast on. Pervert? Mom, ignore him. Abby pushed her mother away as the latter laughed. Abby said, I'll go help my mom. Alright, I'll go to the Dunphys for breakfast. Call me after you guys are ready. 
I muttered, my hand still propping my jaw as I looked out the window. Abby was reluctant to go away, and fidgeted for a few seconds. Then, she stepped back into the window area again and said, you're not going to sleep right. I rolled my eyes at her and said, I told you I'm going to the Dunphy's. Your mom chose to go to the airport with Claire. Remember, A-H-H, right. Sorry, brain fart moment. Abby said in a cute manner before running away with a blushing face. It was normal to get impaired cognitive function after a sleepless night. Yesterday at the hospital, Claire offered to drive Desiree to the airport, as she thought it was more normal for her to do so instead of my dad and Desiree couldn't drive with her cast. It was actually true when you think about it. She was her best friend, and my dad was just a guy she went on one date with. A date in which I still had my suspicions that they did much more than just talk. Also, airport farewell moments would just be too awkward. Imagine when Haley and Tara started to cry, and I just stood there like an emotionless robot. So it's better for me to send her off right here, and let her friends be there to accompany her in the end instead. Hwa hh h h h I yawned, my eyes were moist from the sleepy tears. Hmm, why is he not texting me back? Did he get the ticket or not? I muttered as I checked the text messages I had sent to my dad. I should make a WhatsApp type chat app or I'm sage before I go to Texas. I muttered. It would be easier for me to chat with my friends, and also for us to share pictures from our vacation slash camp slash work. I went to take a quick shower before changing into a simple sweatshirt and sweatpants, paired it with my Nike sneakers, and a black baseball cap. My legs were still hurting, so I walked instead of jogging, like I usually would, towards the Dunphy's house, while avoiding recognition from the passersby. Dollar bills, dollar bills watch it falling for me, I love the way it feels dollar bills, dollar bills keep on falling for me, I love the way it feels I hummed with an excited tone as I checked the subscription numbers climb up on my streaming site entertain. As I live streamed the concert yesterday, I was true to my words and donated every penny that I collected from the people buying the pass to watch the concert live, however, subscription to my website, commenting passes, and group chat passes were counted in a different way. I managed to get $4.5 million from the concert pass alone, and $2.1 million more from everything else, including the commercials played during the live broadcast. Almost half a million people bought the pass. Damn, it was truly shocking. I muttered. Not immediately, but a lot of people bought the pass throughout the show. They could also check the number of donations collected on the screen, and the numbers matched with the amount I had donated to the soup kitchen before, doing wonders for me and the company's credibility. The most surprising one was Pepper's mom. I let out a heavy sigh as I reached the Dunphy's front door. Pepper's mom Eve, did a high class move and gave me some pocket money in the exact numbers of the donations I collected, straight into my tax free trust, and also doubled the amount of funds in the charity, but she donated it under an anonymous alias. Her only request was for me to come and have dinner with her again, which was hard for me to reject considering how deep her pocket was. I'm sorry Nani, but in the ranks of the grandmothers I love, you have been pushed to second place. I mumbled to myself when suddenly a gust of wind pushed an acorn seed to fall right on top of my head. Bonk. Ow, fucking squirrel. I cursed as I saw the innocent animal staring at me from a tree nearby, waiting for me to leave as it wanted to get his treasure back. Squirrel POV. Why is he staring at me? Is this another Doolittle situation? Should I report this back to HQ? It would be bad for my agent's record if he understood my plans of destabilizing the Middle East. Should I nip this threat in the bud? Too bad, he gave me some good vibes. If he was a squirrel, I think we could have been close friends. Edward POV. Why is he staring at me? Oh, I guess it's because of my animal affinity I thought as I threw the acorn back to the tree before ringing the doorbell. I got it. I heard Luke's voice coming to the door, and he opened it without any hesitation. Dude, what if I'm a kidnapper? I narrowed my eyes and used a scolding tone as I entered the house. Do you have any candy? Luke asked casually. Ah uh, no. Then don't worry, I won't go with you. That's not how it works Luke. I widened my eyes in disbelief as Luke walked back towards the kitchen smilingly. I rubbed my forehead in frustration before following Luke, my nose picked up a sweet scent. Pancake? French toast. I muttered as I saw the Dunphy's family working hard in the kitchen. Claire was flipping pancakes, Alex was making French toast, while Haley put some chocolate chips and syrups on the dish before bringing it to Phil who was waiting at the dinner table. Ho ho a king for a day. I greeted Phil. Ed, come eat. Phil invited with a high spirit. Usually people just give a card for Father's Day. Don't let my dad know about this, or he'll have some unrealistic expectations. I said to Claire and Haley. They laughed before Haley grabbed something from the kitchen top. We did buy a card though. I chuckled a bit before Alex walked towards me and shoved a plate of French toast onto my hands. Here. Your eyes are red. You should rest more. I will once I send off Abby and Desiree. I replied. My words were like pouring cold water on the excitement, causing both Claire and Haley to be depressed. Ah, I don't want to say goodbye. It'll ruin my mascara. Haley muttered in a joking manner. I smiled and sat next to Phil as he enjoyed his Father's Day surprise from his family. Hey, Ed, are you okay? Phil asked after seeing that his family was no longer paying attention to us. Huh? Why do you ask? I looked up from devouring my breakfast. You look a little upset. Phil said in concern. I was a bit surprised, but I didn't want to talk about it and changed the topic quickly, I still haven't slept since last night. By the way Phil, did you get interviewed at the end of the concert yesterday? 
Uh, there was an interview. Phil's eyes lit up. Yeah, I think, Kim and Mitch did it. Or so Pepper told me, but I'm not sure which media it was for yet. Oh, lucky them. Phil lowered his head in depression, before his mood lifted again as Claire walked over with a plate of pancakes. She kissed the top of his head and said, Enjoy honey. I'm going over to Desiree's house. I'll be using the minivan to take them to the airport. I'll help you load the suitcases. I wanted to finish my breakfast and leave with Claire, but she stopped me. No need, Ed. You said you haven't slept. It'll be two more hours before they leave. Haley and I will go there first, and we will call you when it's almost time. Try to get some rest before then. Claire said in a soft and gentle manner, which spooked me a bit. Who are you? And what have you done with Claire Dunphy? I widened my eyes and asked in a horrified voice. She rolled her eyes and said angrily, I can be sensitive if I need to. Now come on Haley, let's go. After she left, I asked Phil, any idea what that's all about? Well she seemed to get the idea that the It Will Rain song was created for Abby. Phil explained. Oh, that song wasn't even about me. I said casually. Alex sat next to me after finishing her work and said, Really? Then who was it about? Please don't tell me it's my parents again. I can't even handle the one song, now there's going to be two of them. Alex begged. I laughed and said, No, it's actually about my dad. You know, after my mom left him. He didn't drown himself in morphine though, but I just learned about it at the time, and thought it was edgy. Ah, Phil exclaimed in relief. I can rest easy now, and Claire doesn't have to keep you away from your house until she finds the stash anymore. She's there now, I asked in confusion. Oh no, she said she was going there later. Phil explained subconsciously. I was puzzled by Phil's words, but I decided to just ignore it. I talked to Alex for a while, and then asked Phil, Hey, can't you buy her a smartphone? Huh? For Alex? Phil asked, confused. Even Alex was confused by my sudden request. Well I can buy it for her, but I got a feeling that she won't accept it. Wait Alex, I can use your payment to buy you a new phone. Why do I need a new one? Alex furrowed her eyebrows in confusion. I wanna make a chat app, and it will be able to send pictures, so all of us can update our vacation progress in the group chat? What do you think? Alex's eyes lit up and she said, Dad, let's go buy it. Now, Phil, who was eating his pancake, stopped just before it could reach his mouth. Yes now? Come on. Alex urged. What about my Father's Day celebration? Phil asked, aggrieved. We only planned for the breakfast thing. There's nothing else. Alex walked towards Phil and started to pull his arms to make him stand up. Although it seemed to be overbearing, I saw Phil smiled widely as he could spend time with Alex. In all of his children, his relationship with Alex was quite strained as Alex was generally a serious person. So whenever she acted unreasonably, Phil didn't actually hate it, but he loved it instead as it felt like Alex was a young child again. Ed, what phone? Alex stopped midway and asked with an excited glare. Ask your dad. He's well versed in this stuff. You can trust him. I replied in a casual manner. You saw through me Ed. Phil said, but before he could brag, Alex pulled him away. Ed Ed take care of Luke. Don't worry I'll make sure to keep an eye on him. I replied. Then I looked around, and Luke was nowhere to be found. Ah damn it. I cursed. As the furniture in the house was included when Desiree and Abby moved in, the house didn't change much. I was standing alone in the living room as Phil helped Desiree load her suitcases inside the minivan. Abby walked by, her eyes were still red, and her cheeks were a bit sunken from the prospect of saying goodbye. Her mom followed her closely from behind, and she asked in a careful tone, Are you sure you can handle giving back the key to the landlord? Yeah, no problem. I replied casually. Desiree then smiled and gave me a giant hug, pushing my head into her bosom for the last time. I'll miss you Ed. She muttered. I'll miss my cougar, town head too. I said as I wrapped my arms around her and hugged her closely. She released me and said, Don't worry, I'll keep emailing you about the show every week. Nicey. I replied, excited. I really wanted to watch the show, but as I had a tremendous amount of work to do, I had already missed several episodes. Luckily, Desiree shared every single detail with me, making sure to keep me up to date as if I had actually watched it. She waved me off as she exited the house, leaving me alone with Abby. Don't cry. I will hate it if the last memory I have of you is your crying face. That'd give me nightmares for weeks. I joked. Abby, who was feeling melancholic, punched me in the arm lightly as she got annoyed. You should be grateful that I appear in your dreams, even if it's a nightmare. She said jokingly, no I don't want a goth girl to enter my dream, unless it's a wet dream, pervert. Anyway, don't be so sad, I'll come see you when my tour reaches New York, I said as I grabbed her hand. She stared right into my eyes with a look of determination on her face, no, don't come, she said suddenly, huh, why not? I raised one of my eyebrows, and my tone was annoyed, if you come, then I know for sure that I will desperately want to follow you back. Abby choked and closed her eyes as she started tearing up, I sighed as I held her chin, pulling it upwards so that I could see it clearly. She opened her eyes and stopped crying. She wiped her tears and said, So, don't come. I rubbed my hair in frustration before I looked at her angrily. She smiled wryly and said, Come on, do me this favor. Sure, but, you have to text me at least once a week, even when you're busy. I relented. I will. She stopped crying and then she said, You know, close close your eyes. Hmm, 
I was confused at first, but then, I followed her request. Then, I could feel her presence, especially her face, was so close to mine. Hey Dash. Ed don't open them. Feel it instead. She said before she put her hand on my face. I sensed her warmth, and I could hear her voice more clearly. When my dad left, the figure of him getting out the door kept lingering in my mind. I don't want it to happen to you too. Abby said, I want your last memory of me to be a good one. What do you propose? I asked. She touched my nose as she gazed at my face intently, trying to remember every single detail. You can only open your eyes, when you can no longer, feel me. Ugh, I regret making you watch how I met your mother. I joked, but I didn't open my eyes. Then, I felt a soft sensation on my cheeks, my nose, and my forehead. Don't forget me, okay? Abby said before she kissed me on the lips. Then, she slowly backed away, released her hands that were holding mine, and walked away without saying goodbye. I stood alone inside the house for over half an hour until I could no longer feel her warmth on my lips, and I tried desperately to remember the sensation. Goodbye Abby. I muttered as I opened my eyes, feeling that the world was a little bit colder as I did. Edward's commentary. You know what's worse than seeing a person you like leave? The lingering hope that she would still be around as you couldn't see it. Edward muttered. No closure. Do I want her to stay? Yeah. Will I get over this? No. Does life still go on even if I didn't? Yes. Commentary ends. General POV. At the airport. Abby hugged Haley, and as the latter expected before, she cried sobbingly, ruining her makeup. Take care of yourself Haley. Abby said as she released her friend. You too. Make sure to text me right when you land. And don't shut me out when you get there okay? Haley demanded. Abby chuckled and said, yeah, I will. Hey, take care of Ed okay? Abby requested. I will. Don't worry about it. Haley said with determination. Then I can rest easy and leave it all to you. Goodbye Haley. Goodbye Abby. Haley waved at Abby as the latter pulled her suitcase and walked into the departure lane. Claire and Desiree were also emotional, but they didn't cry like the teenagers. Can you make sure Ed gives the key to the landlord? Desiree asked. Don't worry. A teenager with a key to an empty house is just a recipe for disaster. Claire said as she glanced at Haley. Haley flinched, but she didn't say anything to avoid her mother knowing that she had been sneaking into an empty house her dad listed for sales. You guys don't have to worry about Ed. What's he going to do? Work there. Haley joked, causing both Desiree and Claire to smile. Desiree quickly waved goodbyes to the duo as she followed Abby to enter the departure hall. Let's go. Claire said to Haley. Haley nodded and followed her mother. On the drive home, Haley texted Ed, but the latter wasn't replying. Odd. Oh, maybe he's sleeping. Haley muttered as she knew Ed hadn't slept yet since yesterday. Unbeknownst to her, Edward was currently blaring Steelheart She's Gone song as he laid down flat on his bed in a depressed manner. Chapter 150, Chapter 150, Father's Day. The timer broke or something. SMH. General POV. Camila was almost deaf end by the music blasting from Edward's room as she entered the house. Ed, turn the volume down. She shouted, but there was no answer. She was puzzled, and stumped up the stairs in an angry manner. However, she was a bit startled as she saw Edward slumped on the edge of his bed as she opened the door to his room. She walked slowly and turned down the volume of the speaker, causing Edward to look up and notice her presence. Oh, you're back. How was the race? Have you lost your car yet? Edward asked in a playful manner, however the fatigue in his face was undisguised. CC car? I didn't go to Calexico to ST Street race dash Camila's eyes darted around in a guilty manner, not understanding how on earth did her nephew know about her personal life. Edward scoffed a bit and said, please, I had already known from the first time I got into your car. Did you really think that I am so naive, I wouldn't know what a nitrous tank is. UMM. Camila stammered for a while, but she couldn't find any excuses. She slumped her shoulders and said, yes, I went to watch a race. I didn't participate in it. Please don't tell your dad about this. Why would I? Next time, bring me with you. I wanna watch too. Ed replied, his spirit was lifted a bit from seeing his aunt's anxiousness. Ah really, okay. Eh sure. Camila replied perfunctorily, wanting to move on from the topic. She sat next to Edward, and asked, so, what's got you down? Is it because Abby left? A little bit. Edward replied without changing his facial expression. Ow oh, my poor nephew. Camila wrapped her arms around Edward's head and pulled him for an embrace, pushing his face close to her chest. You smell like motor oil and prostitutes I mean, cheap perfume. Edward commented, causing Camila to raise her eyebrow in annoyance. You want me to let you go, she asked angrily. Edward chuckled a bit and held Camila's arm to make sure she didn't. No, no, I didn't mean that. I need this. Camila's gaze softened, and then she asked, have you had lunch yet? Not yet? Edward replied. As Camila wasn't at home last night, she didn't know that Edward hadn't gotten any sleep yet. Let's go out and eat something special, then we can get the large bowl of ice cream at the dessert place. How about that? Sure. Ima go change first. Want to invite your friends to come with you. Camila offered. I'll see if Enid is free right now. I especially need her energy. Edward replied, as interactions with Enid always boosted his mood upward. Jay's house. Is everyone coming tonight? Jay asked as he sipped a glass of scotch at the bar. Jess, yes. All family members will be here. 
Gloria replied as she put down a bag of groceries on the kitchen top. I bought all the meat you want for the barbecue, and apparently a few other stuff too. Jay said playfully as he saw the Victoria's Secret bag on Gloria's hand. I, you don't like your father's day gift. Gloria said seductively. I was planning on wearing it tonight, but if you don't want it dash. When the hell did I say I didn't want it? You can buy anything you want hun. Jay replied quickly and kissed Gloria on the forehead, causing the latter to giggle. Then, Gloria became hesitant, and asked in a careful manner, did Manny give you a card yet? Jay replied solemnly, no, and honestly, I don't expect it. Ah, uh, also, his dad called him while you were out, he wants to take Manny out to have fun this evening, just the two of them. Javier, did you tell Manny about it? I'm afraid that he won't keep his word again. It's not the first time he has done this. Jay sighed and said, Manny was the one who picked up the phone. Gloria blinked her eyes in helplessness, feeling as if a headache was coming in. Manny suddenly walked into the kitchen from upstairs and asked his mother, Mom, is Edward also coming to the barbecue today? Huh? We, I don't think he knows about it. Why? Gloria asked. Conflicted, Manny spoke, well if he is coming, I don't know if I would want to out with Dad Dash. He'll come. Gloria's eyes lit up and she announced before Manny could even finish his words. Huh? Really? Then, what should I do? Manny asked with furrowed brows as he didn't know whether to choose his estranged dad or Edward. Gloria pushed Manny from behind to move him out of the kitchen. I, don't worry. If your dad comes, he can join us. Easy right. Jay was baffled when he heard it, but Gloria turned to him and mouthed, he won't even come. Don't worry. Edward POV. Unfortunately for me, Enid had to spend time with her dad today, therefore I had to eat the ice cream with just my aunt. What's with the look on your face? Are you not happy spending some time with me? My aunt asked, irritated as she devoured her ice cream sundae angrily. Yes. I replied. You jerk. My aunt cursed with a smile. There were a lot of people in the dessert place, especially teenage couples who got together to plan their future summer plans. It's not you, but, I want to go to Daytona Beach and meet college boys. So, it's better if we break up. A teen girl said to his boyfriend before he cried. It was the perfect combination for me as I could enjoy watching some teen drama as I ate my ice cream. Not to mention that they were all so absorbed in their own dilemmas that they didn't even notice my presence in the shop. Well, now that I think about it, it's really perfect that we both wanted to get dessert at the breakup place huh? She added. Huh? Why? Did you break up with someone? Wait, were you even dating? I asked curiously. Of course I'm dating? I'm still young. She replied angrily. You're almost 30 dash. She threw her cherry stem at me, which I avoided skillfully and said, it's not like I don't want to believe you, but I have never seen strange men traipsing around the house while I stay with you. She rolled her eyes and said, I'm not that kind of woman. You mean, not having sex till marriage kind of woman, or after three dates kind. Um, it feels weird talking to my nephew about these things, also, the second one. Nah, don't worry about it. I was smart enough to know about all of this stuff before anyone even taught me. So, which bastard broke your heart? I asked with a sly smile, causing my aunt to laugh. Well it happened in Cuba. She started sharing her story of how she got her heart broken just before she came back to LA. About how her ex-boyfriend told her he wasn't who she thought he was, and he wanted to end things as he needed to get back to his country. I thought I met the one, but instead, I was just his side piece. She sighed heavily as she wiped her mouth with a napkin. Oh, in his defense, you are a fine piece. Camila was flattered, but then I smiled mischievously and added, of work, ahh. She gasped in offense, before she laughed. Are you dating anyone now? I asked. Nah, I'm still in the moving on phase, she muttered. Wait, how long did you guys date? I asked incredulously. Less than a week dash. No shit, sorry. And you haven't moved on yet? How good is this guy? He must be a beast in bed dash. Before I could finish my thoughts, she cupped her hand on my mouth to stop me. She glared at me and said, we didn't even, sleep together. My jaw dropped in shock before I asked with a stammer, th then, why, I, need to learn the technique what's his name, I need to meet him. Ugh, no, I don't want you to learn from that guy, ever. Then, tell me, why. Well, long story short, we clicked, there were no boring conversations. We argued, like everyone else but it felt, nice. I don't know, it was the first time that happened to me. She became embarrassed as she spoke, and avoided my eyes. And you guys didn't even have sex. That's what you're focusing on. She asked, baffled. But honestly, I couldn't believe my ears. Damn, did he actually tell you you were his side piece? Or was he married? I asked. Camila rolled her eyes and said, no. But it felt that way. He could have ended it because he's afraid of a long distance relationship. But he still lied to me. About what? Camila opened her mouth, but she couldn't answer it as she remembered that she left the table before her ex-boyfriend could even explain it. Um, you don't know. I raised my eyebrow, he could actually have been a member of a secret organization, you know be a fed or something so he couldn't use his real name, or what you think he meant. But, hold on, they would need a reason to get close to you if they wanted to send someone undercover so, do you have any secrets that would gain the interest of such people? Um, I really don't want to talk about this. Camila widened her eyes as I spoke, and her face paled as she realized a few things. I need to call my sister. You mean my mom? I asked with a laugh. 
She nodded warily and asked, You, want to speak to her? Nah, don't worry about me. And for future reference, the answer to that question will always be no dot. I replied casually before I took out my phone to check my messages. I wasn't in the mood to reply to anyone before, so there were a few notifications from my friends and also some from Pepper. My aunt sighed and went outside the restaurant to make the call. I finally saw a few texts from Haley. She was worried about me, and the last text asked me if I wanted to go to Jay's house this evening and join them for a barbecue. Will everyone be there? I asked her, and got the answer in less than 5 seconds as my phone rang when she called me. Hello. I asked warily. You dare to ghost me? She shouted. I laughed a bit and said, sorry, I was out with my aunt. Hmph, are you okay? She asked even though she was mad. I'm better now. I replied with a smile as I was touched. I was whoa what is it mom? She was distracted and didn't continue, and after speaking to Claire for a while, she asked, are you with my dad? Huh? No. Phil hasn't come back from the Apple store yet. I asked in confusion. That's where he went? He only told us he went with Alex to get some fruit. Mom. I laughed as I heard Haley shouting for her mom, and after a while, she said, sorry about that. No no. It's fine. So, what time? Oh, you're coming. Haley said in a baffled tone. I was confused. Yeah, you're the one who invited me. Ah, uh, right. Bring your swim trunks too. Haley said with an excited tone. A pool party? I'm not in the mood to swim dash. Then just eat and tan. We'll meet at four. Can I bring someone else? Depends on who you're bringing. Haley asked in a cold voice. You um okay, chilling. I was talking about my aunt. Can she come too? Said aunt conveniently came back to her seat at that very moment, and tried to ask me what was going on with a few gestures while trying to understand the situation. Oh, I was thinking of going to sleep after this. I haven't gotten any shut eye yet since last night. Oh, shame then. I said to her before I replied to Haley, so I guess I will be going alone. But I need to get back before 7. I have plans with my dad. Ah, uh, the losing the lottery thing. Alright, I don't think it'll take too long. But I'm not quite sure as grandpa is the one grilling. Huh. I was confused at first, then I remembered that Jay overcooked the meat in the series. I rubbed my forehead and said, I see. But don't worry. It's still good. You just need to chew a bit more. She said warily. I laughed out loud, causing Haley and my aunt to be confused. I'll see you there. Oh okay. Haley stammered before we finished the call. Look at you, all smiling and excited about meeting another girl. It took you only one afternoon to move on from Abby Ed? I'm sorry. My head and shoulders dropped as I heard Abby's name, so my aunt apologized and tried to cheer me up again. Ah, uh, wait. I forgot. Where's dad? I muttered as I got into the car with Camila to leave the restaurant. She shrugged her shoulders to indicate that she had no idea, therefore I called him. As he picked up the phone, I could hear some throbbing music in the background and the DJ announced, give a big hand for, Kimberly. Dad, are you at a, strip club? I asked incredulously. I heard his nervous voice coming from the other side of the call, well, yeah, but not because of the reason you're thinking of. I dash. Ugh, can't believe you didn't invite me. I cut him off, causing him to be stunned speechless. What is it? My aunt asked from beside me as she drove the car. Dad is at a strip club. I replied. Ed I'm not dash. You degenerate old man dash my aunt widened her eyes and cursed at the phone, causing my dad to be stunned again. I'm really not? This is the only place that still has lottery tickets left. I went to seven places, and it was all sold out. My dad tried to explain himself, but I ignored him and said, Dad, you shouldn't go to the strip clubs at noon. That's too pathetic. You should wait till the night shift. I'll come with you next time. You're not going to a strip club. My aunt and my dad shouted at the same time. Ugh. Unfair. I pretended like I was pouting, which made my aunt stare at me incredulously. Is Dwayne there? I asked. Why yeah. He's here. Why? Dad asked, full of wariness. Can I talk to him? Not until I know what you're going to talk to him about. Dad said. Ah oh, never mind. I'll just add him to the call. I said as I called Dwayne too. He picked it up instantly. Hello, Dwayne. Since you're there, can you buy my dad a few lap dances on my behalf? I'll reimburse you later. I asked. Edward. My aunt's face turned horrified as she heard me. What? I'm just trying to give him a Father's Day gift. Dad. Dwayne. The stripper. Half an hour later, I was dropped off to Jay's house by an angry aunt. She still hadn't stopped scolding me as she kept trying to drill into my mind that women are not objects, such nonsense, even after I told her I was joking, but that didn't stop her from giving me a lecture. Hey you made it. Haley opened the door in excitement. I haven't even rang the doorbell yet. Were you waiting for me at the front door? I asked teasingly. She blushed a bit and grabbed my hand before pulling me in, Dad has just arrived. Hey Ed. Phil greeted me with excitement before he waved the new iPhone box in the air, we got it. Oh ho, let me see it. I walked towards Phil and Alex as they showed the new phone to Claire. Nice stuff. Yeah, we went to five stores, just to pick the best one. Phil said proudly. Alex scoffed and said, turns out, the best deal was at the first store, so we went around town for nothing. Ah, uh, don't be like that. Didn't you like spending some time with your dad, especially on, Father's Day? I muttered, causing Phil to turn sad, and Alex to be anxious. Oh of course I liked it. Alex replied through gritted teeth as she knew she was played. 
She mouthed to me menacingly, this is not over. Phil, it's the first time Alex is using a smartphone. Why don't you show her the features? I instigated again, causing Alex to be flabbergasted. Phil's eyes lit up as he said, that's a great idea. Damn it. Alex cursed in a whisper. Then, I turned to Claire and said, Luke told me he's going to follow a stranger if he has candy. No I didn't. Luke who was playing with Manny turned ashen, you tattletale. Luke, is that true? Claire asked, horrified. I'm just worried for you Luke. I said with a fake concerned voice. Liar. Luke shouted, but Claire dragged him away to give him a thorough talking to. Why are you making trouble everywhere? The atmosphere was nice before. Haley asked in confusion, but not apprehension. Well I need a good show to watch to uplift my mood, plus this way we do get some alone time. Now, where are Mitch and Cam? She laughed, you're targeting them now, they're by the pool. Let's go. Well I wasn't lying. I used to watch the Modern Family episodes whenever I needed a laugh. Now that it exists in real life here, all I can do is concoct my own episodes and watch them live. Hey hey, there's the rock star. Jay greeted me with a smile as he checked on the meat. Hi Jay, happy grandfather's day. I said playfully, which made him laugh. I've prepared something special for dinner today. A genuine Polish style bratwurst. Nice. I can't wait. I'll eat that even if you overcook it. I muttered. Jay's smile froze and he said, why would you think I am going to overcook it? Um. I stammered, and turned towards Claire who scolding Luke while making sure that Jay saw who I was looking at. Jay's commentary. So, no one is brave enough to tell me they don't like my grilling, and have to make sure a guest takes care of my feelings too. He asked angrily. Commentary ends. I'm going to go and see Lily. I avoided talking much to Jay as I grabbed Haley's hand and brought her to see her gunkles. She almost laughed out loud and blew my schemes, so I need to bring her away quickly. Mitchell and Cam were talking and in a good mood by the poolside. Hey hey, happy Father's Day Mitchell. I said as I hugged Mitchell to celebrate him. Cam's smile froze a bit, but he was still nodding along as he didn't want to blow up there. Mitch and Cam's commentary. Why not, happy Father's Day Mitch, and Cam. Why only Mitch? Does my stay-at-home dad status make him equate me with taking a more feminine role in this relationship? Cam said aggressively. Mitchell rolled his eyes and said, it's because I'm closer to him than you Cam. Commentary paused. I turned to Cam and acted surprised before I said stammeringly, oh why yeah, you too. Happy Father's Day Cam. Commentary restarted. Cam was crying in a dramatic manner as Mitchell patted him on his back, trying to comfort him. He thinks I'm the mother. Cam exploded while sobbing, face full of tears. Commentary ended. I sat with Haley near the poolside, watching Mitch and Cam argue with each other, Alex was caught by Phil and he wouldn't stop teaching her, Luke was scolded by Claire, and a smile rose up in my face. You're Satan. Haley muttered teasingly. I acted shocked and said, how did you know my name mortal? She laughed as we both enjoyed the chaos together. Chapter 151, Chapter 151, Who's Your Daddy? Edward POV. Haley and I were laying down on the pool chair as we enjoyed the sun with a drink in our hand. We were both wearing sunglasses as we watched the drama unfolding in front of us, and to avoid direct sunlight at the same time. They are pretty pissed off. You'll be in trouble when they find out you deliberately stirred them up when they were supposed to be enjoying the barbecue. Haley said. I turned towards her with an astonished face. She was confused and asked, what? Nothing. Aren't you changing? I replied with a smile. I didn't want to tell her that I was surprised she knew what deliberately means, as I was afraid to discourage her. You want to see me in a bikini so soon? Haley teased. I thought you weren't going to swim. I'm not. I replied before I sighed and said, I can't wait to grow up. I miss popping up a can of cold beer as I lay in the sun. Same. Haley muttered in a guilt-free manner. Sometimes, she snuck in a couple of beers while her grandpa wasn't at home as she tanned by the pool, so she knew what I was talking about. Hey, what do you think about Father's Day? Haley asked in a curious manner. I pushed up my sunglasses and turned to her, Father's Day is the stepdad of the whole holiday celebrations. It's the time when single moms posted on FB to try and make this day about them, and for fathers to be overlooked once more after getting a few lousy cards. Most people don't even bother to celebrate the event, so seeing your family get together is refreshing for me. Well, to be honest the gathering is actually for summer, not Father's Day, Haley explained. I smirked and said, I know. She smiled in a guilty manner and said, it's not like we don't like, our dad. I'm not saying it like that. I'm just saying, people don't make much of a deal about this day compared to the other celebrations. Let's take your family for an example. What did you guys do on Mother's Day? Let me see, hum, well we woke her up with a surprise, then allowed her to make a wish, and this year, we almost went to the beach, but Alex brought out the water quality report, so we just stayed home and celebrated. And what did you do with your dad today? I asked. I gave him a card, and made him breakfast, the same thing as we usually ate on weekends. And, well that's it. I smiled while Haley ruminated on what I was talking about. Gloria walked briskly towards the both of us, I, do you know what happened? Why are Kim and Mitch suddenly arguing? And why is Jay so grumpy? Isn't Jay always grumpy? I muttered. Gloria nodded and said, that's true, but there's something weird going around Dash. Hey Gloria, are you making any sauce for the steak? I asked, changing the subject before she could catch on. She smiled and said, yes, 
I'm going to make a traditional Colombian sauce that has been in my family for generations. That sounds interesting. Can I learn it? Gloria smiled widely and said, yes, yes, come to the kitchen. I'll show you the steps. Seriously. Haley lowered her sunglasses as she gazed at me. I shrugged and said, yeah, it sounds fun. Besides, Kem and Mitch have relocated inside. Well, I'll come with you. Haley hesitated before standing up, but I'll go change first. As I entered the house, Phil suddenly surprised me and asked, Ed, you're making another app. Huh? What app? I asked, confused. Alex then reminded, you know, the group chat app. Ah, uh, right. Sorry, impaired cognitive function. Why? Alex asked, confused. She used the information to get out of her dad teaching her about the new phone. Otherwise, the lecture would still be going. Phil was excited as he heard about the group chat app and the prospect of exchanging photos with me over the summer. As an early adopter to any new technologies, Phil couldn't wait to use the new app even though it wasn't even in production yet. Haven't slept yet since yesterday. I replied in a casual manner before I narrowed my eyes at them, didn't I tell you about it this morning? Phil widened his eyes and asked in shock, but you had the concert yesterday right? I don't think you did. Alex replied, unsure. I actually didn't tell them, just Claire could figure out what happened without me saying anything. I chuckled before I talked to Phil about the app again, it's still just an idea right now but I'll work on it after I get back from Texas. Phil, have you made an Instagram account yet? He turned excited and said, I did. I even have 10 followers already. Alex rolled her eyes as even she got way I more followers than that, considering that she posted a few behind the scenes photos and tagged me in her account. That, nice. I muttered, hiding my pity. I couldn't say that I have a quarter million followers now, as it would just sound like a brag. Do you know the real potential of the accounts? I muttered with a sly grin. Alex was confused, but when I asked Haley the same question before, she could come out with a few advantages in just a gif. Potential. Phil tilted his head. To be famous. That too, but the thing I'm talking about is more of a business advantage. Cam, you're being unreasonable. Facial hair doesn't mean that people will see a person as the dad. You don't need to grow a beard, or make me shave mine. Mitchell said exasperatingly as Cam followed him from behind. I looked towards them in amusement as they argued, and Haley came back after quickly changing her clothes. She had tied her hair into a ponytail, bringing attention to the nape of her neck, collarbone, and her large earrings. She changed into a blue bikini, and was wearing a see-through cover dress as she walked indoors. What are you guys talking about? Haley asked, but her attention was fixed on me instead of her own family. Instagram. Ed is going to teach me some stuff. Phil replied in excitement. Haley widened her eyes before she nodded knowingly and said, Oh yeah, the influencer thing. Ugh, influencers. I groaned in disgust as I heard it. She was baffled and said, You're the one who named them, it, that. I know I know. I'm just, quite revolted when I think about what's going to happen in the future. Stupid people being famous everywhere. People completely forgot about human decency as it is. I don't even want to think about what will happen the more they live in an online world. Alex rolled her eyes and said, If you hate it so much, then why did you create the platform? Well mostly for the money, and the immense pleasure of sliding into a girl's DM. I joked, but no one laughed, yet. Haley's eyes became hazy, and then she realized something, can I see your account? Yeah sure. I didn't think much and gave her my phone. Alex smirked evilly and said, Dad, you should learn from Ed. Maybe he can help you in promoting your business. I rolled my eyes at her while Phil was a little troubled by the suggestion cause he couldn't quite understand the benefits of her suggestion therefore he didn't want to waste his time. Well, I'll at least listen to it. Sure. Meet me in the kitchen. I replied before I whispered to Alex, trying to get revenge on me. The Empire Strikes Back. Alex muttered with an evil grin. You've underestimated my power. I exclaimed before I walked towards the kitchen. Stop quoting Star Trek. Haley said to both of us. Wars? Star Wars. Alex replied begrudgingly. Haley followed us from behind while checking my Instagram account. She was startled when she opened my DMS. You got 12,000 message requests. Oh, it's still going up. I muttered non-committedly as I walked right next to Gloria. What sauce are we making today? Are you just going to ignore me? How are you going to handle this? Haley asked in dissatisfaction. I'll help you screen the messages. There's a lot of thirsty bitches here that need to get a reality check. I laughed and said, there's no need. I have employees whose whole job is to handle it. Gasp, they sent you pics too. Those sluts. Haley groaned without registering what I said in her brain. Just make sure not to reply to any of them okay? Or I'll be in trouble. I said before I ignored her. What pics? Alex peeked on the screen, and then let out a disgusted gasp too. Can I see? Phil asked. No. Alex and Haley shouted at the same time. I add, I don't have a couple of ingredients. Gloria said in a depressed manner after she checked her fridge for stuff to make her sauce. Oh dang. That's too bad. Phil muttered sadly, I love your special sauce. Can't you substitute never mind. I tried to suggest, but was met with Gloria's piercing glare instead. You still have the A1 sauce right? Phil asked when I was checking the fridge. You know, you do have the right stuff here to make a chimichurri sauce. I said. Huh? Chimichurri? Phil asked, confused. It's like salsa, I think, but it's pretty nice. 
Good with chips, tacos, bread, and even meat. Gloria's eyes lit up and she said, Yes, that can work too, you know how to make it. I asked her. Her smile froze, and before she could reply, I said, Maybe, I can do it? As a gift, for Jay. Gloria's smile turned soft as she realized I didn't want to make her feel embarrassed, and she patted my head as she said, All right, you make it. I'll help. Right. Can you get me some tinfoil, a lemon, two peppers, whole garlic, and shallot? I asked her politely. Foil is here. Phil replied as he was standing right in front of the foil drawer. As Gloria took out the ingredients from the fridge, I talked to Phil about ways he could boost his brand using social media. I cut off the top of the garlic and made a few cuts in the shallot, but not all the way through. Then I sprayed some olive oil, salt, and pepper as I wrapped them inside a foil. I cut the lemon in half and gave the ingredients to Alex. Can you ask Jay to put this on the grill? I asked. She nodded and went to the backyard while I waited. So, no goofy videos. Phil said, depressed. Definitely. You want to seem professional. You should do the same on your Facebook too. I explained. What about me? How can I, have more followers? Gloria asked after I finished talking with Phil. I looked at her from top to bottom before I said, You just need to post a picture of you. That's it. I you sweet talker. Gloria smiled, flattered. I laughed a bit before I turned to Haley, you still opening up the requests. I counted them, and so far, there's 93 girls who send you, pics from the 100 messages I opened. She said in dissatisfaction before she scolded me, you shouldn't have made this. This makes it easier for sluts to throw themselves at you. I just laughed and ignored her. Well if you recognize a few famous people, don't delete anything. Even if they sent you pics. She asked. Wait, there's someone who did. I asked, astonished. Don't be so excited. I'll tell this to Pepper. Haley scolded in a jealous tone. I'm, not. I was confused by the accusation. Did I seem excited? I asked Gloria. No, you didn't. Gloria replied honestly. Haley groaned and walked away from there, leaving us all behind. Sensing the suitable moment, Phil muttered, Ed, I have been wanting to ask you. How are you feeling? With Abby and Desiree moving away? Are you alright? I don't know what I feel, but I'm alright. I muttered with a wry smile. Oh no, poor baby. Gloria exclaimed sympathetically and gave me a pity hug. Losing a first love, is hard, she added. Love, who said anything about love? I replied quickly with a puzzled tone. Phil gave me an understanding smile as he said, yeah, it might not be love, but you got to admit, she was someone special to you, or else, I don't think you'd have asked her to prom, even going out of your way to make it a special day for her. Gloria smiled teasingly and said, you were in love, you just don't know what it was. Well if that was true, teasing me about it would be quite insensitive right? You already know I'm going to be devastated, not that I'm saying I am dash. Ed, it's okay. First love hurts. I still remember when I had my first love. She was a lovely girl Mitchell Flaherty. We met at band camp, and we were very close. Like you, I don't know what I felt at the time. It wasn't until we went our separate ways that I knew I was in love with her. Phil added, I was, devastated. It haunted me for a while, and I regretted not keeping in touch with her. But that taught me something important. That being, love. She taught me what it felt like. So when the next girl came along, I wasn't confused anymore. Phil patted me on the shoulder, so cheer up Ed. That advice actually makes things worse, but I appreciate the intention, philosophy. I said in a dry manner before going to the grill to pick up the ingredients. Gloria slapped Phil's arm, causing him to exclaim in pain. Ah, what's that for? He asked, aggrieved as he rubbed his sore arm. I Phil, she just left this morning, and you told him that. Of course he's going to feel bad. He hasn't moved on yet, and you already told him to find a new girl. Gloria said angrily. Wait, that's not what I meant. Phil widened his eyes as he realized what he had done. I returned to the kitchen soon, and put all of the ingredients into a large blender. I added paprika powder, cilantro, salt, and red wine vinegar and started blending all of the ingredients together. That looks good. Gloria's eyes lit up as I opened the appliance and poured all of the sauce into a large bowl. Then, I grabbed a spoon and tasted it. Phil and Gloria did the same thing, and they exclaimed in wonder as they swallowed it. It's very delicious. Gloria said excitedly, shaking her entire body as she did. Hmm, it needs more salt, and a little bit more lemon juice. I muttered blandly as I watched Gloria's chest heaving up and down as she celebrated. Really? This is already great enough. Phil muttered with a drool on his mouth, not sure if it was from the sauce or watching Gloria. Trust me? I muttered as I added the missing ingredients. After tasting it for the second time, I was finally satisfied and grabbed a piece of bread before dipping it onto the sauce. Yeah, this is perfect. I muttered with a mouthful before I asked, is the meat ready? It's supposed to be. Let me check. Phil said excitedly as he couldn't wait. Gloria followed me and tasted the sauce with the bread, exclaiming a few times as she loved it. Many, come here. Gloria called. Not only many, but Luke and Claire also followed along as they wanted to taste it. Mitch and Cam had come down, and they helped set up the table for dinner together with Gloria and Claire. Alex, come on. I exclaimed in disbelief as I saw her hanging out around Haley in order to read the messages that I had gotten on my DMS. The meat is served. Phil announced excitedly as he brought the meat to the table. 
As he cut into them, it revealed that the meat was cooked perfectly at medium rare. Jay entered the house proudly, bringing the extra bratwurst with him. Jay, this is really good. I muttered as I chewed a piece of meat. It's not too tough for you. He asked with a smirk, causing Claire and Mitch to freeze for a second. It's not. Those who said you're bad at grilling really don't know their stuff. I flattered him, causing him to get an ego boost. Jay's commentary. I have a reputation to keep. Jay muttered with a solemn expression. The flashback started, and it showed that Jay used a meat thermometer something that he had never used before, just to make sure his meat was cooked perfectly today. He continued with the commentary, of course, I won't ever admit that I used it. Now, let me see if they still critique my grilling now. Commentary ends. General POV. Edward sat next to Haley in the living room, gently grabbed his phone back and put it inside his pocket after finishing his dinner. Ugh, give that back. I was having a lot of fun. Haley demanded with a smile on her face. Nah, what did you even do with those texts? Edward asked in confusion. Well I ignored the slats, but there's a few of them who messaged you to thank you for your music. It was fun reading that. She grinned in a proud manner, which made Edward confused as to which one of them was the artist. Is your dad coming to get you, or will you go home with us? She asked. He's coming. I asked him to pick me up at 6.30. Edward replied before stretching his arms as he suddenly felt incredibly tired after sitting next to Haley. She realized it and pulled his head gently to put it on her shoulder, but as she was tiny, there was a big gap there and it was impossible for Edward to do so. Edward laughed as Haley was embarrassed, and then she cuddled with him instead. I'll just shut my eyes for a moment. Edward muttered, not believing that he would actually fall asleep. But in less than three minutes, he was proven wrong. He <laughs> he. Haley grinned mischievously as she watched Edward's sleeping face. At this moment, a vengeful kid saw what was happening, and moved closer towards where they were sitting. Mimicking helicopter sounds. Raytatata. Private Ryan, stay with me. Luke whispered to Edward's ear before Haley grabbed his face and pushed him away violently. What are you doing? Haley whispered angrily. I'm trying to give him a World War flashback. Luke muttered before he made some war noises again. The bomb is here. Kaboom. Medic. Luke, get out of here. Haley chased him away, but as she couldn't move from the spot, Luke continued with his drama. Manny was nearby, and was pulled by Luke to act together with him. He wrapped his arm around Manny and pretended he was limping. Tell, tell my wife, I love her. Luke, I feel uncomfortable with this. Manny muttered while Luke pretended to be dead. Chapter 152, Chapter 152, Lotto. Edward POV. Why is fortunate son worming in my brain? What happened while I was asleep? Ed, do we have the dips? My dad asked, snapping me out of my daze. I had already returned to my still under construction home after my dad picked me up from Jay's place. He was sitting next to me on the couch as we watched the TV, waiting for the lottery announcement time. I slid over a guacamole dip and asked him, there's no chicken wings this year. Oh, wait, I forgot. They're in the kitchen. Dad stood up and rushed to get it. Come on dad, that's the most important part. And you also promised me that I would get to try beer this year. I shouted teasingly towards him. Wait, did I really? He widened his eyes in shock as he carried a tub of chicken wings to the couch. Yeah, it's true, really. He furrowed his brows, trying to remember the conversation we had in the past year. Why would I lie? Also, is your memory failing you already? That might be normal considering how drunk you were at that time. Ah, uh, dad exclaimed in disappointment not in me, but in himself. He tried to persuade me, you have seen how miserable I was. Are you sure you want a beer? I shrugged and said slightly, well I'm not going to be an alcoholic. I just want to have chicken wings and beer, like people always do in TV shows. Oh, all right then. My dad shook his head slightly, a promise is a promise. But to be clear, I'm only giving you one. Sure. I nodded. Give me the German one. I muttered as I saw him reaching his hand for the light beer. Ah, uh, all right. He hesitated a bit before he relented and gave me a can. I smiled happily as I opened it. Asterisk Kirklak. P.S.S.H.H.H. Asterisk. Um. The foam dash I quickly drank the overflowing water while giving an angry side eye to my dad. Did you shake it? How is it possible? You saw me sliding it to you. He smirked slyly as his scheme succeeded, barely holding back his laugh as he saw my reaction. I rolled my eyes and picked up a chicken wing. The extra spicy sauce. My dad asked. The medium one is fine. I replied. Weak. My dad exclaimed teasingly. My veins throbbed as I got annoyed and I grabbed the extra spicy sauce from his hand and poured it onto my chicken wings. You'll regret it. He warned with slightly raised brows. I don't think that it'll be worse than what Camila cooked before. I said jokingly. Is she still sleeping? My dad asked as he opened up a can of beer for himself. Although he vowed to quit, this seemed like a special bonding moment with his son, therefore he made an exception. Like a log. I replied with a slight nod as I chewed on the chicken wings. As my dad warned, the spiciness did hit strongly, but I could still handle it. Dad, the numbers. I asked him. Here, 20 you, 20 me, 10 in the shared pile, as usual. He said as he split up the lottery tickets according to our yearly traditions. I know it's dumb to ask but what are you going to do with the money if you win the big prize? I asked with a slight chuckle. I will still answer it even if I know we won't win. Like usual. My dad laughed before he said, Well, don't tell me you're going to buy a new boat. 
One day you're going to drown at sea with all your boats. I rolled my eyes as I could guess what he was going to answer. It was the same answer every year, and I was sick of it. Maybe not a simple boat. Maybe a luxury yacht ship. You know, one of the ones with a pool on top of the deck. My dad said in an awe-inspiring voice as he remembered the yacht that he saw in the magazines before. Then, you could take Sal and Desiree and have a threesome cruise all over the world, only to come back with two more people in their bellies. He scoffed and said, I'm not going to invite Sal. So, you are going to invite Desiree. I got to say, Dad, me, living in the same house as my ex-girlfriend, will make you have grandkids sooner than you think. I'm not going to invite her either. He didn't mind the joke and answered me truthfully, slightly shaking his head. So you're not going to invite your best friend? You know, the one that you talked all night with before Dash. Shut up and eat your chicken. He pushed the chicken I was holding into my mouth as he put the tickets on the coffee table. Wait, grand price $166 million? Wasn't it 96 million? My dad was astonished when he saw the number. That was last week. Unclaimed. I replied to him as I checked out the ball reading bimbo on the screen. She kinda looks like Margot Robbie, which didn't surprise me as I know at least four other actresses that had the similar features. Honestly, even if someone wins, they will just get around 120 million, so the number is a scam. Even lower if they decided to bump up the tax bracket. Not to mention the IRS tax, and also the state tax. My dad muttered. 166 mil, will be 126 mil after federal tax of 24%. Since we live in California we are exempt from state tax, as they won't take anything from the lottery winning. 126 is what we would get if we win, but I think we're going to get bumped up in the tax bracket, so it might be 37%, and we will get only 104.8 million. I analyzed it. Still, that's a lot of money. My dad inhaled sharply before he squinted his eyes at the screen. Enough for you to start dating again. The statistics show that even an ugly man with a face that only a mother could love, would be able to find their true love in a hot, 22-year-old blonde woman, with great tits, after winning the lottery. My dad laughed a bit before he narrowed his eyes at me and said, you think I'm one of those. Statistics. Who knows. Just to be clear, I have no problem with you remarrying dad. Even if you still love mom, you already understood long ago that she won't come back. So if you're lonely, just find someone. Hmm, I'll think about it. My dad replied before he smirked, but you are still forgetting the main condition and that is we need to win first. So never. Understood. I laughed as I picked up a tissue box to wipe my hand before putting it on the coffee table again, near the arranged lottery tickets. The first number is, 6. The TV announcer read the number on the drawn out ball. Ugh, 12 cards already useless. I groaned as I waited for the next number. All, 12, in your pile, Ed, are you unlucky? My dad asked. He only got two tickets burned, so he was smirking at my misery. Let's see. I have a strong feeling that I will win something today. I muttered in confidence. The second number is, 12. The TV announced again. Yes. I exclaimed while my dad groaned. He threw away six tickets to the side, maybe I can win the consolation prize. In your dreams old man. The next number is, 22. The TV announced again. Yes? Three numbers? I won, seven dollars. I shouted in excitement as I stood up from the sofa. My dad laughed breathlessly as he said, seven, seven dollars, laugh, and you're celebrating like you won, the grand prize. The Powerball numbers haven't come out yet. I still have the chance to make this $100. But you? All of your tickets are useless. Well I still can get what is 18 times $4. $72. But we won't count the single number one. That's petty. He rolled his eyes as he picked up the cards that he threw away. Well there's still two numbers, and the Powerball. I won't give up yet. That's the spirit. I muttered sarcastically as I finished my can of beer. Give me another one. I asked. No. He answered sternly. I'll give you my $7. I tried to persuade him. Get out of here. He laughed. The fourth number for the lucky winner tonight is, seven. Ah. Oh, I hit four. I exclaimed in shock as I saw it. My dad widened his eyes and stood up immediately. Seriously? If you got the Powerball, do you know what it means? My dad gulped his saliva as he looked at me incredulously. Four numbers is one hundred dollars. Four numbers plus the Powerball, it's fifty thousand dollars. I muttered, causing my dad to swallow his saliva. But me being me I decided to poke some fun at him as I added with a small smirk, my angry bird game income for a day. He slumped immediately and said, that ruins it. I laughed at his reaction, but my hand was shivering at that time. It was a wonderful feeling when I saw my numbers on the screen. I was never a lucky person before, so this feeling was completely novel for me. The final fifth number, 32, Aove. I groaned as I missed the last number. There's still the power ball. My dad comforted me. I know. What about the shared pile? I asked. Well, none of them make it. Only one ticket got two numbers hit. My dad muttered in disappointment. We already knew this would happen. Why are we still disappointed? I asked as I sat back on the couch. The Powerball number is, 11 the announcer said, but as expected, none of the tickets got the last number. At the very least we got our money back. My dad muttered. I won the money. You won nothing. I teased him. Uh, next year, next year for sure. My dad vowed. I laughed as I waved the winning card at him. 
Even when he could buy the numbers every week to try the lottery, he only picked to do it on Father's Day, and I admired him for that. Ed, you're staying here tonight. He asked. I want to use the hot tub, but you unplugged it after the Sal incident. So I'll go pack my stuff and sleep at Camila's tonight. Sure. By the way when you visit Texas do buy me a cowboy hat will ya? He slumped on the couch while I checked the tickets. I will. Wait. Dad, why did you only buy 49 tickets? I asked him quizzically. 49? I'm sure that I bought 50. He straightened his back and helped me to double check the tickets. Is it in your pocket? He patted his chest pocket and his pants pockets, and said, No I had taken them all out before. It must be here somewhere. He rummaged around the table, but the last ticket was still missing. I'll try to find it. In the meantime, you should go pack your clothes. All right. Try to check your undies too. They're not going to be in my undies. My dad snorted as he chased me away. I laughed and went to my room, and the minute I jumped on the bed to rest for a bit, my consciousness faded and I fell asleep. General POV. Where is it? Ted muttered as he checked his car for the whereabouts of the last ticket. I got a feeling that it was an important ticket, but I can't remember why. Did I meet someone this morning? Why am I forgetting stuff? My memory is usually good. He muttered in concern. Hey Ted, did you win? Ted turned to the sound of the voice, and saw Phil Dunphy waving at him as he walked in his direction. You just got home. Ted asked with a smile. Yeah, after Edward was gone, it was pretty boring. Phil joked. I didn't win, but Ed won. Ted replied with a toothy grin. Really? Phil's eyes lit up. He won the jackpot. He won 100 bucks. Ted said before he laughed. Phil was taken aback at first, and then laughed after congratulating Ed. Where is he? Phil asked. He's, asleep. By the way, have you seen a white piece of lottery ticket somewhere? Huh? Did you lose your ticket? Only one. I'll help you find it. Edward POV. There was some burning sensation in my eyes, which made me uncomfortable. Ugh. I groaned as I flipped over and buried my head in the pillow to avoid the sunlight. What time is it? I muttered in agony as I checked my phone. I widened my eyes as I saw it was already 9.30 m, which meant that I had slept for over 11 hours. Holy shit. I cursed as I shot up of bed. My flight is at 11. Damn it. Edward, are you up? My dad shouted from downstairs as he heard the sound of a violent opening of the door. I rushed to the bathroom while yelling at him, why didn't you wake me up? Why should I do that? My dad asked in confusion. Because? Wait, it's my plane. Ah, sorry dad. I apologized to him, which made him smirk in understanding. I eased up and went to the bathroom to get ready, and returned to my room to pack up my clothes. After 45 minutes, I went downstairs dressed in comfortable clothes while carrying a big suitcase. Pepper is on his way. My dad muttered as he sipped his morning coffee. I went to the coffee maker and poured one cup for myself while my dad smirked and said, it's been a while since you slept in. Ugh, I don't want to make this a habit. The longer I sleep, the more money I lose. My dad was puzzled, and then he said, well, speaking of money, I still haven't found the last lottery ticket. Ignore it. It's not like we were going to win. I waved it off before saying, I will be staying in Texas for three to four days. You know that right? I know. And if I want to join you, I can just use your plane, right? My dad said in understanding. Also, there's a stripper pole on the plane. So you can invite some girls. What dash my dad's face froze, and his coffee spilled onto his lap. I'm just joking. I haven't seen the plane yet. I laughed as my dad wiped his pants with a clean towel. You weasel. My dad muttered spitefully. But I am hoping that it will. I want it to be like Iron Man's plane. I muttered in a serious manner, which made my dad taken aback. Ding dong. There's Pepper. My eyes lit up and I went to open the door hurriedly. Pepper gave me and my dad a bear hug as he entered the house, and a bodyguard helped to carry my suitcase. Ed, there's something you need to know. This morning. Fanjoy, Love Story MV Director, called. Oh, what did she say? She asked if you have any allergies concerning horses, and whether or not you can ride one. My dad interjected, oh that won't be a problem. His grandparents have a ranch, so he already knows his way around a saddle. Oh that's wonderful. Pepper exclaimed in relief and said, we should go now, otherwise you'll be late. I think I'm already late. Taylor has started shooting right. I asked knowingly. She had started to shoot her solo parts, which meant that I only had the garden scene, and the castle scene left. There was also a college scene, which we will shoot during tomorrow's busy schedule. We were supposed to shoot one scene per day, but apparently Trey was on a tough schedule, and we had to finish the shooting as soon as we could. She has, and she keeps blowing up my phone, asking if your flight had already left, even though she was the one who told you to be there at 3, maybe she wants me to watch her performance. I muttered, and I was dead wrong on that. She actually didn't want me to watch her solo act where she lip syncs to the song as she was too embarrassed. She might. We'll know for sure when we get there. Don't forget my hat. My dad interjected again while giving me a bear hug. Take care of yourself. Don't play around, too much. He muttered. He already knew it was useless to ask me to behave myself, therefore he was hoping that I could at least contain it. I rolled my eyes at him and said, I know I know. All right, you smell like coffee, and whose fault is that? He gave me a stink eye. Yours. I replied, leaving him stunned. General POV. Whistle, nice ride. Edward exclaimed as he saw the private jet Pepper's mother gave him. 
God Grandmother really understands me. The white jet was among the top models currently in use around the world, it was simple, but luxurious with a sleek design that captured Edward's interest immediately. Pepper was startled, since when is she your god grandmother? Since she gave me almost five million dollars for pocket money just yesterday, Edward muttered teasingly as he walked into the plane. To his surprise, there was a lounge area at the center of the plane which separated the seats and the pantry. The lounge had long couches on both of its sides, and a small, circular platform in the middle. Edward was excited and went to examine the plane in all its entirety. What button is this? Edward muttered as he pressed the small red button on the stage. Suddenly the plane's interior lights dimmed and multicolor lights started flashing all around. Intense music was playing, and a pole suddenly emerged from the stage, connecting to the top of the plane. A-H-H. Nice. Edward muttered as a sexy flight attendant took the pole and started dancing while slowly taking off her shirt. It was a present that his newly found godgrandmother gave him as he was being so easy on the ice. All right. Stop. Stop. Pepper shouted, but the performance continued. Partway through the show as the plane was high up in the air, Edward suddenly received a call. Wait. Should I put my phone on flight mode? Edward asked worriedly. This is not a cheap plane. You can answer it. Pepper replied. Hello. Edward nodded and answered the phone. Edward, I found the ticket. It was under the tissue box. I think it got at least three numbers correct. Do you remember the winning numbers from last night? Of course I do. Let me see. 6, 12, 22, 7, 32, and the Powerball is 11. Edward muttered. Ted was silent for a while, and he asked. Can you repeat that? Sure. 6, 12, 22, 7, 32, and 11. Edward repeated kindly. Hello, Dad. He asked in concern as Ted went silent for too long. Ed, it hit. Ted said in a shaky voice. Hello, what hit? Edward asked, confused. The numbers, it all fits. Ted pinched his cheek, not sure whether what he was seeing was real, or a dream. Edward became solemn, and he asked carefully, you mean, we won, we freaking won. Holy shit. Chapter 153, Chapter 153, Texas. WN is extra buggy today and yesterday. The summer vacation arcs will be hastened, and I won't get into much details like in the previous one as to catch back up with the modern family episodes. Even TBBT doesn't have episodes in the summer, so it's a blank time frame there. Edward POV. Inside the jet. Take the money, and leave my son alone. I muttered, channeling my inner evil Korean mother-in-law as I slid a thick envelope towards Pepper. Wearing a blonde wig, the ugly-looking Pepper said meekly while fidgeting, but mother-in-law dash. You dare call me your mother-in-law? I don't agree to you marrying my precious son behind my back? You scourge. I grabbed the glass full of water and splashed it on Pepper's face. He flinched and closed his eyes, before he opened it back with bewilderment. Both of us were silent for a while, before Pepper laughed and said, That was pretty good. Now it's my turn. I'm going to be a rich CEO. You're my assistant. All right. I muttered as I picked up a glass and stood beside Pepper. He took off his wig and crossed his legs, tell that woman to come meet me. Sir, it's not a good way to win a woman's heart by forcing her. Forcing her? I'm buying her? Everyone has a price. Like you. Pepper glanced at me before laughing evilly. So find out what her price is, and I'll have her. I exclaimed, whoa while rubbing my arms, I got goosebumps. Can you guys please stop playing? We're almost there. Ronaldo said in exasperation. Hey, it's either this or a pole dance show again. Which one do you want me to do? I asked him jokingly. After I received the call from my dad about us winning the lottery, I was frozen for almost 10 minutes, and missed out on the ending of the sexy dance. I became absorbed and tilted my head back condescendingly like Boa Hancock and accused everyone around me of being poor until Pepper showed his family inheritance value to me, causing me to snap back to reality. Ronaldo was taken aback, this one. This one is much better. Next time, I'm going to join you. After all, you're the one who poisoned us by forcing us to watch Korean soap dramas. Boys over flowers is good right? I laughed as the duo nodded in excitement. Of course, they were reluctant to watch an Asian drama at first, especially when there was no broadcast on the TV channel, or was there a convenient platform for them to use. So I created an algorithm to take the already subbed videos on the internet, remove the ads, increase the quality, and make it so that they could watch the show using an app when called Entertain. It was a test app like Netflix, that I planned to release after settling the distribution rights with the foreign company later. You're still going to buy 49% of Netflix? Ronaldo asked. I want to buy the entire company. I laughed maniacally as Pepper threw some dollars to rain over me. I calmed down and turned to Ronaldo, but I know it's impossible, so buy as much as we can. We're not lacking money right now. Pepper was a bit worried, it's only 120 million. And you have to split it with your dad. Oh no, I'm buying the stocks under my dad's name. It's his share after all. I'm just his financial planner. I have other plans for my half. Although winning the lottery could create some rift among family members, especially when only my dad's name was on the ticket, my dad didn't care much about the money. Well, it's hard for him to care when I created almost 30 million on my own in only 3 months, and our family wealth kept increasing as I kept reinvesting the profits. Even if he wanted to swallow the lottery prize by himself, I wouldn't care much as by my calculations, I would be able to create the same amount before the end of the year. Pepper's eyes lit up, really? Now, 
Yup, in a week, but, we need to record the six songs and finalize the collaboration contract first before I could pull her over to us. We landed in Texas smoothly. Oh, are you sure we are in Texas? Cause I can't see any cowboy hats or tumbleweeds rolling around. I asked jokingly. Pepper laughed while Ronaldo rolled his eyes. The SUV is out front. You'll need to change inside the car. Are you, okay with that? He hesitated. I don't have a problem with that. Just don't take any pictures of me in my bare skin. If you do, I will charge you 10.000 bucks each. I nodded as I listened to the staff members. The makeup artist breathed in relief as they saw that I wasn't nitpicky, narcissistic or uncontrollable, but only a little bit juvenile, which made me labeled as great in their book. Ronaldo nodded and said, don't worry, managing your privacy is in my job description. Also, I'm quite hungry. I muttered as I patted my stomach. Yeah, it's lunchtime. We'll grab a bite while we are on the road. Pepper decided. The staff members nodded, and we rushed to the film set in a three SUV convoy soon after. I wanted to try some signature foods while in Texas, but all we could do was to stop by the hometown buffet to get some takeout. How far are we from 5501 Morella Avenue in Valley Village? I asked the navigator. Around 20 minutes. Why? She replied. I want to go there, of course, not now, but if we have time. I replied. Pepper was confused. Why? What's there? Oh, it's the house of the mother of my acquaintance. I need to have a good relationship with her to get some blackmail material. I mean, I want to visit her. Pepper tilted his head in confusion, who's your acquaintance? An annoying ass. I mean theoretical physicist. I replied dismissively. Tap 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 tap. I was holding the reins while sitting on top of the horse as I directed it to walk around the garden in a calm and composed manner. Now, I had returned to my mature prince appearance and outfit, same as the previous shooting, to continue the filming today. Good job Ed. But can we do another take, from another angle? Trey shouted through a plastic megaphone. Sure. But Jimmy deserves his carrot first. I said as I patted the horse leg. Huh, alright, sure. Trey was confused at first, but she just followed along as she thought the action was among my whim. It wasn't that hard to do, so she just wanted to move it along. There Jimmy. Are you happy now? I talked with the horse. He snorted and looked at me dirtily before munching on the carrot that the staff member gave him. It seems that my animal affinity not only made animals feel innate liking to me, but I could also have a surface understanding of what the animals wants or needs. It surprised me at first, and I found out that the bigger the animal was, the better the communication with me and them. Great job Ed. Now, another shot with Taylor sitting together, princess style. Trey directed. Taylor, stop showing that nympho expression, you're supposed to be a pure and innocent princess. Trey shouted in annoyance at Taylor who had glitter in her eyes. UMM. Taylor looked around her, and realized that everyone had noticed her expression. She blushed and ran towards me, hitting my leg as she unfairly released her embarrassment at me. Giddy up. I grabbed her by the waist and pulled her into my laps, causing the crowd to murmur in shock. Ed, use a stare. I can't afford the medical bills if you guys get hurt. Pepper shouted in worry. A-H-H. Sorry. I shouted back at him with an innocent smile, which made him shake his head. And you my princess. I don't think me riding in on a horse was in the original script right. I asked Taylor as I slowly directed the horse to move. She grinned and said, I made the agency double the budget for the MV so she can insert a few more scenes. Even a bed scene. I joked. You want to put that in. I'm not prepared for that yet. Taylor replied with a joking expression. The shooting went well, and we managed to finish all of the scenes before nighttime. Wait, 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 wait. You already finished all your parts for the duet? I thought we were going to work on it together. Taylor said angrily after we finalized the shooting. Trey and Pepper heard the argument and decided not to interfere as it was the matter of the young people. We can still do that. If we can make better songs, we can just replace them. The reason I wanted to record it first is, I explained to her about my plans, and her eyes lit up after she understood it. Although, it will be a long and difficult journey for you to get back the rights to your previous songs and albums. Luckily the Fearless album hasn't gone into production yet, so Harvey is confident that she can bring it to our agency. So you can make money from it instead of my current one. Taylor raised one of her eyebrows, but I flicked her forehead and said, I won't take your money. You know you're special, so why are you still trying to make us fight? She smiled and said, isn't that what people who didn't see each other for a long time do? We fight because we miss each other. Which TV show did you get that from? Selena's show. Ah, you got it from Wizards. Got it. She cupped her mouth as she tried to laugh modestly, but guffawed anyway. So, are we doing it in these costumes tonight? Or should I give this back to the manager? She asked flirtatiously. Well, I looked at her up and down. Keep it. Definitely keep it. She chuckled with a blush on her face, but suddenly, her dad appeared from behind. Taylor and I were startled at first, but her dad's next sentence made our brain freeze. It's your first time in Texas, right? It would be impolite if I didn't offer you my room for the night. You can stay at my house with your manager. I have already talked to him, and he agreed. Scoot said decisively. No, we dash, UMM. Taylor stammered as we had already made plans to spend the night together, but all of it turned to dust after her dad's intervention. I could clearly sense that Scoot had an ulterior motive hidden in his invitation. 
It could be to prevent Taylor and I from staying in a hotel room together, or to make sure that we would connect with each other emotionally first before doing anything else, however late that may be. I was not surprised though, her house was gigantic. Damn. I murmured as I entered the house. Taylor giggled and said, I don't know if mom made dinner today. I'll go check. Wait. Let me come with you. I grabbed her hand and followed her to the kitchen as I wanted to see how luxurious it was. The house was several times bigger than Jay's six-room and six-bathroom house, which was downplayed in size in the TV series. There wasn't any food, so I offered to make some simple snacks for all of us with Taylor enthusiastically offering to help me in the kitchen. I made a twice-baked potato, and while I was putting the potato in the oven for the first baking, she muttered coquettishly, now we wait for it to soften, weird, cause I have no problem with the opposite. I raised my brows at her and said in a faux-admonishing manner, really? Innuendo? While your father is in the living room. Well we have no other place. In fact, we should squeeze in a quick one here, cause I don't think he'll let me be around your room tonight. She muttered, depressed. I chuckled a bit and patted her head, wow, you're shorter than me now. She snorted and said, short? Hard to imagine someone actually calling me that. Maybe Yao Ming, a basketball player from China, could do it. Huh. She was confused, but I just shrugged the matter away. Now take out my meat, her meat, from the package, literally out of the package, and we're going to smash next, the potato. And that's how you do innuendo. You need to win at everything don't you? She said in fake dissatisfaction as she grabbed the meat and angrily ripped the wrapper around it. Oh, the plastic broke. She muttered honestly, but then she saw me smirking and giggling as I melted the butter with cream, ahh, I win. She exclaimed and laughed out loud. Trying to control my laugh, I said, damn it, I want to do something about the cream, but you totally take away my ideas. It was true. An innocent attack has a higher damage value for me rather than a planned one. It only took a short time for me to finish cooking. Like Taylor expected, her dad was patrolling the hallway at night, so we couldn't get a chance to stay in together. So I just slept and woke up at 4am to try my luck, but Taylor had truly fallen asleep by that time, so I didn't want to bother her. Instead, I opened my laptop to develop the group chat apps. Three days passed by very quickly as Taylor and I enjoyed each other's company. Whether it was shooting the MV, or recording the duets. Our relationship progressed further, but for some reason, we still haven't decided as to whether we wanted to be an official couple yet, mainly because of her hesitation about her career as well as my own insecurities. Also added a bit more context and reasons for them not going all the way. Scoot arranged for me to experience living in olden age Texas by bringing me to an old-timey saloon while riding a horse. I of course recorded the entire thing on video and posted it on my Instagram spread amongst several posts and stories. It got half a million likes on average, and went viral on all social media platforms. I also posted some videos I recorded during the Love Story MV shooting, which created an explosive reaction from the fans' hippers. But, I hid the fact that Taylor and I had finished recording our duets as we didn't want to alert her entertainment agency. So, Taylor and I will leave first. You guys will wait for the next flight. Do you have any objections to that? I asked the staff members and Pepper in a polite manner. None. Enjoy yourselves. Pepper was being considerate as he knew what Taylor and I had in mind. I smiled as I waved at the staff before entering the private jet. I tried to make them leave first and we took the next flight, but Pepper insisted as he didn't want me to stay behind without an adequate security detail. Hmm, so, is this your first time? Taylor asked coquettishly as she fired up the pole dancing stage. Second if we count the I mean, first. I quickly changed my words as she glared at me. I enjoyed her performance as we were alone and managed to get some fun activity in on the private plane. As we landed in LA, our whereabouts were leaked by a certain interested party, causing a mayhem of paparazzi photography after we got out of the airport. It turned into a major news event, with people pointing fingers at us with every possible accusation they could make. Such as, carbon footprint, being a bad example as a public figure, moral degeneration, and many more. It was quickly shut down by the fans as they saw my videos and stories on my Instagram. A small counterattack was made by the fans, which thoroughly discredited the tabloid sites that tried to ruin my reputation. Why is this happening? Taylor asked with annoyance as we got back in the SUV. Oh, simple. They're testing my Instagram app's influence, and using me as the main lab rat. I guess a few parties are already showing interest in it. I replied in a casual manner before smirking evilly. Too bad for them, I'm not going to let them have a piece of the cake that easily. Oh, a quick side note, before I left the state, I made sure to finish my side quest and went to visit Sheldon's mother, Mary Cooper. Then, I emailed the pictures from my visit to Sheldon, Leonard, and also Penny, causing an uproar in the 2311 North Los Robles Avenue. General POV. Ah. Sheldon screamed in shock after he opened up the email from Edward. What happened? Leonard rushed from the kitchen to get to Sheldon, did you watch a jump scare video again? I told you not to watch anything with the tagline, can you believe this, and check the comments first. Anxious, Sheldon turned to Leonard with a pitiful face and heavy breathing, it's not that. I, was violated. What? Penny, who was sitting on the couch, scrunched her face in confusion and walked towards Sheldon. She then cupped her mouth as she stifled her laugh as she saw the pictures on the screen. It was a naked Sheldon in his baby years, and Sheldon tried hard to prevent Penny and Leonard from seeing it. 
How did he know where my mother lives? Did you tell him Leonard? Sheldon asked anxiously. How is that possible? I don't even know where your mother lives. Leonard lied. He was the one who told Edward the exact address. Ah. Sheldon yelled a second time as Leonard scrolled down the email. What what? Penny wanted to understand his reaction now. It was a picture of Edward with a notebook, which made Sheldon's face turn pale. Wait. Is that Merton's conjecture? Did you try to prove that M, N, is always bounded by the square root of N? That's an amateur mistake. Leonard said haughtily. As Sheldon was always commenting on his work before, he wanted to enact his revenge for the longest time, but couldn't as his roommate was smarter than him. I was young, and naive. Oh how I wish I could rectify my mistakes. Sheldon sighed. Wait, how young? Penny asked. I tried that when I was five years old. Sheldon answered, which made Penny's face turn sour. He graded my papers Leonard? Make him stop. Sheldon begged as he saw that Edward took out a red marker and made an F- mark on his theorem. Well it is a fair mark. Leonard backed Edward up. The theory was disproved in 1995. You should have known better. Sheldon breathed heavily and almost had a panic attack that night. It was then he decided to put Edward's name inside his mortal enemies list at number 64, directly beneath Penny who was numbered 63. Edward POV. He vowed to get revenge? Let him try. I muttered as I received an email from Leonard. Can you not check your messages during your therapy session? Dr. Linda muttered in exasperation as I was being elusive again. Ah, sorry. Where were we? I placed my phone in my pocket as I tried to act like I cared. Oh wait, time's up? No, don't pretend like you just realized the time. I know you've been counting the minutes, so don't worry about the time. Your dad decided to add on an extra two hours for the session today, so you don't have to worry about not getting enough time, Linda said with a smirk. I froze, and then scratched my forehead in frustration as I faced the doctor. I looked at her unkindly, what do you want to know? I decided to just throw her a bone so that we could end the session sooner. I was incredibly busy after all as I wanted to finish up on my album preparation. Let's begin with, your mother, she muttered. Well, your mama is so dash. And I'm not talking about the yo mama joke this time, so you can avoid the detour. Dr. Linda interjected quickly before I could call her mother fat a second time, or insinuate that she was so slutty that she would charge $1 for a session and have 100 bucks by the end of the night. Chapter 154, Chapter 154, Album List. Edward POV. Entertain company building, inside the meeting room, an unexpected confrontation occurs. Like I said, push the ukulele song to the next album. It doesn't suit this one. Paul Schaefer, a Canadian comedian slash singer slash other slammed his palm on the mahogany desk, only to pull it back quickly and squirm in pain as the hardness of the desk shocked him. I think you should keep it in. Just a few weeks ago, the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow by Israel, comma, Lionel Richie, an American singer, songwriter, record producer, etc., struggled at his sentence. Israel Kamekai Wool. I helped him. He turned to me and nodded slightly, yeah, him. Although the song isn't widespread yet, I think it's only a matter of time. Edward's song Toxic has the same potential. Both of them were invited by Pepper to the studio to help me in my album preparation, and surprisingly, Pepper had a close enough connection with Paul that he was here barely an hour after he called him. Dr. Dre was also forced by Eminem to take a look at the song's selection in their own studio so we were having the discussion as a pretty diverse group. But you have to remember, Edward's song isn't part of his single. Toxic will only be released with the album. Paul Schaefer debated. Besides Ed, I really think you should consider my suggestion. Putting some mediocre songs in the album cause I have too many great songs. I chuckled at him, I won't do that. That's a shame. If you do that and spread your hits around you won't need to stress about your career for at least five years. I won't deny that the album will explode. But the pressure will pile up on you as soon as the next album is in production. It might even be enough to stop you from writing songs entirely. Paul's concern is valid. Lionel suddenly supported Paul, causing him to brighten up. I've seen many young people burn out from the expectations placed upon them. Don't get me wrong, I am excited about the album. But I want to see you grow even more. Pepper was so touched by Lionel Richie's words that he took out a white handkerchief to wipe his tears. I rolled my eyes at him before turning to Paul and Lionel, don't worry, I still have lots of, ideas. Let's refer to the list and continue listening to the songs. So far, we only confirmed six songs for the album, and all of them were from my previous singles. I muttered in exhaustion. Today was the day for me to finalize the song list for my album, Breaking. My debut album, Paul and Lionel, insisted that it only consist of 18 tracks. But for someone who was referred to as a song vending machine, it took a lot of effort for us to finally confirm what we should put in and what should be kept for a second release. Honestly, I agreed that a few of the songs shouldn't be included in the first album as they didn't quite hit the theme, but now that I think about it, my album has no theme except for breaking the expectations. So whatever I put in, people would just think that it was a part of my artistic view. They would support me even when I wanted to put What Does the Fox Say, or Gangnam Style or another such nonsense song in the list. So far, my whole repertoire looked like this. Whatever it takes. Believer, me and my broken heart, enemy, seven years, amnesia, photograph, count on me, just the way you are, toxic, the lazy song, before you go, rhythms of love, 
We are young. Can I be him? Grenade. Shivers. Something just like this. Cool kids. Celestial. Viva la vida. Check yes Juliet. Your man. Country. It will rain. Two is better than one. Feet Taylor. Natural. Tenerife C. One call away. Treat you better. Peter Pan was right. Dart and Beso. Spanish. Piano compositions. Kiss the rain. Rivers flow in you. I raised my eyebrow as I saw the two extra songs on the bottom of the list. Pepper saw my look and explained, well Claire told me about it. And I figured, why not? It could even be a bonus track in the album. Besides you did leave the original sheet out on your piano, if you wanted that to remain a secret you should have been more careful. Paul Schaefer highlighted a few songs with a neon marker, first, the duet with Taylor is a must. I don't think anyone disagrees with this. All of us shook our heads. Paul nodded in satisfaction and continued, thus, can I be him, Tenerife C, and check yes Juliet should obviously be included too. I didn't think you were a shipper too. I teased Paul. He smiled and teased, no I know a fake public relationship when I see one, although, I haven't seen you with Taylor in private yet, so my opinion could still change. Well you should keep the same opinion for now. I joked, but Paul caught the hidden meaning behind it and turned disappointed instantly. You have a studio contract with It Will Rain and Enemy, so both of those should be included in order to boost visualization once the movies come out. Lionel suggested. If I'm not mistaken, Celestial and Tenerife C are in your streaming sites right? So you don't have to put it in. Hey. Paul retorted, but Lionel was right. Maybe people would want to hear the studio version instead of the live version, so we can put it aside first, and then come back to them later. Pepper suggested. So we have five. Amnesia and seven years are to be included no matter what. I muttered decisively. Pepper grinned as he knew the importance of my first performance, and teased, sure enough. A sentimental kid. I agree to it too. Paul said while Lionel nodded along with him. Me and my broken heart, grenade, and can I be him are part of my first single. Natural, whatever it takes, and enemy are the second one. So we have six confirmed songs there. Lionel mumbled, minus the superimposed, five plus two, add six, minus one. So, ten. Nah, it's basically four, cause the other six have been released as singles. Paul joked. After a thorough discussion, the final songs list to be included into the album is Breaking's 18 songs list. Two is better than one. Can I be him? Grenade. Me and my broken heart. Whatever it takes. Natural. Enemy. It will rain. Toxic. Lazy song. Tenerife C. Viva la vida. Before you go. Celestial. Check yes Juliet. Seven years. Amnesia. Photograph. Bonus soundtrack. Musical compositions. Kiss the rain. Rivers flow in you. Ugh. It's finally done. I groaned as I stretched my arms upwards. Paul and Lionel had already finished their discussion a while ago, leaving only me, Pepper, and Leo in the room. The discussion wasn't a one-time thing, and it had been going on for almost a week. We can re-release the album next season with the other songs as bonus soundtracks, and maybe even release it differently per season, making the album a limited edition. Leo muttered, which shocked me a bit. Nice. Then Emma get more money. I speak in an urban British accent, which made Pepper frown. Please don't do that again. He muttered. It's almost 1.00m. Let's get you home. Pepper suggested. Without me realizing it, it was already the 2nd of July, and when I returned home today after work, we were already getting into the 3rd. I stopped him and said, Nah, we still have more work to do. Are you up for it, or do you need some rest, old man? Pepper gasped dramatically, You take that back. I'm only 42 years old? I'm still young. Despite his forbearance, he passed out on his chair 30 minutes after I started mixing music and finishing up the sound for the songs. Then, I burned all of the songs into one CD. I'll let Haley test it. I muttered as I kept the ordinary looking CD into my laptop bag. Peps. The release date. I asked. I'll call over some more professionals first before I send it to production and don't forget the meeting with the marketing team. And, like you said, Amazon really has a large distribution channel, and they are willing to sell things other than books. Harvey is negotiating with them, and I believe we can get it done before the 12th. Great. So June 12th. I'll try to see if we can make a pre-order request on the website. I muttered. I add. There's something else. Do you want to go to Europe for your tour? Pepper asked suddenly. Wait, what? I was confused. Then I checked out the request we got for performance dates in a few European countries. It could certainly be included into my national tour, turning it into a world tour but, we don't have the time. Unless, I skipped the first two weeks of school. I was forced to tell Pepper. Well, Pepper was confused by the question. He knew that school was basically useless for me now given my genius, but he still wanted me to experience it as it could help my social development. Otherwise, I would just be another Hollywood kid snorting heroin and getting STDs if he were to leave me alone. If it's the norm then dash. No. Pepper stopped me immediately. I'll try to see what we can do. In the meantime, you should go and enjoy the 4th of July celebration with your family. Peps, what about the gala? Can I make it? This dash, I totally forgot about that. Let me check the schedule. Aha, uh -huh, the gala is on the 7th of July. You only have a short interview in the morning, so we can still make it to the gala. I'll notify Taylor too so that she can come with you. General POV. 
Dunphy's house, has it started yet? Phil asked in an urgent manner as he ran towards the couch in the second living room. Claire, Luke, Alex, and Haley were already watching the TV when Phil intruded their space and jumped in between his children, causing them to groan. Phil, at least take off your necktie. Claire rolled her eyes as she reminded Phil who just got home from an open house. I feel like I keep seeing Ed on the TV these days. Alex muttered. Haley replied, yeah, cause he did a lot of interviews to promote his album, and mom and dad want to watch every single one of them. This is the seventh time I'll read I. Luke chimed in. I'm already bored. Can I go play in the backyard? He asked Claire. Don't be silly Luke. You need to show your support for your big brother. I thought you guys were close. Claire replied. Luke then said casually, well he's my friend, not my big brother. Maybe for many, but not me. Also, I haven't seen him in almost two weeks. Alex then teased, ah, did you miss your big brother? While trying to pat Luke's head like a dog. Cut it out. Luke brushed her hands away, and they started to fight. SHHSHHSHH? It's starting? Haley had no interest in her sibling's squabble, as her entire attention was on the TV screen. After the interview ended, Haley asked, Mom, can I follow Ed's tour? W what? Honey, you're too young. It's dangerous. Claire tried to brush the matter away, but Haley wouldn't back down, it's not like you'd have to pay for anything. Uncle Cam told me he can get me an internship at Ed's company, so I'll be getting a summer credit, and I can watch every single one of his shows too. But honey, what about family camp? You promised your dad that you're going to join his team this year. Claire said, her voice shaking at the prospect of losing control over her daughter. I'll, I'll talk to dad. I'm sure he'll understand. Haley muttered and left, causing Claire to freeze in her spot. Claire's commentary. It's not that I don't trust Haley, or Edward. But I understand I mean, I hear things, gossip really. Claire muttered with a guilty conscience. It's not that hard to imagine that Haley could very well be pregnant by the time she returns from the trip. Which is too dangerous. So, I have to get her to stay. Claire vowed. She then sighed, I keep using terms like family, brother, one of us when I refer to Ed to prevent this sort of stuff, but it's all useless. Commentary ends. Edward POV. When I returned to my aunt's house, I was surprised to see that everything in my room was already cleared out. What's going on? I asked Camila who was smirking as she carried a luggage bag with her. Are you leaving me too? Too? Wait. No, I'm not leaving. Camila was startled and she held my face as she explained it to me. We're just moving back to your house. My eyes lit up, the construction is finished. I thought Jay needed another three days. No, turns out he's just dragging the time because he wants to boss people around and hang out with the construction workers. Gloria caught him in the act, when she thought he was cheating on her. Wait, what the hell did I miss? I groaned in frustration as I called Alex immediately. My useless spy? This is the kind of thing I need to know. It surely can make an episode? Arg? Wasted opportunity to watch it. I thought to myself. Camila was weirded out by my reaction, and she said, Alex won't know. Even Claire didn't know. I only know this because I was there to witness it. I grabbed my aunts by her shoulders immediately, tell me everything. Camila's commentary. I'm worried. I think Ed's condition has worsened. I should follow Dr. Linda's advice and slowly let him see that he's living in the real world, and not a TV show. But honestly, I'm too scared to do it. What if I somehow break him more? Commentary ends. Jay had been texting, and laughing, while using your WhatsApp beta app. You're still renaming the app right? Don't change the topic. What happened next? I asked, my eyes glittered from the excitement of a hidden episode I'd never watched before. Camila was disappointed, but she hid it and continued, so Jay had been texting the construction crew, cracking jokes about wood and everything but he'd been hiding it from Gloria. He was also taking a few weeks off his work to finish the construction, so Gloria thought he was working hard. Honestly, what's the point of him still going to work after marrying Gloria? UMM, sorry, continue. I rubbed my head apologetically. Camila was excited, you really like Gloria huh? Well who wouldn't? Anyway, what happened next? I changed the topic quickly as I sensed she was going to tease me about it. After that she told me the full story. When Jay was trying to cover up his tracks, Gloria ambushed him near the hot tub, causing him to fall in the water. Then Gloria got to know from the construction crew that the work was actually finished, and she scolded Jay for thinking that she would be angry when seeing that he was working on something that he loved. She thought it was sexy, and they made up right there in front of everyone. I never thought that I would be jealous of a relationship like Gloria's, but right now, I am. Camila confessed. Me too. I muttered. Should we both marry a rich older partner? As long as she's still perky, I can think about it. Like Nicole Kidman, or Chandler's mom in Friends. Camila rolled her eyes and we walked towards my new house together. The new living room was designed to give a minimalistic, but elegant feeling to the household. A 56-inch Sony old flat-screen TV was mounted on sitting eye level just beside the grey brick fireplace, with a full entertainment system installed around it. The living room had plenty of natural light, and even some potted plants in the corner. Camila gasped and jumped on the new couch immediately. This is so nice. She exclaimed. I laughed and pressed the switch on the side of the couch as I told her check this. The couch turned into a bed, and she was dropped along with it. She glared at me before laughing as we continued our tour of the house. You're living here now, right? I asked Camila. Huh? 
No, I was thinking that she tried to reject my offer but I guess you could say that the cat got her tongue when she saw my smirking expression. You're staying here. The guest room has already been turned into Camila's room, so you don't need to find a new place anymore. I said in a decisive manner before walking towards the basement. Camila was touched, but then turned confused. Ed, where are you going? Oh, I need to check up on the most important part of this whole project. I replied casually. The basement. She followed me from behind, and once we entered the dark underground space, she prayed for her safety before I turned on the lights. A sparsely equipped laboratory space was revealed, surprising Camila. What? You're going to be the real-life Iron Man. She joked as she walked around the lab. Well yes, but actually no. I mean, I aspire to have the money part of Iron Man. Not the heroic self-sacrifice part of him. Although the playboy part does seem interesting too. I replied honestly. Camila laughed and then said, Okay I'll go make lunch for us. You don't need to make any for me. I'm going over to Haley's. I replied, Huh? Ah, and here I thought we were going to have more aunt-nephew bonding time. She joked. We can still have dinner together. I already promised to eat lunch with my friends today, and Jenna's mom is going to pick us up. Jenna and who? She asked. Jenna, Enid, Alex, and me. We're going to see Jenna's new house, and hang out by the pool. I explained. And surprisingly, her new house is just a block away from Jay's. Jenna's mom had sold her previous mansion to buy a slightly smaller one. It was a good thing for Jenna, and she wanted to invite all of us over to celebrate, but we could not all gather together until the 4th of July. Ah, tell dad not to store any fireworks in the basement. I reminded Camila before I left the house. Camila's POV. I contacted Gloria after Edward left as I wanted to ask her for some advice she was Edward's favorite person and I wanted to know why. Huh? Oh, Ed forgot his bathing suit. I muttered as I remembered Edward leaving the house empty-handed. He won't play in the pool nude, right? I mumbled with some concern. Chapter 155, Chapter 155, Shenanigans. A short 4th of July arc. Edward POV. Hi Mrs. Jenna's mom. I greeted the bikini-wearing blonde woman as she opened the front door. You don't know my name. She asked with a seductive smirk as she welcomed me inside. I know, but I'm confused whether to call you Mrs. Carlson or Mrs. Mackenzie. I said honestly as I entered the house. She chuckled while her hand slowly patted my arm, just call me Alex. I can't. Otherwise the smaller Alex will get mad. I joked. I can do Alexander. She scoffed, not Alexander. That sounds like a man's name. To be honest, Alex sounds like a man's name too. I said casually, and at this moment, Alex and Enid finally got out of the car and gathered together with me. Alex gave me a side eye before greeting the mother and they went to change into their swimsuits immediately. Jenna's still in her room. She said she wants to finish watching a nice lobby? I don't know what animation she was watching, but she binged it every single day this week. Alexandria told me. Wait. Jenna is already at a nice lobby? Oh shit. I cursed. Alexandria was taken aback and became serious immediately. What's going on? She asked. Well I don't think that Jenna will come out of her room today. I said. Why? Alexandria was alarmed and she quickly walked up the stairs to go to Jenna's room. Honey, are you alright? Edward is here. The sexy mother opened Jenna's unlocked door, and was stunned when she saw Jenna sobbing in a heart-wrenching manner as she watched a pirate crew set fire on their ship. Gomen Eni. Mary's voice sounded, causing Jenna to wail. Mary. What what what? Mrs. Alexandria was confused, but I went next to Jenna while trying to hold back my tears too. Mary. I mumbled. What the hell is happening? Alexandria exclaimed, but no one would answer her. Jenna hugged me as we watched Mary's last moment with the straw hats, and she cried in my embrace for over half an hour after the episode ended. By that time, Enid and Alex were already ready to play by the pool, and were confused by the fact that Jenna and I were still in her room. They knocked on the door, and saw that Jenna was calming down from her crying. What happened? Did Edward bully you again? Alex asked while giving me an accusatory look. Oi. I retorted with a deadpan stare, making Jenna laugh a bit. Yes. Edward bullied me. She said suddenly. Hey. What? If you didn't watch the anime when we had a study session before, I wouldn't be hooked like this, and I wouldn't be crying because of a ship dash. Jenna said in faux anger, but was interrupted by Alex. La la la, no spoilers, I just got to water 7. Alex stuck her fingers inside her ears to avoid hearing the information. Get him. Enid shouted with a grin, and all three of them attacked me at the same time. Ouch, who's biting? Hey, whose hand is touching my ass? After getting bullied by the girls, Jenna went to change her clothes. Jenna was picking her outfit while I was still in her room, but she had no shame about changing in front of me. She even asked me about the bikini she was going to wear. What about this one Ed? She placed a lacy black bikini on top of her dress as she looked at me in a coquettish manner. Alex and Enid looked at each other before they nodded knowingly. Come with us for a sec. Both of them grabbed Jenna, one arm each before dragging her into her closet. After five minutes, Jenna walked out while wearing a boring one-piece swimsuit and a face filled with discontent. Oh damn, I forgot my swimming trunk. I muttered as I suddenly thought about it. Huh? So what are you going to do? Alex teased, there's no other male in this house, so you can't borrow one. Unless you want to wear a girl's bikini. He should wear a thong. Enid exclaimed. I ignored Enid and said, it's fine. I just won't get in the pool. Enid, the album's ready. 
I'll set one aside for you as soon as the production starts. Yay. Enid squealed before hugging me from behind. Piss off molester. I pushed her head, making her take a few steps back. That didn't dampen her enthusiasm, and she kept asking me about the album song list. Ed, will you set aside one for me too? Jenna asked coquettishly. Sure, it'd be 15.99. I replied in a deadpan voice. She was astonished and speechless after that. No friends discount. Alex asked teasingly. Oh no, I marked up the price for my friends. You can get it out there for only 14.99. What? Jenna and Alex were both speechless, but when they saw my smirking look, they realized that they had been teased. You jerk. Alex cursed with a smile. We all went to the pool, and while the girls were getting ready, I heard a voice calling for me from afar. Edward, can you help me? Mrs. Alexandria called. Sure. I replied casually as I walked towards her. She was lying on her belly and gave me suntan lotion when I was near. Can you help rub this on my back? She asked as she untied her bikini tops, showing me her bare back. I was stunned for about two seconds before I shook the lotion bottle. All right. I helped her without any embarrassment, which annoyed her a little. So she upped the teasing by making some noises as I slathered the oil on her back. Um, you have great hands Ed. It feels good. I laughed a bit and before I could finish it up, she asked, can you do my legs too? I'm sure. I hesitated for a bit before I politely helped her. I started from behind her knee going up almost till her butt before I went down again. My massage skills instinctively kicked in at that time, and it turned her fake sounds into real ones. UMM. It feels so good. Can you do it more? She asked with begging eyes after I finished up. You should tan now, or you'll lose sunlight. I said with a smirk as I slapped her thigh two times. She groaned before grabbing the suntan oil and started pouring it on top of her bikini, making it a bit translucent. She caught my eyes as I accidentally gazed on it, and said, You want to help me rub it here too? Well, maybe next time. I said before walking back to my friends. Alexandria smiled in satisfaction before licking her lips. I had to get out of there quickly as she kept giving me some suggestive looks. Not that I hated or was repulsed by it, but I drew the line at my friend's mother. Sisters might be okay. A hot aunt is considerable. But not their mother. At least for now, maybe, probably. I went to sit by the pool when Alex's head popped out of the water. Before she could open her mouth, I scolded her. Hey, you missed an important news story. Huh? What about? She tilted her head, confused. I told her about Jay and Gloria's story, in which Alex rolled her eyes and said, I can't know all of what my family is doing. I have my own life too. What a joke. Jenna suddenly chimed in, causing Alex to be embarrassed before Jenna added, or, maybe it was because you were distracted after all you have been texting Phineas 24-7. Alex blushed and splashed some water at Jenna. Enid, who was floating nearby, became collateral damage and she choked on the water afterward. Sorry. Alex apologized to Enid. Enid waved it off before asking me, Ed, are you cameoing in Twilight? Huh? Where did you get the news? Of course I won't be. I replied, a bit shocked by the information. Really? But there's a lot of articles about it. Enid placed her hand on her chin and thought deeply, hmm, wait. It's not an article. I read about it in the forums. People have been trying to get you to cameo, over my mom's dead body. I replied while shuddering. Why your mom? Jenna asked, confused. Well I'm still too young to die. I replied jokingly before I took off my shirt, revealing my muscular physique. All three girls blushed while Jenna's mom lowered her sunglasses before whistling. I shrugged at their reaction and threw the clothes far away. I needed to do that because the girls were splashing a lot and I wanted to keep the shirt dry. Close your mouth Enid. Alex rolled her eyes at her friend. Enid snapped out of her state and wiped her drool. Sorry. It was just too sudden. Perv. I teased Enid, making her submerge half her head in the water as she blushed. Oh right. You know how my dad has been watching One Piece with me. Alex said suddenly. Yeah, you have a dad. Stop bragging. Jenna suddenly teased. I gave her a high five as Alex was stunned, before I turned back to Alex. Sorry. The timing was too good. Continue. Well, he insisted we watched it from the beginning together, but when we watched our long park, he cried, like a gut-wrenching sobbing kinda cry. That's interesting. I muttered. Yeah, but then, when we watched Dr. Hillu look, or any other sad episodes after that, he didn't cry anymore. He didn't even cry when Luffy and Usopp were fighting, so that made me curious. I nodded as I was curious too. Alex continued, turns out. He was watching the show in advance before he watched it with me to give himself a pre-cry at the sad moments so that he won't cry in front of me to make himself look cooler. Did he succeed? I asked. I could clearly see how he held back his tears and sobs, so not so much. Alex said. I laughed out loud before I asked, didn't he say that showing emotions is part of being a sexy modern man? Why is he trying to cover it up when watching the show with you? Alex looked a bit guilty and said, I think, it's my fault. I told him I didn't want to watch the show with him if he cried like that when we watched Nami's backstory together. A-H-H. It is your fault. You don't have to think about it anymore. Alex splashed some water at me angrily. Jenna smiled and said, I kinda wish that I had someone to watch the show with now. I think I want to start watching it now that you guys keep talking about it. Enid suddenly interjected. You go and wolf out with the rest of your Twilight fanatics. I chased her away, causing her to pout. 
I will catch up with you guys before the summer ends. She vowed before splashing Enid and Jenna with water. They got into an intense water fight immediately, so I ran away from there to avoid getting sucked into the fight. Suddenly, my stomach gurgled. Oh, right. Lunch. I muttered. Edward, should I order some pizza? Alexandria asked as she noticed that it was time for lunch. Don't worry. I got this. Jenna told me she wants to try my cooking. I assume you guys went shopping for the ingredients this morning. All right. We did. I'll leave it all to you. Just, don't make it too fatty, okay? Alexandria said in a worrying manner. Honestly, she only ate salads and other diet foods in the house, so their kitchen was basically empty. It wasn't until they went shopping this morning that it got filled up. After half an hour, the three wet girls walked into the kitchen while drying themselves with a towel while Mrs. Carlson was still tanning out in the backyard. Wait. Shirtless apron. I need to take a picture of this. Enid's eyes lit up as she saw me standing behind the kitchen counter. I smiled and posed as she snapped a picture of me and shared it with the members of our group chat. Welcome to my only pans. Today, I'm going to serve you guys a delicious shrimp alayo olio recipe handed down in my family for generations. Only pans. Alex was confused. Not important. Try it. I pushed the plates towards them before putting a parmesan garnish on top of them. Jenna was excited and she was the first one to grab a fork and try out the food. This is amazing. She muttered with her eyes full of awe after tasting it. I smiled and said, I still have garlic bread in the oven, and Caesar salad for your mom. I'm thinking about making zavaglioni with strawberries for dessert, so wait for 10 more minutes. Ah, uh, Ed marry me. Enid proposed after taking a bite. I can't live without your food after this. I snorted and said, nah, you're too short. Hey, Enid retorted while Jenna and Enid glared at me too as all three of them were similar in height. I slid the dessert cup towards the two of them, and their pouting faces lit up immediately. Wait, I'm allergic to strawberries. Jenna muttered in a guilty manner as she saw I was going to serve her too. I know, that's why I made yours from mango. I smiled as I slid the dessert cup to her. Her face turned red and she lowered her head immediately as she ate the dessert quietly. Alex scoffed and badmouthed me, under her breath. Lady killer. Enid joined in, heartbreaker. Taylor lover. Love manipulator. All right. Enough. I stopped them before they could continue. Mrs. Carlson tried the food after she got enough suntan, which was an hour after the girls finished with their lunch. Oh right. What are your plans for tomorrow? Enid asked. I am planning on developing my Spotify app. Why? I asked. Well, Enid was a bit restless, so Alex spoke for her. Tomorrow is her birthday. My eyes lit up and said, oh, you're finally becoming a teenage wolf. Shut up. Anyway, I have no plans for it. So, I was thinking of celebrating it with you guys. She said sunderly. I laughed and patted her head before saying, my house is already finished with the construction. Why don't you guys come over? Alex's eyes lit up, is your lab also ready? The place is, but some equipment hasn't been delivered yet. It's only half complete, but we can play around with some toys there. Jenna and Enid rolled their eyes at the excited Alex as they had no real interest in science. After a while, I went back home by taking a ride with the Dunphys, and Phil suddenly asked, Ed, have you ever bounced on a trampoline before? I don't think I did. I replied honestly. Phil was excited as he invited, I was planning to teach Luke about trampoline skills today. Why don't you join us? Oh, I answered flatly. Well I have a lot of work to do today, and I already promised to hang out with Haley and study new fashion styles. Huh? Really? Was it your plan, or was it Haley's plan? Alex asked with a knowing look. Haley's. I replied honestly. She's going to come over. Oh, that's too bad, but fair. She invited you first after all. Phil muttered. Alex was skeptical. Dad, will you really let your young, beautiful teenage daughter hang out in a guy's room all evening without anyone monitoring them? They are learning. So I don't think I need to be worried. Phil said. You're asking the wrong guy. You should ask your mom that question. I gave Alex a hint. She scoffed at me before saying, I know. I will do that as soon as I get home. While I was reading some news articles about me on my laptop in the living room, Haley suddenly walked into the house, locked the door, my mom is planning on coming. I laughed a bit and said, nah, she won't. She just realized that she has a few more documents to work on. It'll take her at least till dinner to finish that, so you don't have to worry about it. That's sinister. Well I am her boss. I joked before calling Haley to sit right next to me. She opened up her doodle book and was excited to share everything about her inspiration with me. And I was surprised when I saw that all of her male designs were catered specifically to fit my image. I hugged Haley suddenly while she was still talking, which stunned her. UMM, what? Nothing. I'm just really fucking touched. That's all. I muttered before standing up and grabbed my laptop bag. Haley's commentary. That's what works for him? I mean. Haley tried to cover up her smile. I honestly didn't expect that. She added. And I didn't even plan for it. Commentary ends. Here. This is for you. I handed her the blank CD case. She grabbed it and was confused, what's this, your album, no, it's much better than my album, it's a compilation of every song I have sang so far, don't tell anyone else I gave it to you, after all there are some unique songs and thus that and the masters are the only ones of their kind, I muttered with a smirk, her eyes lit up and she was flattered, what, why did you give it to me, she twirled her hair as she avoided gazing straight to my eyes, 
I didn't answer and changed the subject instead. I have one last final interview on the morning before I fly to Wisconsin. Can I snap the design and give it to Pepper now? I want to wear it during that interview. Oh, sure. It's yours anyway. Haley said coyly while covering her blushing face. Ah, Alex told me you wanted to follow me on tour. I asked after sending the pictures to my company. Haley was taken aback before she got angry. I did, but mom won't let me go. I agree with her. Honestly, the schedule is kinda inhuman, so it will be pretty miserable for the interns to follow us along. I explained, but Haley was still unsatisfied. Well, if it's inhuman, then why are you pushing yourself to do it? She asked angrily. Cause I'm tough enough. I said while flexing my biceps. And if you want to come, just tell me. I'll save a VIP ticket for you. She couldn't hold back her laugh, and we hung out until it was almost midnight. We had dinner with my aunt and dad, and spent all night together in my bedroom. Hey, your mom is calling. I said as I saw her phone screen. She was sitting on my bed while I was typing on my desk. Ugh, I'm not finished yet. She groaned in frustration. I laughed and said, well you better go now before she storms through the front door. Can't you give her more work to do? Haley asked with pitiful eyes. I chuckled and said, well not right now, maybe tomorrow. Ugh, all right, then come on. She suddenly lay down on my bed and patted the mattress beside her. I was confused and she explained, I'll help you go to sleep, same as before. Thanks, but I still need to, yawn, finish up. Don't argue. Come here. She patted the mattress insistently, so I sighed and went to lay down next to her. She was satisfied and said, okay, now, go to sleep. Only because you're making me. If you get in trouble with your mom after this, it's not my fault. I said in a casual manner. Haley laid on top of my chest as we cuddled together. I wish that I could say that I didn't miss it, but honestly I was looking forward to it. I didn't want to get her into trouble so I activated my rest skill to fall asleep quickly. Unexpectedly, I found myself in an open field right after the clock struck midnight. What the, today? I shouted, confused. General POV. Ah, he's so cute when he's sleeping. Haley whispered gleefully as she saw that Edward was already asleep. Even faster this time. I guess I'm like his sleeping pill. She laughed, but then her face turned ashen as her ear picked up on something weird. Hmm? His heart beat. Her eyes shook in horror, and she patted Edward's face a few times to wake him up, Ed, Ed. Teed. Camille a a a. Haley shouted for the adults immediately. Ted and Camilla barged through Ed's bedroom door in their pajamas. What happened? Ted asked urgently. Haley was crying and said, Edward is, not breathing. Chapter 156, Chapter 156, Fourth Gotcha. General POV. Afterlife. A place where souls converge after the physical body experiences death. So what does it mean when an agent enters the afterlife realm? What would happen to the agent's body when they conducted their gotcha session? The answer is, their body will enter a suspended animation state, until the time when the session is over, and their soul returns to their physical body. Edward POV. UMM, hi. I walked warily towards the shaman-like existence in the middle of the grassy field. The shaman was wearing a cloak made of straws, and her face was hidden by a Viking-style helmet with giant horns. However, the smell of grass and the gentle crashing of the waves soon made me relax a little. This place reminds me of the MCU's place where Odin passed away besides Loki and Thor. Is this Valhalla? I asked her jokingly. She grunted and didn't answer my question while giving me a blank sheet of paper. Your karmic point. Beware. She muttered. Edward Newgate. Affiliation, official member of the Afterlife Corps. Current status, singer slash game maker slash inventor slash app developer slash chef. Positive karma, 142, 000, 022, 5 million in storage. Negative karma, minus 11 111.05. Holy shit that's a lot of bad karma. What the hell did I do? I scowled as I read my data sheet. Also, why am I being summoned here today? What special day is this? The shaman whom I could only see her mouth scowled at the question, you talk too much. She bonked my head with her wooden staff, causing me to whimper in pain. Ah, I groaned as I rubbed my sore temple. All right, I won't ask. It's not like there's any rule that needs to be followed for me to come here, right? I muttered sarcastically. She was silent for a while, and then she said, today, your summon still follows the rule of life and death day. However, I don't think that there is a person alive on your earth that knows the significance of today. Huh. I looked at the mournful shaman as she reminisced about something. I was confused so I asked politely, what day's significance is today, if I may know, ma'am. Do you want to test your luck or do you want to know a boring story? She asked with slight dissatisfaction. I was upset so I confronted her, why are you so angry? You're the one who brought me here. No I wasn't the one who brought you. And I already told the people at Afterlife Corps to stop sending people to my session. She growled in dissatisfaction before she took out multiple small bone pieces, and a worn out mat. Is this, bone divination? Isn't this an ancient Chinese tradition? What does it have to do with Nordic religion? I asked curiously. The shaman scowled and said, you really talk too much. Well I will shut up when you tell me about the boring story. I asked with a teasing smirk. She was stunned for a while before she asked in disbelief, you don't want to get your power UPS? I can only do one thing. If you want to hear my story, then you'll have to give up the karmic gotcha for today. So which one will you choose dash? 
Well I choose the story. I interrupted her, and she was stunned by my reply. She paused for a while. What? She exclaimed in disbelief. Yeah, I think your story will be more interesting than the gotcha. I muttered in a sincere tone. To be honest with you, I'm not looking forward to the gotcha right now. My life is quite perfect as it is. I smiled as I laid down sideways on the grassy land, propping my head up with my hand as I leisurely looked in her direction. So, tell me, what day is it today? I asked her again. She was silent for a while, before she bonked my head angrily again and said, sit upright if you want to listen to it. Don't be disrespectful. Ouch. I exclaimed with a smile as I noticed that she had put down her guard. I'm sorry. Please, enlighten me. I asked in a mischievous demeanor, which made her frown again. General POV. The door to the hospital emergency ward was pushed open. The EMT medical officer was sitting on top of Edward's body, pushing his chest to make sure that his heart would keep beating using CPR. Ted, Camilla, and Haley followed the gurney from behind, but was stopped by the medical officer as they wanted to follow Edward to the ICU. Haley and Camilla broke down crying. Ted gritted his teeth and blood was dripping from his clenched fist. Ed, don't die. Haley wailed as she could see the doctor trying hard to resuscitate Edward from behind the glass wall. Clear. The doctor pressed the defibrillator on Edward's bare chest before giving him an electric shock to revive his heart function. It's not working, the intern doctor said. Increase the voltage and try again, the resident doctor yelled. Edward's POV. Ow. Why does my chest suddenly hurt? I muttered as I rubbed my sore chest while listening to the shaman's story. So sage. All of the people who know about the old gods have disappeared from my world. I asked her, ignoring the pain. I found out that her name was Sage after insistent badgering, and two times getting bonked in the head. However, it was hard for me to have a bad feeling for the woman. She had basically been alone here for hundreds of years. She's an old grandmother. I have a soft spot for this kind of lonely person. Yes. I am now puzzled as to why you're here. No one is supposed to be here anymore. Sage muttered with a concerned voice. I wonder if this has something to do with Gongshin. That old guy loves to interfere after all. Sage mumbled. What was that? I asked her. Nothing. Now that you've listened to my story, you only have time for only one gotcha roll. Oh, the strength of my soul right? I guessed. Sage nodded and said, your soul is still too weak. You can only support being here for 45 minutes to an hour. It's okay. Then, roll it for me. Ah, what about the Grim Reaper dude dash? Stop talking and ruining my concentration. Sage growled before she shook the bone pieces in her hand. The sky suddenly turned cloudy, thunder and lighting appeared on the sky. I stood up quickly, ah, uh, what's happening? My mind was racing and my breathing became rapid. That's the background effect. Sage said casually. I almost fell down after hearing it, that's it. I really thought that something would descend from the sky. Sage snickered, as if something will descend from the sky because of you. I was shocked, so, things can fall out of the sky. Sage was silent, and then she threw the bone pieces on top of the worn out mat with a circle akin to a compass on it. Suddenly, an illusionary scroll popped out from the mat, almost making me fall on my ass from the shock. The guy who designed the background effect is really sinister. I grumbled as I sat down cross-legged in front of Sage. She opened the scroll and then sighed, I don't expect this to come out. Seriously, why don't you try to scheme better? Doing this kind of thing will only expose you more easily. Hoo hoo hoo. I urged her for an answer, but she just threw the scroll at me. I read it and widened my eyes from the shock. Black gold quality enhancement soul upgrade, one time use. What the dash before I could react, a golden glow appeared on my body, and the suction force that I had been feeling to get me back to my world disappeared. Congratulations. Your soul strength has been tripled. You can stay here for two more hours. Sage said in a tired manner. I laughed as I realized that someone was pitting against Sage in this session, and she lost, badly too. Sage thought for a while before she said, well, there is another way for me to chase you quickly, I mean, for you to end the session. That is, for you to empty out all of your karmic points. I rubbed the back of my head and said, that's true, but, it's impossible for me to roll all of my 130 million points even if I applied the high quality roll every time. Edward, don't you feel it? Sage suddenly becomes mysterious. What? I asked, intrigued. When did a gotcha roll with a session master become an ordinary one? Sage said with a smirk. I was surprised and said, wait, you have a special characteristic? Like the casino. Yes, I am the sage after all. You can make me an offer. And if I accept it, then I will conduct a divination roll for you. What's that? Unlike the randomness of the gotcha, my divination roll will give you something beneficial that you will definitely need in the future. However, once you object to my divination, or you try to question me about the future, the session will be over, and I could not use a divination roll for you again no matter how hard you beg of me. It's fine. I trust you Sage. I mumbled. So how much I need to offer? Sage was silent for a while, I cannot interfere, but let's just say that you cannot afford my service for less than 50 million karmic points. The subsequent gotcha roll will cost you 10 million points each, and this is not negotiable. Oh yeah? Lucky for you, I'm a rich man. I laughed before I shrugged and said, I leave my fate to you Sage help me. She snorted and said, that's natural. She took a deep breath before shaking the bone pieces in her hand again while muttering some ancient mantra. 
The background effect appeared again, which made me mutter, the dedication of these people. Sage then dropped the bone pieces on the mat, and another scroll popped out. She reached towards the scroll and read it, purple quality consumable, fire immunity, Natsu Dragnell. One time use. Wait. Fire. I furrowed my eyebrows as Sage threw the scroll to me. I placed it on the floor as I thought about the implication, this, the prize is something that was predicted by Sage, and I was sure to need it in the future, so I suffer from a fiery incident? If so, will I be the only one there? Sage. I dash. Remember the rules, Edward Newgate. Sage said quickly. I shut my mouth quickly and nodded, I'm sorry. Continue. Sage paused for a while and said, all right, I'll let you off with a warning. She then shook the bone pieces again, and the gotcha session continued. General POV, we have to put him on life support. I'm afraid, he won't have much longer. The doctor shook his head in sympathy as he broke the news to Ted and Camila. Ted staggered and fell down on the chair while Camila broke down in tears. How long does he have? Ted asked lifelessly. Less than a day. The doctor replied. If his condition doesn't improve, then the best choice we have is to let him go. Haley was comforted by Claire and Phil who came to the hospital as soon as their daughter called them. Outside of the hospital, the paparazzi was held back by the security before they could break into the ICU ward. Pepper wiped his tears as he entered the hospital, trying to keep himself steady to support Ted and Camilla at the critical moment. Harvey asked the doctor, do you know what happened to him? The doctor shook his head and said, we don't know. The toxicology report came back clean. He is not on any substance, nor was he poisoned. His body just, stopped. I am not clear on how to explain it. I have called a few specialists, and they are rushing over right now to take a look. Harvey was confused by the treatment so she gave the scruffy-looking doctor a weird look. The doctor understood her apprehension and said, Well, the director's daughter, is the fan club president for the boy, Lily. Harvey was shocked when she heard it. After talking to the doctor, Harvey quickly went to do some damage control to protect Edward's reputation as some party had leaked his condition to the press. Assholes. All of them? Harvey gritted her teeth, and her eyes turned red. She read the accusations that Edward had overdosed on drugs, and was already dead on the article's claims, and vowed to destroy each and every single one of the bastards that profits from others' misery. In Cuba, Miranda, the woman in a floral dress and large white hat, received a call from her sister from America. Her eyes turned red and she walked towards the bloodied man tied up to the chair before holding a gun right in front of his face. In Spanish, Don de Vair Ester Cargamento de Armas, where's that weapon shipment going to be? The man replied, in Spanish Padre Trader Los Castro, fuck you traitor. The Castro dash. Miranda suddenly took out five bullets from the revolver, leaving only one bullet inside the gun chamber. She then pulled the trigger, shocking the man in front of her, you have four more chances, sort of. Unless you spill the information, I won't stop. I won't tell you. Miranda pulled the trigger again. You won't, the man shouted, visibly shaken. Miranda pulled the trigger again. Wait. Stop dash. Miranda pulled the trigger again coldly. The man was nervous, do you know who I am? Miranda was still silent and she pulled the trigger once more. Then, she pressed the muzzle of the gun right on top of the man's forehead, goodbye, she muttered, the shipment is at XX Pier, 10 o'clock tomorrow, the man shouted quickly, Miranda lowered the gun slowly, the man smiled as he thought that he was safe, but then, another woman in a floral dress put her gun behind his back, and blew up his head, mercy is not for these vermin Miranda, the woman said, I'm going to America, Miranda suddenly said, the woman was shocked, did you forget your deal, I didn't, but, my son is on the deathbed right now, and if you try to stop me again, Miranda slowly aimed her gun at the woman's head. Then you will die. Edward POV. Purple quality gotcha, charisma of wicked wisdom talent James Moriarty. Purple quality gotcha, detective skill, Shinichi Kudo, detective Conan. Black gold quality gotcha, Kota Amitsukami, distinguishing heavenly god illusion, Uchiha Shisui, one-time use. Call me, Edward Uchiha from now on. I said in an arrogant demeanor. Then, Sage bonked my head with her staff again. Sit down. I need you to focus. There is something that you desperately need. And the rareness of the prize is incomparable to everything that you'd gotten before. Sage muttered. Wait. Really? What is it? I asked her. Also, will my eye change into a Mangeku Sherry non all right? I'll focus? I shut up quickly as she picked up her staff again. Currently, I have spent over 80 million karmic points in this gotcha session, making it the most expensive session yet. And the prizes that I'd gotten were extremely precious. Hmm, I can only store some luck before I V for that item. She muttered incomprehensibly before she looked me straight in the eye, I can guarantee that I can get out that item if I roll three random gotcha for you. Of course, the price won't change. This item, wait. No question right. I don't feel that you're trying to trick me Sage. So I believe in you. You can do whatever you want, but just leave enough points for me to cut off my negative karma yeah. Sage flashed a tiny smile and said, okay, I won't disappoint you. Green quality gotcha piloting skill, Maverick. Purple quality gotcha dance skill, Robert Alexander 3 slash Moose, step up movie. White quality gotcha, AI creation memory, Tony Stark. Oh, I got Jarvis, or maybe Friday, but it's a white quality one so the memory will be short. I mumbled to myself. 
Sage then took a deep breath and then she muttered, Well, I need another random one. From expecting, to suddenly feeling that she wasn't reliable, I narrowed my eyes at her before I sighed and said, Sure. She nodded and continued, Last one. I promise. White quality gotcha hairspray hand, eyes and so suke. I laughed out loud when I read the prize, and while I was tearing up, Sage was shaking her bone pieces in a solemn manner while mumbling the ancient mantra. Lightning and thunder danced together in the sky, before a lightning bolt suddenly struck at the center of the mat as Sage threw her bone pieces. Oh damn, what is it? I calmed myself down after getting shocked, and waited for Sage to finish reading. She smiled as she threw the scroll at me, you got it. The rare item. Black gold quality gotcha, talent shredder, afterlife corp. Wait. This is a corporation item. I muttered in confusion, why do I need this oh? This must be it. I snapped my finger as I thought about the danger of having that skill with me. Sage paused for a while before she said, before you continue joking, I'll remind you that special ability, god you sop, lie to truth is only a white quality gotcha prize. It only works on dumbass, and won't actually influence the fabric of reality like you're thinking of, dumbass. I was stunned for a while before I laughed to cover up my embarrassment. So, what do you want me to use this on? Use it on your prodigy's fate, Kusii Arima talent that you got during your first birthday. Sage muttered. Ha, huh? I rolled the gotcha on my first birthday. I asked her in shock. She stared at me for a while before she was astonished. You didn't know? How could you not know? This is not in line with the rules. Sage was restless for a while before she asked, so you don't know about your elderly lady killer talent too. I have a talent like that. I shrieked. I, I'll tell the guys back at the HQ about this so that they will rectify the situation. Sage muttered after thinking for a while. I nodded at her remark before using the consumable talent that she mentioned. Good. Last time, your guardian intervened so that the talent activation would fail. Now, you can have a normal relationship with the people around you and it won't turn into a creative tragedy. Huh? Guardian? Wait dash, did the accident involving Desiree? I widened my eyes in realization. Sage nodded, but she didn't explain as it wasn't part of her responsibility. It was enough that she helped me understand what had happened, and I was thankful for that. Okay, let's continue. I muttered. Sage looked at me weirdly and said, that's it your points are finished. A-H-H, ha ha ha. I laughed to cover up my embarrassment again before I felt a suction force pulling me away to my real world. Thank you Sage. Even if my world has forgotten about you, I will never forget you. I'll do a Wikipedia entry about the old god's existence as tribute when I get back. I smiled as I waved at her. Hey Edward. Sage suddenly shouted. What is it? Make a last roll. A normal one this time. She suggested while handing over the bone pieces in my hand. Really? My eyes lit up before I threw it happily, all right, one high quality dash, do a normal quality, she quickly said, all right, one normal quality, 66, karmic point gotcha roll, I announced, a white quality gotcha scroll popped out, and Sage quickly handed it over to me, I opened the gotcha quickly as my soul was dissipating, and widened my eyes when I saw it, I hugged Sage without warning, making her freeze in place, oh my god, you're the best session master ever, thank you Sage, I almost kissed her cheek, but my soul dissipated before I could do that. I got a nice treasure at my last gotcha roll. White quality gotcha, one piece anime, until ending of Wano arc, memory, Inaki Godoy, general POV. Haley couldn't accept reality. Why? Why is this all happening? He was fine just a few hours ago. She cried at the edge of Edward's bed after the doctor let the people come and visit him to say their final words before the doctor pulled over the life support equipment. She 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 she. Suddenly, all of the depressed and crying people in the room heard a strange laugh coming from the bed. Ted, Camilla, Claire, Phil, Harvey, Pepper, and Haley looked at Edward's face, only to realize that the man was laughing. Edward suddenly laughed out loud, and the EKG machine's reading suddenly spiked. Edward. Haley muttered in confusion, and all of them took a step back in surprise as Edward suddenly sat up and laughed while saying, Gearer fifth. <sighs> Wait. Where the hell am I? Edward was shocked when he saw the white surroundings and the people around him. Only then did he realize that he was wearing the oxygen mask, and was wearing a patient's gown. Um, how long was I asleep? Edward asked amidst the people's shock. The doctors were shocked. The nurses were shocked. His family and friends were shocked. The squirrel who's stalking him was shocked. And even his fans were shocked. Ed. Haley rushed to hug Edward after he woke up from his sleep. Edward was looking at his dad with an expression asking, what's going on? This, this is not possible. I was sure. The doctor shivered as he checked Edward's pupil dilation. It's a miracle. He shouted. Chapter 157. Chapter 157. Mommy attack. Quote of the day, the universe is a cold uncaring void. The key to being happy isn't to search for a meaning, it's to just keep yourself busy with unimportant nonsense, and eventually, you'll be dead. It was my birthday BTW. Edward POV. What's wrong? What happened? Why am I here? I got so many questions after I woke up from my sleep. It took a while for my family to calm down after the miracle happened. I was surprised when they said that my heart stopped, but I wasn't alarmed as I could guess it was a part of the gotcha experience. I really need to know the schedule of these things. I scolded inside my heart. While I was thinking, I found myself in the center of a group hug without my consent. 
Haley, Claire, Phil, and my aunt suddenly hugged me, while Pepper and my dad waited for their turn after the first group finished. I was only asleep. I mumbled, but no one would believe me. They didn't let me get discharged from the hospital, therefore I was stuck there until the doctor could come out with a reasonable explanation of what just happened. I rolled my eyes and continued sleeping after I was moved out of the ICU ward. The Dunphys left to get some rest, leaving only my dad and my aunt inside the ward. It's not that they didn't want to stay, but the doctor didn't want the ward to become crowded. Edward, did you eat something strange? The doctor asked the next morning. No, I replied honestly. Should I just Kota Amitsukami my way out of this? I think that will be too wasteful, right? I thought secretly while narrowing my eyes at the doctor. The blonde resident doctor who was checking up on me had no idea that she was in a pernicious position, and continued to question me about my habit and diet, trying to find a clue that could help her in the diagnosis. Hmm. She looked at my dad and aunt before asking hesitatingly, did you, had any sexual intercourse in the last 24 hours? I snorted, I wish, but no. She nodded before scratching her head in confusion, I still can't figure out what had happened to you, so, I'm asking for your consent to share your details with a good friend of mine. My dad frowned but I was intrigued, oh, who's he, Dr. Isabel. He's a board-certified diagnostician with a double specialty in infectious disease and nephrology. His name is Dr. Gregory House, and he's in town for a seminar. My dad opened his mouth to reject it, but I interrupted him quickly. By any chance, is he from Princeton Plainsboro Teaching Hospital in New Jersey? I asked the doctor. She was surprised and asked, you know him. Even my dad was surprised and looked at me in awe, well he's one of my favorites. I replied with a smile. I turned to my dad and convinced, let him come. Only then you'll believe that I was only sleeping. Then, we can go aboard the ship and see the fireworks from the coast. I didn't try to urge my dad to take me out of the hospital quickly after I learned what happened when I was asleep. It didn't take too much thinking to know how worried that they must have been when I was frolicking with Sage in the gotcha realm. Hmm, I already miss that girl. Also, I really need to stay in the hospital because two of my ribs were cracked. Shocking right? It happened during CPR, and it was a common thing in the procedure. And the culprit for this issue? My CPR certified dad, so I really couldn't blame him. Are you sure? Pepper is already suing the hospital after they leaked your condition last night. My aunt said while giving a suspicious look at the doctor. Dr. Isabel scratched her cheek in a guilty manner. Even though it wasn't her fault, she was still implicated as the person responsible was part of the hospital management, and now the entire group of doctors on the floor was implicated. The hospital's reputation flunked, and Pepper wanted to transfer me away to another private hospital, but I stopped him as I didn't want the hassle. It's fine. I trust Dr. House. I looked at my dad, and he sighed soon after. All right. Half an hour later, a limping, scruffy-looking man walked into the ward using a cane. He was wearing a simple suit, and went directly to snatch the lab reports from Isabel's hand as he entered. This report is wrong. His heart didn't stop entirely. Dr. House caught the irregularity in the diagnosis, but it was lowered to almost three beats per minute. So it's like he's dead, but not really. Whoa. I exclaimed subconsciously as I saw his intense style, causing the doctor to turn and look in my direction. Hi, Dr. Gregory House. I liked your rock song. He offered me his hand, and I shook it, Edward Newgate. Ask anything you want if that means I can finally go home. Dr. Howe smiled at me, but I knew that he had an intense distrust in other people. Okay, I'll take the challenge. I want to see how long you can stay honest and keep your reputation intact. He muttered. Try me, I replied with a grin. Have you tried any new, trendy, or under-the-counter recreational drugs in the last few days? He asked. I had an aspirin two days ago. That's it. I replied. Really? A famous, newly rich young boy, didn't live his life indulging in vices. He snarked sarcastically. Well I'm still too busy for that. Maybe in the future. I replied. My aunt scolded me quickly with a gasp, Edward. Hmm, that's strange. If your heart didn't slow down to a phase akin to a suspended animation, I would just say you were only asleep. Dr. House said after a thorough questioning. He asked about the material of the clothes I was wearing, whether or not I was bitten by a pet or any insectoids, how many sexual partners I had, which I whispered to him in reply because my dad was still around. I was asleep. I shouted in my mind. You're a good kid, surprisingly. Dr. House muttered with a trace of worry. You said you just moved back into your house? Mind if I look around? That's impossible dash my dad wanted to stop the madness, but I interrupted, sure. You can go there with my aunt. Ed. This is highly inappropriate. My aunt protested. Her reaction was normal for Dr. House, but my attitude towards him was greatly surprising for him. It's fine. He's not trying to hurt me. He's just trying to find the answer. So let's cooperate. I muttered so that I can go home soon. If you want to go home, you can go home. Dr. Howe suddenly said, surprising all three of us. Your body is quite healthy, and there's actually no reason for these guys to keep you here. All the examinations are done, so yeah, you can go. Really? My eyes lit up as he said that. Dr. House added, but, you need to wear a heart monitor for at least three days, even when you're at home, so that we can get a clue of what's happening inside your body. All right. I agreed with the requirement instantly. 
As he helped me wear the mobile heart monitor, he explained, this thing will beep if your heart slows down again, or if you have an intense heart rate. So don't exercise for a few days, and keep yourself calm. Wait. I'm not going to be here in three days. I muttered as I looked in my dad's direction. Dr. House nodded in understanding and said, it's fine. You only need to send the result to the hospital afterward. It doesn't matter where you'll be. I can refer you to the nearest hospital if it's really necessary. All right then. Thanks a lot doctor. I said with a smile. Dr. House smirked and left, leaving his contact number behind. After changing my clothes, I was escorted out of the hospital under the guard of six bodyguards. Although, we went to the parking lot first as I boarded the SUV there, so the strict guarding was a little bit much. Hmm. I suddenly turned my head as I could feel a gaze coming from afar. However, I couldn't find the culprit for it. What's wrong? The bodyguard asked me. I don't know. I just felt something nostalgic. I muttered as I gazed toward a huge cement pillar. I didn't investigate as I thought it was a stray paparazzi that managed to break through the net, so I just left the hospital quickly. My aunt told me afterward that Dr. House had examined the entire house for toxicity and other harmful substances when I was finally discharged. I wanted to watch the scene, therefore I checked the hidden CCTV I had installed, while eating ice cream straight out of the tub. Come over. No. Haley replied decisively after I video call her using the laptop, however, she was smirking afterward, signifying she was joking. She was on her bed, with a face filled with fatigue and sunken cheeks. Her eyes were a bit puffy, which made me feel a bit guilty from how much she had cried last night. The reason I was speaking to her like this was because I was grounded by my guardians until the doctor could come out with an explanation. For now, they were calling my condition the sleeping beauty syndrome, and it wasn't decided yet whether the condition was harmful or negligible for my body. Come on. It's the 4th of July and I cannot even go to the parade. I said pitifully, trying to earn her sympathy. She then shook her head and said jokingly, No, I don't think I will come over for the rest of my life. I flashed my puppy dog eyes, pretty please. Ah, damn it, why are you so cute? All right dash while Haley was pretending, suddenly her laptop was snatched and the screen was replaced by Claire's image. Edward, what are you doing? I want to go to the parade, but I'm on house arrest. So I want to invite Haley here. I said casually to Claire without flinching. She was taken aback before saying, All right, I'll come over dash. No need. Haley is fine. I interrupted her. She's my sleeping pill after all. It's just patient care Claire. You don't have to worry. I would worry. Especially since I'm going to leave my teenage daughter with a hot guy. Claire blurted out. Mom. Ew. I could hear Haley's voice coming from afar. Claire turned sideways and said, You know what I meant. But he's broken. Haley retorted. He needs my help. And I don't want to go to the parade without him. Yes Claire. I'm broken wait. I got another call. Text me if you're coming Haley. I'm not decent. I muttered as I was only wearing a robe at the moment. Not decent? Are you new? Dash the excited Haley snatched back the laptop from her mom, and before she could peek at the screen, I cut the call. General POV. So no one wants to go to the parade? Claire asked in a helpless manner. Luke, you too. Luke shrugged and said, it's not fun to go there without Edward. We promised to play with the fireworks together. Claire smiled helplessly as she rubbed Luke's head, feeling that her son was pretty cute. Luke's commentary. Of course we didn't make any promises. Edward told me that he has installed the new PlayStation at his house and bought a zombie game that we can play together. I was looking forward to it all week. So I was planning to go there today, but he got into the hospital last night. But he still let me play by myself. Commentary ends. Phil was a bit sad, but then he had a great idea. Well Alex is going to the parade with Phineas, Haley, and Luke want to go to Ed's. So why don't we bring our barbecue ingredients and fireworks, and we all go there this evening. Claire shook her head, we don't know what's wrong with Ed. I don't want him to get fatigued and pass out again. Haley told me he had been working continuously before it happened, so I want him to get some rest. Yeah, but think about how sad he is. He was looking forward to this day, to see the fireworks, the parade, but now, he's being grounded and treated like a weak man. I know Ed, and I know how much he hates being treated as a burden. Haley interjected quickly. Wait, really? Phil asked in realization. Haley nodded and said, didn't you notice? Anyway, he's not going to rest even if we told him to. So let's just go there, and we can keep an eye on him. But his dad is there. Even his aunt will be there. Claire tried to reason. Yeah but can they honestly stay with Ed all day in his room to keep an eye on him? Haley said, trying to get inside Claire's head. Claire widened her eyes in realization before saying, she's right. It's settled. Let's have the 4th of July celebration at Ed's place. Phil announced in excitement. At a cafe in a town nearby, Camila was sipping a cup of tea while sitting facing a woman in a floral dress. You're not going to meet him. Camila asked. Miranda shook her head, no I don't have the strength to do it. Camila squinted her eyes, so you're going to keep stalking him from far. Maybe. Miranda sipped her tea and answered noncommittedly. You should go back now. Don't let him out of your sight. Camila nodded. By the way, did you bring what the doctor wanted? Miranda took out an envelope and slid it over to Camila, the family's history of disease. I went back four generations. There's only one person with a history of heart problems from the result. Camila shook her head in annoyance. It's your dad. Damn it. Even after he's dead he keeps causing problems. That Diablo. 
Edward POV. Something strange happened. Instead of her entire family, only Haley appeared at the house. I thought Desh I muttered, confused. I peeked outside the house after I opened the door, but no one else was there. Well they are coming. My dad and your dad want to have a barbecue. They are moving Jay's grill here. Haley muttered as she carried a food bag in her hand. A-H-H. I see. And what's this? I asked with my eyes glued on the bag. I was a bit hungry, and the smell from the bag wasn't helping. Haley blushed immediately and said, Well, I, when you texted me that you were coming home, I wanted to cook something for you. So I learned how to know, it's silly dash. Before she could change her mind, I grabbed the bag immediately and said, This is for me right? No take backs. Wait. It was the first time I cooked? So I don't know if it will taste good. Haley was embarrassed and tried to snatch the bag, but I tiled my arm to get the bag out of her reach. No. Take backs? Besides, I'm starving. I'll go put this in a bowl dash. Wait. Let me do it. You you. She grabbed my hand and pulled me to the couch before dropping me on it. You sit here and rest. Don't do anything. She then blushed and went to the kitchen before coming back five minutes later with a hot bowl of soup. Oh, chicken soup. Nice. I muttered as I tried to grab the spoon, but she stopped me. She hid her embarrassment and avoided my eyes before saying, I'll feed you. Beep beep beep. Suddenly, the heart monitor sent out an alarm, causing Haley to be shocked. She placed her hand on top of my chest and said hurriedly, I'll call the doctor dash. The alarm stopped as I calmed myself down. No, it's fine. You just made my heart race for a bit. I muttered in embarrassment. Haley was taken aback and pulled her face away, before she blushed red. Oh, she muttered flatly. We couldn't look into each other's eyes, and I could feel that my heartbeat was racing again, therefore I changed the subject, so, the soup. Oh right, the soup. Haley muttered in realization. She then grabbed the spoon, and gently blew at the hot soup. My eyes were glued on her face, and honestly, I couldn't look away. Before she could feed me, she hesitated, this, will make the heart monitor beep again right. There's a possibility. I muttered knowingly. But don't you dare stop. She blushed and then gently pushed the spoon into my mouth. I smiled as I ate it, and then the heart monitor beeped once more. Beep beep beep. Haley was startled again, and she hurriedly said, Don't think too much. I'm just feeding a sick person. Calm your heart down. I smiled wryly and said, Can you grab me a cup of water? You, not being here, might help me calm down. Okay, you should eat it by yourself first. She blushed and went to the kitchen obediently. As I saw she had disappeared, I stuck my tongue out and whimpered, Salty. Salty? Salty. It was like she had boiled the soup using ocean water. I couldn't help but send her away and grabbed my laptop bag to grab the bottle of water inside. I washed my mouth quickly, and then I heard her shouting, Ed, where's your cup? Inside the top left drawer. I shouted back. Then, I grabbed the bowl of soup, and decided to down it all in one shot before the taste hit. God, help me. I prayed before I did it. Haley then came back and saw that I was eating the soup deliciously. Her eyes brightened and she smiled, Were you that hungry? There's still some more left if you want it. I grabbed the cup of water from her and acted calmly, yes please. I gave the bowl to her and asked for a second serving. She smiled and skipped to the kitchen with a hum while I muttered sadly, now I know why she gave me the Kota Amitsukami. It's to hypnotize myself so that I can finish the soup. Chapter 158, Chapter 158, Truth or Lie, Edward POV. After finishing the entire soup without giving Haley a bite, I took a screwdriver and started to open up the backup heart monitor that the doctor provided without taking off the one I was wearing. Oh, simple enough. I just need to tweak the sound system a bit. I mumbled before making some modification to the backup machine. What are you doing? Haley asked in confusion after she walked into the living room from the kitchen. This is a backup heart monitor. Do you dare to wear it? I asked her with a sly grin. Haley was taken aback and then refused. No, I don't want to. Just for one minute. I pleaded. She blushed and said, No, I don't want to expose what I'm thinking. Like you did. Haley's commentary. It's pretty dangerous. If that thing beeped in front of my family, then my mom won't let me stay alone with him anymore but I think my dad would push us to be together, so I'm torn on whether to do it or not. Commentary ends. Come on. I'll personally put it on you. I tried to persuade her. She was hesitant before her eyes lit up in realization and smacked me on the shoulder, you just want to touch my boobs. Ah, you caught that huh? I joked while Haley gave me a side eye but with a face full of smiles. Edward, are you feeling okay now? Phil asked in a careful manner as he entered the house through the backyard door after settling the grill with my dad. I shook my head and complained, no no, don't do that. Do what? Treat me like I'm going to break at the slightest touch. The only way you should greet me is by giving an excited shout like you always do. If you continue doing this Phil, I'll resent you. I spoke honestly. Phil and Haley were taken aback, and they fell into contemplation. Phil smiled wryly and scratched his cheek before changing his expression and shouted, Ed, are you excited for the fireworks? Now that's what I'm talking about. I stood up and gave Phil a light hug before we went to the backyard together. So Phil, wanna play with this? His eyes lit up as he saw the backup heart monitor. Play? How? Simple. The sensitivity of this thing is outstanding. It can even detect the heart fluctuation if you lie about something. Same as a lie detector. I muttered some nonsense before giving it to his hand. 
He hesitated a bit before seeing the heart monitor on my chest. His eyes lit up and he asked, tell me a secret. I rolled my eyes in disbelief before saying, Alex had her first kiss today. Phil was taken aback, and even Haley followed us from behind was shocked. Both of them automatically gazed at the heart monitor, and found out it wasn't beeping. Wait, really? Haley's eyes lit up, but Phil was depressed, wait Haley, it could still be a lie, unless we see the dash, I have an STD, I mumbled with my hand in my pocket, and then the heart monitor started beeping, Phil's face turned deadpan and he knew that he couldn't argue with my statement anymore, soon, Kim and Mitch joined in the party together with Lily, Gloria, Jay, and Manny also arrived after getting back from the parade, together with Alex after Jay picked her up, hi Gloria, nice dress, I complimented as I saw her red, white, and blue themed dress that hugged her body, she smiled and said, thanks, Manny didn't like it. He said that I looked like the flag. I laughed a bit before explaining to the others about the lie detector game. So, do any of you guys dare? Mitchell creased his eyebrow and said, I don't know. I think that this will bring disaster to our already strange relationship. Why, do you have something to hide? Cam accused him directly. Mitchell blanked out, while Jay tried to stand up and run, I'm leaving Dash. Come on dad. Let's try it. Claire persuaded him while holding the edge of his shirt to prevent him from going away. Yeah, it's not like you have something to hide, right Jay? Gloria said with a smile while hiding her murderous gaze. Jay sighed and said, one question, just one. To be clear, one question each, or one question total dash Phil tried to get a clear statement. Total. Jay said gruffly, Alex, will you do the honor of squirting some lube on Jay's chest and place the electrodes there? I asked Alex who was standing behind me calmly. Wait, I'm starting? No, let Phil start it first. Jay pointed at Phil. No, let Claire start first. Phil pointed at Claire. Wow, you really are suspicious of your own wife huh? I wonder what question you have loaded in your mind. I chuckled a bit, which made Claire face freeze. Claire's commentary. This situation is turning dangerous. She muttered. A few days ago, I donated Phil's fun shoes because he never wore them. It was a Chewbacca shoe or something, anyway it was furry, and I didn't like it anywhere near my closet. Flashback to Claire screaming as she noticed the shoe inside the dim closet space. Back to the commentary, I even thought it was a raccoon a few times. I just couldn't take it anymore. So, I went behind his back. Commentary ends. Can I squirt the lube? All the people there turned to look at me no, towards Luke who's standing behind me who tried to mimic my voice. My heart monitor almost exploded as I really thought that I had blurted out my thoughts, but luckily I didn't. Claire smiled and said, well you can't. Alex rolled her eyes at Luke before helping Claire set up the machine. After a minute, Claire was already strapped into the machine. Me, my question first. Phil shouted. Claire looked nervous, and she whispered, don't ask anything embarrassing philosophy. Don't worry, I only have one question. Phil smirked slyly before asking, do you think I'm funny? Well, Claire hesitated for a while, not knowing how to answer the question. UMM, funny is a subjective thing. Claire mumbled. Well come on, the question is not that hard. Answer it with yes or no. Mitchell urged while laughing at Claire's misery, not knowing that Kim was silently taking note of his reaction. Haley grabbed my shirt sleeves and gestured at me to lower my head. She then whispered, are you trying to spread chaos again? Well a little bit. Don't worry, I'll try not to include sensitive things. Claire hesitated for a while before answering, yes. Phil, I think you're funny. All of them waited for the beep, but the machine was silent. Claire breathed in relief while Jay grumbled, that thing must be broken. Next question. I announced. Wait. How many questions should I answer? It can't be from all of you right? Claire's face turned anxious, so I said, let's make it a rule that one person should answer only three questions. Okay. Me next. Claire, did you take my ice skating trophy? Mitchell asked. You're still hung up on that? Also, that's our trophy. Claire gritted her teeth angrily before answering, no I didn't take the trophy. Wait what? Mitchell was confused, so he turned to his dad. Jay sighed and said, you guys couldn't stop fighting after winning it, so your mother decided to donate the trophy back to the ice rink. How could she do that, slash she had no right to do that. Mitchell and Claire retorted at the same time. And you didn't stop her. Claire accused her dad. Jay just shrugged and didn't answer. So all this time, I resented you for nothing. Mitchell said in realization. Wait, you resented me. Claire was shaken, but Kim interjected, me, me, I'm next. Claire, did you keep my yellow top Tupperware after I gave you the pudding a month ago? Claire rolled her eyes and said defensively, no I didn't Kim Dash. Beep 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 beep. I knew it. Kim accused dramatically. I want it back today Claire. He muttered as Mitchell calmed him down. Who's next? I asked, not minding the murderous gaze that Claire gave me. Claire's commentary. I wasn't lying. Luke's commentary. Mom didn't lie. The Tupperware wasn't in her house. I took it to store a bug before, and left it at the park. That Tupperware is gone. Commentary ends. Next will be Cam. I announced with a sly tone. Why are you so excited? Haley nudged me, causing everyone to look in my direction. Well I have a question I want to ask him. Kim gulped his saliva and tried to make a poker face, but people could see that his chin was quivering. Alex went to attach the electrodes before I asked, Kim Dash. Ed. 
I'm sorry, but it wasn't me who said your performance was mediocre in the after-concert interview. I said it wasn't mediocre, but the journalist twisted my words. That's not what I was going to ask, but thanks for telling the truth. I smiled before I turned to Phil, can you pose sexily in front of Cam? Huh, X2. Phil and Cam were confused, but Phil stood up and posed anyway. I asked Cam the question, do you Cam, think that Phil is sexy? Claire and Jay widened their eyes while Gloria laughed out loud. Come on Cam, you can answer this. Gloria yelled. Huh, of course no. Cam muttered his truth, but then the heart monitor started beeping. Mitchell was flabbergasted and accused Cam, you said you were not attracted to him. Wait, I don't. Cam tried to defend himself, but the heart monitor beeped again this time. Cam was spooked, and then Gloria asked, well Cam, do you think Jay is sexy too? No. Cam answered in a high-pitched voice before the monitor beeped again. Okay, that's all three questions. Next person. I interjected before Cam could argue and defend himself. His face turned pale white, and he was extremely distressed. Next is Phil. Can we stop this? Jay grumbled. No I haven't got a turn yet. Gloria protested. Alex quickly helped her dad with the lie detector before Phil sat in a mediation pose with his legs crossed on top of the chair. Huh? Phil, what are you doing? Claire was confused. Phil turned to her and said, Meditation can calm down your heart rate. I figured that if I want to beat the system, I should do this. I nodded in acknowledgement before muttering, All right. Anyone want to ask something? Oh, I do. Jay sat straight and gazed at Phil, When you dated Claire, you had that fluffy feather earring. Why did you take it off? You can only ask something I can answer yes or no to. Also, Claire told me to take it off. Phil muttered sagely while meditating. Claire was a bit embarrassed, and she leaned towards Phil before asking, Next. I want to know. Phil, do you still find me attractive? With all my heart. Phil replied without hesitation. The heart monitor didn't beat, which made Claire hug him in contentment. Oh, you're going to be rewarded for this tonight. Claire mumbled while holding Phil's face. Luke suddenly asked, What do you mean by reward? Phil and Claire froze while Alex replied, Luke. That means they are dash. Alex, stop. Claire shouted hurriedly before turning to Luke, No, mommy just means that she's going to take dad out for ice cream tonight. Yeah, strawberry flavored. Phil added before Claire shouted at him, Phil. Huh? V vanilla. Phil was flustered. Oh ice cream. Nice euphemism. Kem and Mitchell chuckled together before Claire glared at them. That became even more dirty. I muttered while laughing together with Haley. Phil was nervous, but he kept his cool, until Luke's Iron Man figurine heads dropped underneath Gloria's chair. Gloria. Can you get it? Luke asked. Okay. Gloria spread her leg and bent down without getting off the chair, exposing her deep gully at the same time. Phil and I were in a daze as we saw it, and Phil's heart monitor beeped at that time. Phil. Claire cupped her hand over Phil's eyes immediately. Haley scrutinized my chest and furrowed her eyebrows. Why is yours quiet? She asked. I shrugged and said, I didn't get a good look. Got it. Gloria picked up the tiny Iron Man head she was searching for in excitement, not knowing what just happened. Next is Gloria. I muttered before asking, have you ever been arrested before? Gloria's smile froze and she avoided people's eyes. Pass. Wait, you can pass the question. Phil muttered in disbelief, wondering why he didn't think about it before. All right then. Did you ever keep a machete in the back of your car? I asked again. Gloria cleared her throat and then mumbled, yes. A long time ago. Wait, let me ask you next. Are you still keeping a deadly weapon in your car nowadays? Jay asked with a hint of concern. Gloria yelled, pass. Nah, you can only pass one time. Jay interjected quickly. Gloria's eyes shook and she muttered, no. Beep beep beep. Gloria's commentary. I knew I should have put some thumbtacks in my shoes to throw off the lie test. Gloria slapped her forehead as she was disappointed in herself for not using the knowledge and experience she had. Commentary ends. Okay, let's explode some fireworks. Gloria stood up and she pulled the electrodes from her cleavage before handing it over to Alex. Then, she walked away. Wait. Gloria, we still haven't done Jay and Mitch. I tried to persuade her. Hold on, hold on. Why just us? Jay asked with a sly look. What do you mean? I was taken aback at first, but then I realized it. Well you are wearing the machine now, so why not you? And Haley's already almost 16, so why exclude her? Jay said, sure. Strap on the lie detector on a teenage girl. That's like handing a loaded gun to her parents and helping them aim it at the back of her head. I muttered in concern before turning to Haley, run. I'll take the heat on this one. She smiled and said, I'll run after watching you answer the question. Well I heard something interesting about the hot tub while I was installing it. Jay suddenly exposed me. Did you put on extra security there because you wanted to soak in it nude? Well not just me, but yes. I replied casually, not embarrassed about my motives at all. Oh, we should borrow it sometimes. Phil mumbled, which caused Claire to glare at him. Me 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 me. Gloria raised her hand and shouted excitedly, are you dating Taylor? Not at the moment. All right, last question. I turned to the crowd, and then Phil raised his arms up quickly, well, my question is kinda sensitive. I don't mind it. I replied, as I was controlling the result anyway. Okay then. It can be all of us, or either one of us, but do you have someone here that you find attractive? 
The crowd oh while Haley blushed, but then I answered casually, yeah, I do. The beep didn't go off, and they oh once more. And it's Claire. I added, causing Phil to freeze. And also Gloria. I added again, and Jay froze. And a little bit of Jay. I added once more, causing Jay to shake, and Gloria to froze. What the hell dash Jay cursed, but his lips were curling a bit. Then, I took out the car key that I modified in my pocket and pressed the switch in front of them. Beep 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 beep. Ah, uh, you little scoundrel. Jay grumbled before laughing out loud. You've been lying to us, and manipulating us. Kim muttered in disbelief. That's horrifying, and also quite ingenious. Claire muttered in astonishment. I made a performer's bow before saying, you guys figure out which one is the lie and truth on your own. Oh no mister. You're not brushing this thing off. Claire grabbed my shirt before I could walk away. Phil was excited and he said quickly, Claire, you didn't think I was funny. Claire was taken aback and she said quickly, what? Phil, I think you're so funny. You're the funniest man I've ever met. If you really think so, then strap on the lie detector to test it again. Mitchell asked quickly, well I'm really thankful that he stopped the show before it got to me. Jay grumbled while sipping his beer. My dad finished grilling the meat while I was being admonished by the group of people, and before long, the night sky darkened. My friends all gathered inside my house before we moved towards an open field together, at a desolate place outside the neighborhood. Jacob and his family were here. Elsa and Jenna came together. Phineas and Billy rode their bikes here along with Enid and Abraham came with his cousin who carried a truckload of fireworks with him. Um, can you guys all stand behind me? Or you know, just generally far far away from here. Beep beep beep. Ed, your heart is racing. What's wrong? My dad asked in confusion. Haley and my friends had a worried expression on their faces. Nothing. Nothing. I just have a bad feeling being around explosive things. I mumbled as I feared for the worse. I honestly don't know whether having the fire immunity skill was a good thing or a bad thing for me. It made me become very anxious whenever I could think about a possible situation where I could need it. Don't worry. My cousin is a licensed firework starter. Abraham shouted in excitement. There's something like that. My aunt asked him in astonishment. He shrugged and said, there is when your name is registered by the police. Are you sure you didn't mean arsonist? I asked him jokingly. Then, his cousin lit up the firework, and it flew up into the sky. Boom boom boom. A beautiful greenish firework exploded and illuminated the night sky. My nervousness soon lightened as I saw that everything was going well. He said what? Alex shouted to her dad while the firework was ongoing. You told my dad Phineas kissed me. She shouted at me in anger. Phineas was taken aback when he heard it, while Jenna was excited as she heard the tantalizing piece of information slash slander. I laughed as I was chased by Alex for a while as we watched the fireworks. It took almost 30 minutes for the fireworks to end, and after hanging out with my friends for over two hours in that place we finally retired for the day. Chapter 159, Chapter 159, Wisconsin, 1. General POV. Hi, and you're back to watching MTV News. The MTV logo turned to a picture of Edwards leaving the hospital before the concert. Teenage pop star Edward Newgate has found himself in a perilous situation yet again when he was rushed to the hospital at midnight before the 4th of July. The details of the situation have been confirmed by our investigation on the scene. Here's what had happened. Edward Newgate was rushed to the hospital because of a heart failure episode, and he was placed on life support immediately by the doctors. Moments before the doctor could announce his time of death, he miraculously woke up from his condition, stunning all the doctors in the world. The screen showed the toxicology report of Edward that was leaked purposely by Entertain Company to make sure that people wouldn't accuse Edward of abusing harmful substances. His peculiar condition was nicknamed by the doctors, calling it the Sleeping Beauty Syndrome. It is still uncertain whether or not his situation is harmful to his well-being, or if he will have need of another miracle to keep on living. On another note, the Entertain Company had sent out a notice saying that Edward Newgate's debut album, Breaking, will be released earlier than previously scheduled, bringing the release date forward to 7th of July. Fans around the world have been sending prayers for Edward Newgate ever since the news first broke out, and we, for one hope that he can get through his predicament and return to the stage in time for his first world tour launch in a few more weeks. The screen changed to a clip interview with Robert Downey Jr. answering a question about Edward in his Iron Man promotional campaign interview. The interviewer asked about Edward's condition, and RDJ replied with a heavy smile, Yeah, I called him as soon as I heard the news. He told me he was fine and that people were just exaggerating, so I guess he doesn't want to make people worry about him. But you did. The interviewer asked. RDJ nodded and said, Of course. I'm pretty damn worried about him. I even considered barging over there with my Iron Man costume to fulfill his make-a-wish request, but he was discharged before I could do that. The actor wasn't joking. He really did consider doing so. He told me he needs to wear a heart monitor right now, and most importantly, his condition is no longer life-threatening. Like the nickname the doctors gave this new condition, he was actually sleeping the entire time. RDJ continued. Then, the screen changed to a clip interview of Taylor after she got out backstage from her concert in Vegas. Taylor was hounded about Edward and whether she was going to see him, but Taylor refused to comment on the subject and walked to her SUV quickly. However, the camera recorded her reddish eyes and pale face as she had just gotten the news. Next up, Brittany had shown us another shocking action by shaving her head dash. 
Edward POV. You're a bastard, you know that. Taylor cursed while Skyping with me in the morning as we watched the MTV interviews together. It wasn't just LMTV reporting on the celebrity gossip, Edward's condition, and his album release date had been reported by major news channels such as BBC, CNN, etc. Well I'd be stupid if I missed this opportunity. I muttered while shaking my head slightly. I know. That's why I said you're a bastard. Do you know how many of your fans are crying right now? Taylor admonished me. To be clear, her reddish eye and upset demeanor after leaving the concert hall was true. Her concert ended at 11 p.m., and she was resting in the building until she read a text message from Selena telling her what had happened. She wanted to jump on a helicopter and immediately rush to the hospital, but I woke up in time to stop her. It took me a lot of effort to convince her that I was fine, and to make sure that she didn't cancel her fan meet the next day because of me. Although she was doubtful about the authenticity of my words, she calmed down after I requested a favor from Dr. House to vouch for me. So, you're banking on this incident to sell more albums? Taylor asked with a skeptical look. Obviously. I shrugged and shook my head at the same time. She narrowed her eyes and said, It's not what the rumors say, that you're only doing this because you don't have much time left right. Well, who do you think spread the rumors? I smirked slyly, causing Taylor's hair to rise behind her neck. You demon? Ugh, you're seriously a monster. How could I ever be attracted to you? Taylor complained seriously. I then leaned forward and flirted, but you are turned on right now aren't you? Stop joking around, and, yes, so come back from Wisconsin soon. She licked her lips before sending me away with a warm smile. The decision to take advantage of the chaos was taken arbitrarily after I got back from the hospital. Not only would it do some damage control on the whole incident, it also served as promotional material for my album release. You know what they say, when life gives you lemons. And yes, I also agreed with Taylor that my approach was highly unethical since it could be seen as taking advantage of people's vulnerability and I did have a problem with it at first, but in the end I realized that it helped me to control the narrative myself in what could otherwise be a huge problem so I went ahead and did it. Also, I had to defend myself in this one. None of the information that I had sent out was untrue, well except for the rumor. But it wasn't even me who came out with the theory. I just fanned out the fire by pushing it to the main discussion of the forum thread. Am I really feeling guilty right now? Pull yourself together. I mumbled to myself before I walked down the stairs while carrying a small luggage. My dad was eating a sandwich that I had made for breakfast before he said, Okay, let's go. Your grandparents have already called me three times just this morning to ask if we were on the flight yet. Did you tell her that we can't use our phones in the air and that we'd call them as soon as we land? I asked with a puzzled look. My dad was silent for a while before saying, I, didn't think of that. Where's Aunt Camila? I asked after I took a look around. I want to say goodbye before we leave. My dad was hesitant and he grabbed my shoulder, well Ed, there's been a, change of plans. My aunt suddenly appeared from behind me with a small bag on her shoulder, I'm coming with you? Isn't that exciting? I scowled after being stunned for a few seconds, so you're just coming because you want to keep an eye on me. Honestly, when will this nightmare end? For all of us, when the doctor finally comes out with a diagnosis. Until then, buckle up. My dad said with a grin. I scoffed and grabbed my sandwich. A driver from my agency picked us up and drove us to the private airport where we would get on the private plane to fly to Wisconsin. What's that? Reducing carbon footprint? I'm sorry. I'm not Greta Dash. Ed, what are you mumbling about? My dad asked in confusion while sitting in an aisle in front of me sitting face to face with my aunt. Nothing. I shouted back before turning on the TV channel to watch a movie during the flight. I picked, Enchanted by Disney, and was enjoying watching the movie for the first time in my two lives. As I saw the Princess Giselle summoned animals using her voice, I got an inspiration to try something out. AAAA triple A triple AAAA, mimicking Amy Adams. Huh? Edward, what are you doing? My aunt asked as she laughed at my effort. I was a bit embarrassed and said, I don't know. I feel like I can do that too. I was wondering if I could use my soul voice and animal affinity that was enhanced by my afterlife aura to become a real life Disney princess prince. If by any chance I could make it work, then it would be game changing for me. A paparazzi wanted to follow me around? A swarm of rats will drag them to the pits of hell. Someone wants to spy on me from afar? They need to pass my murder of crows first, and also my cat army. What are you thinking about that you're grinning from ear to ear? My dad asked in confusion as he walked by to grab a cup of water for himself. It's not like we didn't have a flight attendant, but he wanted to check up on me. I scowled a bit before flatly answering, world domination. All right. Normal boy's thoughts. It's my fault for interfering. Continue. My dad waved dismissively under my unsatisfied gaze before he returned to his seat. Just to be clear, he's mad because of the way they were treating him, but at the same time he couldn't get mad at them as their concern is still valid. Hi Grandma Jules. Hi Grandpa Sam. I greeted after getting out of the airport. My grandpa looks kinda like the other Ron from Parks and RECS, while my grandmother looks like Marshall's mother from Hymim. My grandmother has wavy rusty hair with a tall and still attractive figure even when she was almost 55 years old this year. She opened her arms and said in a sweet and warm voice, Edward, it's been so long. She pulled me into her embrace, and I was surprised that I could only reach her bosom as the woman was freakishly tall. 
In fact, in the family, my dad was considered to be the runt of the litter with his 185 centimeters tall height. Even my grandmother was taller than him, and she still loves to wear high heel shoes when going out. Edward's grandmother, Susie's plaque son, aka Marshall's mother, Sam Elliott, Ted's dad slash Edward's grandpa, dad. Ted nodded slightly at his dad, son. My grandpa replied with a nod to, the old white-haired man with a cowboy hat and thick white mustache turned towards me before smiling slightly and patted me on the shoulder. You've grown? I know. I replied casually. My grandparents smiled before my grandma said excitedly, we should hurry home. I've spent all night making the perfect brisket for you. I know how much you love grandma's brisket. My eyes lit up, oh, I can't wait. Did you slaughter the cow at the ranch? My grandmother hesitated while my grandpa smiled, yes. I picked the juiciest looking one. Nice. I nodded before wiping my imaginary saliva. By the way, Ted. Is this your new wife? My grandpa pointed out casually as he saw my aunt. You sure like them Latinas. Camila and Ted were stunned before Camila got flustered and offered her hand to my grandparent. Hi, I, I am not his new wife. I'm his ex-wife's younger sister, so I'm Ed's aunt, technically. My grandmother's eyes lit up, oh, so you're part of the family. Come here you. She walked towards my aunt and gave her a big hug while my grandpa just nodded at her. Camila was taken aback at first before she just went with us. She smells like Canada right? I whispered to my aunt after my grandmother released her. Canada. Maple syrup and vanilla. Oh right. Canada wait, why vanilla? She almost went with it before she got confused by the category. I turned to her and said in a normal voice, well you know we got vanilla through a beaver's anus, and the beaver is Canada's official mascot. What? She widened her eyes in disbelief. Ed, don't prank your aunt. My dad interrupted quickly. My aunt rolled her eyes while I laughed. Is Uncle Aaron here? I asked as we got in the van. No, but your Aunt May and cousin are here. My grandma replied excitedly. Hmm Aunt May, if only my name was Peter. I mumbled to myself. Then you'd be the real life Spider-Man. My aunt said in a sarcastic manner. I turned to her and nodded, you do get me. We then took a 40-minute drive in my grandpa's van which he used to pick up the guest for the ranch. Luckily for us, he didn't bring the pickup truck or else me and my dad would have had to sit at the back during the whole journey. Oh there's been a mountain lion spotted at the mountain trail, so don't wander off too far okay Ed. My grandpa advised as we passed by the hiking trail entrance. Don't worry grandpa, I'm not even planning to get out of the house. I replied, causing my grandparents to be confused. We could finally see the ranch after a while. The grass was green, cows and horses were grazing on the field, the ducks and chickens were waddling around and almost every animal that we passed was looking at me weirdly as soon as I got near. What's he talking about Ted? My grandmother asked with a whisper as she stole a gaze at me. Ah. My dad hesitated, I'll tell you what's going on when we get home. After explaining about my situation to my grandparents, my grandmother hugged me for a long time. She didn't let go for over 20 minutes of burying my face in her bosom. Oh you poor poor child. My grandmother tried to comfort me. I'm actually pretty rich right now. I joked after I could finally breathe. All right. You go and wash up before we have dinner. My grandmother ordered. Granted it was only 4 p.m., but here in the ranch, we had dinner really early, went to sleep soon after but also woke up before sunrise. Which room should I stay in? I asked in confusion. My grandparents suddenly realized something and looked at each other. Oh no, there's only two beds left. What? I was in disbelief. My dad then muttered nervously, but we have three people. It's fine. Ed can bunk with his cousin Amy like they always did. My grandmother muttered sweetly. A teenage girl suddenly walked towards the living room and was stunned as she heard the statement. The red-haired girl with a short stature said hurriedly, Grandma no, we're already teenagers? It's weird for me to bunk with a boy. She was wearing a black crop shirt and a jean short. She also has a large chain necklace on her neck as she was in her punk era. Jenna Coleman Amy, and hello to you too. I rolled my eyes at her before saying to my grandmother, Don't worry grandma, I'll just bunk with dad. No, your dad's bed is a single bed, but there's a double bed in Amy's room. My grandmother said in an oblivious manner, Or we can throw him with the cows. My cousin Amy shot me a dirty look. There's no difference between that and staying in the same room as you. I replied back. She was irritated and almost lunged at me but I held her short head with my arm, making her swing her fist uselessly. Seriously grandma? No. I muttered. Nonsense. It'll be fine Edward. My grandmother waved her hand dismissively as she had already made the decision. My grandpa then threw my luggage inside the room before I could say anything to him. This is going to be a long five days. I rubbed my face in frustration before going to wash up before dinner. Oh, I should tell you. I invited Miss Allison from church to join us today, my grandmother said before walking away. Who's Miss Allison? I was confused. Just a new friend of mine. She moved here from New York to teach the kindergarten here, and everyone in the town loves her. My grandmother replied. Well we'll see about that later. I muttered suspiciously. Ding dong. Suddenly the doorbell rang. My grandmother clasped her hand in excitement and went to open up the door in a hurry. Hi Jules. You're looking even prettier today, the energetic woman wearing a pink cardigan said excitedly as she was welcomed into the house. I widened my eyes in shock as she was incredibly gorgeous and also quite familiar. Jennifer Garner? How? Why? What? 
My mind was a mess as I saw her. She looked at me and suddenly gasped, Prince Edward, who? All right, you're famous now. My cousin said sarcastically as Jennifer Garner I meant Miss Amy was stunned to see me. Alison shook her head quickly to snap herself back to reality and said, Edward Newgate. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Hi, Miss Alison. You're incredibly pretty. And I can guess why my grandmother invited you here, but right now I get a feeling that I might want want to compete with my dad dash. Ed don't say nonsense. My aunt stopped me hurriedly. Also, Ted, wipe that drool off your face. Hi, I'm Camila. My aunt then introduces herself calmly. You must be Edward's fan. Oh yes. I'd also followed him on Instagram, Twitter, forum, and I'm even in his fan club. Allison said in embarrassment. Oh Edward, you're that famous. My grandmother asked in surprise. My granddad was nonchalant and he asked, you're making decent money. Yes, and yes, I replied casually. Now, where's that brisket? I rubbed my hands together in anticipation. My grandmother laughed and told me she was proud of me for a few more minutes before we could finally get to the meat. I met my Aunt May at the dinner table, which in case you're curious, she didn't actually look like Melissa Tomei, but just looked like a younger version of my grandmother. Ed, do you want to say grace? My grandmother said as we held hands together at the dinner table. My grandma was a hardcore Baptist, but the rest of the family not so much. No thanks. I shook my head, causing my grandma's head to droop in disappointment. I can lead it grandma, my cousin said hurriedly. Suck up, I whispered to her. Sell out. She whispered back. All right, no concert tickets for you then. N-O-O-O, I want to go. She quickly changed her attitude and begged me. Chapter 160, Chapter 160, Wisconsin, 2, Awkward Dinner. Edward POV. I had a melancholic feeling in my stomach as I sat at the long dinner table together with my extended family members. My grandpa was sitting at the head of the table with my grandmother next to him, on the same side as my Aunt May, the teacher, and myself. On the other side was my dad, Camila, and also my annoying cousin Amy. There was an empty seat for my uncle Aaron, my other cousin and my uncle-in-law Amy's dad, Jim. Where's Uncle Jim? I asked my Aunt May as I passed the bread to Allison. My aunt smiled proudly and said, well he's taking Maggie to California to visit her college. He'll be back tomorrow. Oh I'm so proud of her. I furrowed my eyebrow and said, oh, she's got into Santa Clara right. That's only an hour away from our house. By the way, why didn't you tell me? They can ride back here with us. My grandmother interrupted, oh it's fine. They bought the tickets a month ago. I don't want them to go to waste. Well you can actually get a refund, and then ride home for free. I said with a smirk. My grandparents and my aunt were confused. I asked them, how do you think we got here? You bought a ticket, right? My grandpa asked. Edward's got a plane. My aunt Camila blurted out. You got a plane. My grandmother shouted in disbelief. Hey, I wanted to say that. I laughed at my aunt while the rest of my family was stunned. So grandma and grandpa, if you want to go somewhere, just give me a heads up and I'll arrange it for you, as long as it doesn't interfere with his performance schedule. My dad added. Mockingly, as long as it doesn't interfere dash my cousin was murmuring by herself, so I catapulted a green pea at her using a spoon. Hey, you little dash, you're the one who's little now strawberry shortcake. I interjected. She humphed and pouted before saying, I haven't hit puberty yet. Your growth spurt started two years ago. Admit it. This is as far as you'll grow. Ed don't tease Amy so much. She will cry. My aunt said gently. I nodded at her and said, well she used to tease me a lot in the past. Now, she has to experience the consequences of her actions. My cousin sneered and said, a nice way of saying that you could never beat me before, so you can only use your newfound height to suppress me. Yes, I said while pointing at her. She got irritated but I ignored her response. My dad smiled as we heard her. Granted, I did succumb to her bullying a few years back, but it wasn't a hostile bullying situation, and the main reason I always lost was because my dad asked me to be gentle when dealing with a little girl. What about Uncle Aaron? I asked. Amy was playing with her food before she said, didn't you hear? Huh? What happened to him? Well he got divorced. His wife was cheating on him with the town pastor. Amy spilled the tea. I widened my eyes in surprise then my grandmother cleared her throat and said, Amy please, not in front of the guest. Well I guess she's been calling him daddy instead of father then huh? I added, causing my grandmother to look at me in disbelief while Amy was laughing. Allison laughed awkwardly as my grandmother smiled at her. So Ed, how rich are you now? My grandpa asked to change the subject. I could live comfortably for a few years even if I stopped now, I replied. My granddad nodded his head in approval and said, just don't lose yourself in your riches. That's the most important thing. Sam, you're not asking him more about the plane. My grandmother asked in both shock and anger. Well what's more to ask? He got a plane. My granddad replied in a tired manner. So Allison, tell me about yourself. I asked in a magnetic voice as I looked at the Jennifer Garner lookalike who sat next to me at the long dinner table. She blushed a bit and brushed her hair behind her ear while I kept staring at her face intently. Edward, you're making her feel uncomfortable. My grandmother said in a scolding manner. I pretended to have a realization and asked, Oh, did I really? I'm sorry Miss Allison. Oh, no, I'm not uncomfortable at all. Miss Allison spoke quickly. I turned to my grandmother with a grin. See, 
She's not uncomfortable at all. My grandmother rolled her eyes before getting back to her food while I flirted with the kindergarten teacher. Well, I am currently teaching a kindergarten class in town. And I just moved here a month ago. Um, what else? What else? Oh right, I love my job, and I hope that the kids in my class will warm up to me soon. Most of the boys seem to avoid me, and I'm not quite sure why. She was excited about her job, and it was clear to see on her face. Her dimple caught my eyes and my heart couldn't help but skip a beat as she accidentally met my gaze. It's because they have a crush on you, I muttered, causing her to widen her eyes before blushing. No they don't. She shook her head shyly. No, I'm sure that they do. I can say confidently that 9 out of 10 boys in the class have a crush on you. Hell I would have had a crush on you if you were my teacher. I maintained eye contact while slowly pouring the wine in her glass. It's hard not to when you see the perfect woman in front of you, I added. You're kidding? Miss Allison said as she fanned her hot face, and let me tell you it wasn't just because she had eaten my grandmother's spicy chili. What about the 1 slash 10? My cousin interjected, destroying the mood. Well that one is already falling in love. Unlike you who has stunted development. Also, eat your peas and no meddling, the adults are talking. She grimaced and smacked the table, I'm older than you. I scoffed and said, by three days. And when you think about it it's not surprising you were born on April 1st given how big of a joke you are. She gasped while Miss Allison was chuckling. Seeing that she was humiliated in front of a guest she kinda likes, she exploded. Oh that's it. You and me. Outside, right now. She stood up quickly and slammed her napkin on her empty table. I smiled but before I could answer, my dad interjected, Amy. Can I please ask you, as a personal favor, not to wrestle with Ed today, but dash. Dad, it's fine. I want to take my revenge after all these years of getting bullied by her. Now that I've hit puberty, she has lost her chance to win against me in a fair fight. She scoffed and said, who said I'm going to fight fairly. She gazed at my crotch which alarmed me a little bit. It made me understand that I would need to protect my weak part in the fight after this. Amy, please sit. My aunt said in a stern manner, unbecoming of her temperament. I furrowed my eyebrow in irritation while Amy was shaken and she sat down obediently after that. My grandmother was concerned, Amy, they're kids. And apparently no homecoming is complete without Amy and Edward fighting each other. But you know what just happened to Edward? My aunt muttered, causing me to frown. I'm fine, Aunt May. Don't worry about me. It was nothing. I replied to her, but my dad interrupted me. Amy, I'm sorry. But for Edward's sake, don't rile him up too much these few days okay? My dad asked sincerely. Dad, I told you I'm fine. I said with a hint of agitation in my tone. Well that's not up for you to decide is it? My dad blurted out with an angry voice subconsciously. My grandmother was taken aback, while I narrowed my eyes at him. I sighed without saying anything before changing the subject. Grandma. Grandpa. I'm confused about something. What is it dear? She asked in a sweet manner while my granddad just looked at me. Well, you're 55. And my dad is 45. Considering that Uncle Aaron is the firstborn and is at 50 years old this year, he has a 5 years old age difference with you. So, gasp. Grandpa. It's not what you think. My grandpa said quickly with a nervous voice. My aunt was shaking while my grandpa raised his head from his plate to stare at me. My grandmother laughed and said, that took you long enough to find out. Find out what? My cousin Amy was confused. Well I did figure it out years before, but I never had the courage to actually ask about it. I muttered in a casual manner. Well my grandmother wasn't my true grandmother after all. My grandpa's first wife died of tuberculosis while my dad was 17, and my aunt May was the result of my grandpa's second marriage. So that made Amy my second cousin, I think. I'm not so sure about it. Wait, what? My cousin was shocked when she realized it. Dummy, I insulted her. It took a while for my grandmother to finish the story, and without me even noticing, I was already finished with my food. I wiped my mouth with a napkin before saying to the crowd, excuse me, I have some work matters to attend to. Then, I stood up and left the dinner table and went to my room after washing my dishes in the kitchen sink. I'll go with you, my cousin said as she stood up and followed me from behind. General POV, Allison, I'm sorry for Edward, the grandmother said. Oh not at all, he's been really nice. It's even, kinda unexpected. Allison smiled warmly. Grandpa Sam sighed after Edward left the dinner table. Do you really have to poke the wasp's nest like that? You can see that Edward is barely maintaining his temper around you. What a good kid. If you were my dad, I'd already shot you. Sam muttered with some annoyance. Ted shook his head in disappointment, but his disappointment wasn't with others, but with himself. I know. I made a mistake. It's not Ted's fault. He's been under so much pressure these last two days. Camila muttered worriedly. Granny Jules held Ted's hand and said sweetly, Ted honey, I know that you're worried about Edward, but putting a bubble wrap on him won't work. I'm not. I just want him to take it easy for a while. But no matter what I do he just won't listen to me. Ted said pitifully. The grandmother patted his arm to comfort him while Aunt May said, he's in a rebellious age. Of course he won't listen to you. It's the same thing with Amy. I just hope they won't cause chaos like they did when they were younger. Last time they released the cows from the shed and I had to search all over town to find them. We even found some of them staring at a ribeye poster in a restaurant parking lot, and I'm pretty sure that those are still traumatized. Grandpa Sam muttered. Edward POV. 
Who are you calling? Your girlfriend. My cousin badgered me as I laid down on the bottom part of the double-decker bed. She was peeking at me from the top bunk, and was annoying me the whole time I was getting myself settled. Shut up or I'll place you up in the fridge. I warned her. She sneered and said, try it. I'll tear your balls off before you can do it. SHHH Amy. I shushed her as the call was connected. Hey Haley. How's the first day of family camp? I asked her with a laugh. It's pretty freaking awful. The mosquitoes are feasting on my blood. I've been bitten almost 20 times already. She complained. Also, there isn't any Wi-Fi anywhere other than the dorm, so I was bored out of my mind for the whole day. Ah, that's harsh. I listened intently. I know right? And to think I have to spend two weeks living like a savage over here. Do you know how much gossip I'll miss out on? And when I get back, all of them will already be irrelevant. That's true. I nodded and asked, you have another activity planned for tonight right? Yeah, the stupid art and culture night thing. Dad wants to audition for a part, which is so embarrassing. Oh, what kind of play is it? I asked curiously. I don't know, I don't remember, and I'm not interested Haley replied in annoyance. But this is something good. And you should definitely make your dad audition for the main lead part. He's not going to do that. He wants to get started on a small part dash Haley stopped her sentence in realization. I smirked and said, you noticed it too right? He wants to get started small, then the next few years, he's going to be for bigger and bigger parts. So you're going to have to go to family camp for years. You're right. Haley was in disbelief. Oh, that guy is so slick. I was almost tricked by him. I'm going to make sure that he gives it all and peeks in this camp. That way, we won't be coming here anymore. I laughed a bit and said, good. You should join him too. I'd already told Alex to email me pictures after you all get home. Also, talking about a slick dad, want to hear something awful. What? What did your dad do now? Is he sleeping in the corridor in front of your room again? Haley asked with a chuckle. Nah, he and my grandma made it seem like we don't have enough room and made me bunk with my demonic midget hell spawned cousin. Hey, Amy shouted in offense as she could hear everything. Haley was taken aback. Oh, your cousin is a girl. Yeah, but don't worry. We're not in Alabama, so it's safe. I joked. Haley snorted as she held back her laugh. She was clear about the Alabama joke as I explained it to her before. Why Alabama? Amy asked in confusion. Didn't your mother tell you it's not good behavior to eavesdrop on someone's conversation? I scolded her before going back to the call. Why are you so mean to me? Amy yelled in annoyance and teary eyes before running out of the room. Ed, did she cry? You're being really mean and I mean, if she cried. Haley muttered in concern. I was shocked when I saw Amy running out and muttered, yeah, I guess I was being king of an asshole. Although in my defense, she started it. Huh? What did she do? Haley asked in intrigue. Well, if you must know, it started during the summer when we were seven years old. Flashback five years ago, a young Edward with a messy wolf cut hairstyle opened the fridge and took out a box of Ego, frozen waffle brand, only to find it was empty. He looked at the young Amy who was eating the waffle in front of the TV and said, Did you eat the last Ego and put the empty box back into the fridge? Yeah, Amy replied noncommittedly. She then smiled and said instigatively, That must suck Havivaldi. You played with my feelings. I was excited to have an ego on my last morning here, but you ruined it with your devil-tainted pranks. I will never forgive you for this. Seemingly challenged by Edward's declaration, Amy muttered, oh yeah, then how about this? She then dropped the half-eaten waffle on the floor on purpose right in front of Edward's angry gaze. Flashback ends. So, your fight started since then. Haley muttered in disbelief. Yeah, that's why you should never test me with food stuff. Especially the sweet ones I could never have when I get back home. As I just showed I do hold a really long grudge about that. I explained. You know what? I want to say be mature, but I'm sure you'll already know better. Haley muttered. Mom's here. I have to go. All right. I'll call you tomorrow. I stood up and tried to figure out which way Amy went. And don't you dare forget about it. Haley said before ending the call. I searched all over the house before walking to the barn and then the stables, but I couldn't find where Amy had run off to. Damn that midget. I cursed before I met Apollo, our shepherd dog who was taking care of the goats. Hey big guy. Long time no see. I petted the old dog for a while, causing him to wag his tail in excitement. Do you know where Amy went? I asked the dog. He then turned his head to the direction of the hill. I sighed and asked, can you lead me to her? He nodded and walked in front of me a few steps before stopping and turning his head back to make sure that I was following him. We walked for over 1-0 minutes before I could finally see where Amy had gone. She was sitting inside a tire swing under an oak tree, wiping her tears with the back of her hand as she processed her emotion. Amy. I called out. She was surprised to see me there. Go away Ed. I know you don't like me too. Apollo left me behind and went towards Amy before he put his head on her feet, trying to cheer her up. Two, who else doesn't like you? That privilege is reserved just for me, so I need to know who dares to try and snatch it. I joked as I walked close to her, but a murderous glint shined in my eyes. I, she was silent, so I tried to persuade her, come on, talk to me. No, she pouted and turned her head away to avoid looking at my face. Come on, I'm sorry I called you a demonic midget. That's unfair, you're not a demon, I said, but I am a midget. 
She shouted incredulously before standing up, You have a lot of nerve calling me that after you ignored me for almost three years. Now you're back, and you hate me, and my stomach is cramping and my sister is going away, and everything has changed, and I don't know what to do. Her chin quivered and her eyes were red, but she stared at me right in the face as if telling me that all that was happening to her was actually my fault. I was stunned for a bit and then I smiled wryly, well I'm sorry for the part where I got something to do with it. As if, you must be pretty happy right now, with your singing career taking off, your private plane, dating a star I hope that you'll choke on the heroin you're pushing up your nose. I haven't done drugs yet though, I replied casually. Also, I said I'm sorry, what more do you want? She was irritated and she stood up, come at me, huh. I was confused when I saw her getting into a stance. I always knew one day you'd be taller than me, so I've been learning martial arts to take you down when it happens. Oh, good for you, stop being so smirky, I'll throw you down on the floor, but I need you to lunge at me first as I haven't learned how to do it when you're standing yet. I laughed out loud and said, give up, I also have a black belt in martial arts. She widened her eyes in surprise and said, really, phew you uh, okay. I waited for her to vent out her emotion first before saying, let's go back, I'll pop some ego into the microwave for you, how does that sound, I'm not a child. She scoffed before her eyes shook in hesitation, will you put some whipped cream on it too, as much as you want, I promised. She then thought for a while and then said, okay, but one more word about my height, and I swear to god that I'll throw you down this hill. She saw my smirking face and then her face turned horrified, I'll tell grandma that you used god's name in vain. What? No I didn't? Eddie. I walked away quickly and she had to run after me from behind to make sure that I didn't rat her out to our grandmother. Apollo followed us around in excitement as we walked back to our house. From her little tantrum episode, I noticed one thing. If you asked me what the Dunphys were doing, and how their life was going, I could answer it all in detail. But when it comes to my own family, I didn't know a damn thing about what was going on in their lives right now. I didn't know that Amy had become more introverted after her boyfriends didn't want to play with her anymore once they hit puberty, so she had been feeling quite left out. I didn't know that Uncle Aaron had a divorce, which was a pretty big deal for me not to know anything about. I should help him get back on his feet soon. And also while I was helping, maybe I could convince him to bring me to a strip club. Well, I hope tomorrow will be better. I muttered before going to sleep. The sky was still dark out when a loud rooster crow suddenly startled me from my sleep. Amy almost fell from the top bunk in surprise and I sat up hurriedly. Then we both turned to the corner of our room where a dumb looking rooster had infiltrated to. How in the hell? I muttered in confusion, not knowing how the rooster managed to get in. My grandpa barged into the room before we could collect ourselves and said, Mornin, brush your teeth and meet me at the barn. The cows are not going to milk themselves. Ugh. I groaned and fell back on the bed. Now Ed. My grandpa ordered. This kind of tomorrow isn't any better. I groaned as I reluctantly left my bed. This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below.